Representatives, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. And I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question. Oh, Senator Urquhart. I just, can I just oh, put this first? Yes. I remind senators the question may be put on any of those proposals at the request of any senator. There being none, Senator Urquhart will seek the call. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Look, I just wanted to raise an issue. We, uh, I understand there is a ballot for the select committee on the vaping. Um, uh, that was to be held today. Um, I, the, whip, the government whip and myself had an agreement that we would do that after prayers. Um, I've now been led to believe that it is now scheduled for 11:45. Um, can I say I'm, we're very disappointed with that, given that we have. I've indicated to all our um, colleagues on this side that it would be held at that time, and now um, people have other commitments. Things are scheduled. It's very difficult to. You know, pull people out of other issues at 11:45 when there was a, an agreement that we would have it immediately after prayers. Uh, well, Senator Smith. I acknowledge what uh, Senator Urquhart has said that there had been an understanding that the preference was the preference was for the ballot to happen immediately after prayers. Uh, it's the government's position that we would prefer that to happen at 11:45. I acknowledge again what Senator Urquhart has said in regards to commitments of senators. They are commitments that all senators in the chamber have, so 11.45 would be the government's preferred position. I'm, I, I might make the observation, um, if I could, so I'll come to you next, Senator, that 11.45 is a time that most senators probably would keep free because the bells tend to ring for that hour um, with the discovery of formal business and other matters. So it, um, I was only made aware it was likely to be 11.45, but I'll call Senator Seawit to at the difficulties in the timing, but 11:45 is that that we only have an hour to deal with a lot of business in the chamber, and we often miss out on motions because we run out of time. So this will also take further time away from our ability to deal with selection of bills and motions in the time frame. Okay. Well, my point is I'm, I don't have any unilateral authority here to order a ballot. Um, and so, absent there being a procedural matter brought to the chair attention of the Senate now, we'll, I'll call on the clerk to call on business. Clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, higher education support amendment, job ready graduates and supporting regional and remote students bill, resumption of debate on second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Faruqi. Senator Steele John. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, the arts and the uh, humanities uh, are amazing, and anyone that uh, studies them uh, should be uh, celebrated. We know that the uh, future of employment in this country, the industries uh, that are uh, needed over the next 25 years, uh, the challenges that we face as a community um, are all better faced uh, when people have the opportunity uh, to study in the arts, in the humanities, gaining the skills that are available uh, to people there. And I say that proudly as somebody uh, that studied the arts when I was at university. Uh, Myself. It is also the case that many previous uh, generations to my own have had the opportunity to study in these fields either at a dramatically uh, reduced cost or indeed for 
free. Uh, there is an entire generation of uh, so-called legislators in this place uh, who went to university uh, for free, that studied the arts and the humanities for free. There are no less than 16 government members that went to university for free. The education minister himself has no less than three arts degrees. And so you would think in that context that any and all legislation that came before this place would be aimed at opening up opportunity for young people, for students across the country to study at university and encourage uh, people uh, to study in these incredibly vital fields. Uh, where we have the opportunity to explore the deepest questions of our own human nature and collaborate with each other on some of the most challenging topics of our time. Particularly in this moment, where so many young people are challenged as never before by the reality of the COVID recession, by the reality of the climate crisis, by the reality of the health crisis, you would imagine uh, that any and all legislation put before this place would be aimed at making it easier, making it easier for us as young people to get an education, particularly since now more than ever in 2020. Getting a tertiary degree, studying these, in these fields of the modern equivalent of, getting a high, of exiting high school as it was for previous generations. And yet, when we look at this bill, when we open the lid and look at this proposal, we see the diametric opposite. At the heart of this bill is a rank hypocrisy. It is the legislative embodiment of a pattern which sweeps through our entire society at the moment. And that is the pattern of older, privileged folks denying to this generation, to my generation, the opportunities which they themselves enjoyed. An entire generation of parliamentarians who went to university for free are now moving to block that opportunity, not only to fail to pass on that opportunity, but to uh, make it more difficult uh, for students to study in the arts and humanities. It is one of the most unfair it is one of the most hypocritical pieces of legislation that we have seen in recent times. Now, it is no we all know uh, that the major parties in this place operate in a relatively fact-free environment. A fantasy land, if you like, where gas is a clean pathway to the renewable energy future and tax cuts for the rich magically trickle down and help everybody else. That's nothing new. But it is worth noting that there is not one speck of academic evidence from any part of the field that will tell you that making uh, arts and humanities more difficult to study is the right thing to do at this present moment. In fact, the opposite is true. I had the opportunity to serve on the Future of Work and Workers Committee as one of my first tasks as an MP. And what we heard very clearly as a committee uh, is that the next 25 years of work in this country will primarily evolve around uh, the human-facing industries, those care industries in aged care in the NDIS. These are the spaces and places where the trends of automation uh, are uh, most unlikely to take greatest effect uh, because of the vital need uh, of there to be uh, humans in those roles. And these are all things that are better supported by access uh, to the arts and to the humanities. 
Let me say it again, just so that we are very clear. This bill is a hypocritical act. It denies to my generation, to the young people of this country, the opportunities which were enjoyed by the previous generations. It is being perpetrated upon students by a government comprised of 16 members who themselves went to university for free, by a minister who benefited from, a heart, from arts and humanities at work at university himself. Now, during the course of this campaign, as we have opposed this legislation, thousands of students have reached out to us as a party and shared with us as MPs, as Greens MPs, their frustration and their anger at the double standard that is represented in this legislation. Whether it be on climate, whether it be on unemployment, whether it be in education, the simple ask of young people in Australia is that we not have barriers put in our way that were torn down for previous generations. And that, what, that is what this bill does. And it is not okay. Increasing the cost of an arts and humanities degree by 113% is not okay. It is not acceptable particularly not at this moment in time. We have young people struggling at university all around the country with mental health in a context where the university sector has been critically underfunded for decades, where staff are facing chronic work insecurity. And yet we as students are being asked to pay more to participate in this system. We have put ourselves forward to pursue our hopes and dreams, to work with each other, to do the best that we can. And the answer that this government has given us is double, pay double, pay double and get on with it. And the, the, sickening, the sickening truth at the centre of this legislation is that it is being done for purely ideological reasons by a government that just simply hates the arts and humanities, that has never appreciated the social sciences, and has in fact interpreted these fields of study as directly oppositional to their cruel agendas. Whether it be Howard's attacks on the student union movement through to the multi-billion dollar cuts levelled against the higher education sector by the Labour government, it has been bipartisan policy now for decades for both sides of politics to come together to either rip funding out of higher education make it more difficult to access or decrease the power, the political power of students. I am incredibly proud to sit virtually with my Greens colleagues today in opposing this legislation. As a member of a political movement that proclaims clearly that university, that education is a human right and a public good that it should be free for all forever. I oppose this bill along with my colleagues and will vote against it with pride. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Senator Polly. Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Guarantee and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. The bill is the coalition's latest attempt to deteriorate our and to attack our higher education system. They want to make it one characterised by high levels of private debt and unequal access. Labor cannot support this legislation. The government states the purpose of the reform is to provide additional university places and to redirect universities' enrolments to areas of study linked to jobs in demand in the labour market. But what this bill really does is strip another 
$1 billion of government <coughs> funds out of the university sector, more than double the cost of many courses, in particular arts and humanities. And it will make it more difficult for many students to go to university, all under the guise of reform. The additional $1 billion announced last night doesn't even make up for what universities have lost this year, let alone the conservative and consistent cuts that we've seen over the seven years of this Liberal government. The fundamental effect of the bill is to make Australian students pay more for the cost of their education, while the Commonwealth pays less. Under this legislation, the overall student contribution will increase by 7 per cent. 40 per cent of students will have their fees increased. That's 40 per cent of all students will have their fees increased, with some degrees rising by 113 per cent. I know it's hard to believe. Yes, 113 per cent increase. Those studying commerce, humanities, communications, economics and law will now pay more than a dentist and doctor for the cost of their degree. The effect of this fee rise will be felt over decades to come. Doubling the size of students' university debt will influence their ability to save for a home, which will undermine their long-term economic security. Younger people are already worse off and will fare far worse from the COVID-19 Morrison recession. Instead of encouraging our younger generation to gain essential skills to drive our recovery, the Morrison government will make them pay more. How does that make sense? This is not a new attempt. Since taking office in 2013, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments have repeatedly tried to increase the share of higher education funding paid by students and reduce the Commonwealth's own contribution. Labor has and always will oppose these cuts. We successfully opposed two previous attempts to do this in 2014 and again in 2017 and will endeavour to block this present bill's passage through Parliament, although we know there's crossbench senators that have taken the 40 silver shillings and sold out Australian students. What is ironic about this um, bill is that the Senator drop Polly, just a moment, please. how they vote is perhaps okay, a rhetorical the, flourish that the a, senator might like to It is a point of order. It's a point of uh, debate. Um, so there was no one named. It is a rhetorical flourish, as you said, so no offence. Please continue, Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam President. You know when you get such an interjection <coughs> that you're touching a nerve, because what I am saying is the reality of what this bill will do. What is ironic about this bill is that the drop in funding, as I said, will be felt in the areas where we should be encouraging more students to go to university. That's what we should be doing. But this bill is, dis is designed to disencourage people. In fact, many of the disciplines where enrolment is being encouraged by dropping course costs for students, funding is going to the university is also dropping. This means that universities will get less money to provide job-ready courses. Experts and commentators, so it's not just people on this side of the chamber, your own former minister for education, Ms Julie Bishop, has described this design as unreasonable incentive for universities. It will likely achieve the opposite of what the government supposedly intends. What is highly concerning is that the government is trying to redirect support to regional universities, but the associated funding and implementation mechanisms are not specified. 
It remains unclear how the redirection of funds to regional universities would operate outside of the bill and whether or not regional universities will be better off. On the contrary, expert analysis suggests that regional universities will be worse off due to the design of the new Commonwealth grant scheme arrangements, which are based on average teaching costs. In many regional areas, these costs are generally higher and often do not fit the one-size-fits-all approach, which the Liberal government loves to use, just like they did with the robo-debt scheme, robo scheme. The impact of this crisis on regional universities will be devastating. The bill will make it near impossible for many people in my home state of Tasmania to go on to university and to study without having to obtain a mortgage. Tasmania is already experiencing a skills shortage and a brain drain. The ability to think critically and creatively and to understand how the world operates, skills often learnt in a humanities degree, will be the ones that employees will be looking for into the future. We cannot discount these skills, and we should not discount these skills. We should not discourage people to go on to university and to study the courses that they're passionate about by burdening them with a huge debt. Regardless, humanity graduates are just as likely as science graduates to receive a job in their chosen field in Tasmania. With no real jobs plan in place by this government, we, they should not, as I said on a number of occasions, they should not be discouraging young people or people who have been forced to go back to university to increase their skills or to gain uh, skills that they need to go into the workforce. Now we saw with uh, the government's uh, budget that they brought down on Tuesday evening, they've done nothing for older workers. Nothing at all. So older workers who are losing their jobs because of the Morrison's recession and the COVID-19 effects have been attacked by this very bill as well, because it will discourage older Australians from going back to university or going to university for the first time. The government claims that an additional 39,000 places will be achieved in the first three years of this scheme, accumulating to 100,000 over 10 years. However, there is nothing in the government's bills that guarantees any increase in student places. This is the reality. The only thing this bill does is assure that universities will receive less funding for the places they currently provide. There is nothing in the reform for increased demands due to the recession and closed international borders. In effect, universities will be getting less and expected to do more. Even if the government claims are to be accepted, the additional places that are being proposed are not enough to meet the projected increases in student demand. As well as this, the pricing model that underpins this bill is weak. The report which the government is basing this legislation on was conducted by Deloitte's Access Economic and it cautioned it cautioned making judgments regarding the adequacy of funding from these results. That was commissioned by this government. Their own Deloitte's economic report has warned them that the path they're going down is wrong. This modelling made unrealistic assumptions and did not consult with faculties or STEM members. How could you introduce such a bill without consultation <clears throat> for those people who are on the front line. There is a close relationship between the ability to conduct research and the quality of undergraduate teaching, and by undermining this relationship, the Morrison government will have the opposite effect that they supposedly are working towards. This bill will impede our economic recovery. The government has actively denied the parliament and the public adequate time and information to fully debate and interrogate this bill. It is clear to Labor that the government is attempting to avoid further evidence coming to light of the bill's unfairness, irrationality and the poor design. This bill comes at a particularly difficult time. 
for year 12 students who have just completed their final year of study in an extremely uncertain times and under extremely uncertain conditions. They have watched the jobs market collapse and they will be worse off for it with subdued employment for some time to come. They have also seen apprenticeship opportunities vanish around the economy. For universities, they are already reeling for the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This sector is particularly hard hit because of the loss of fee, full fee-paying international students. The consequences of the decline in international student fees revenue has been estimated to result in a loss of income available to support research by up to $7.6 billion over the next five years. That will mean a reduction in the research workforce of 11 per cent of up to 6,000 jobs. Yet there is no plan for this in Frydenberg's budget. Experts have warned that without the same level of discretionary funding available for the next few years, it is likely to be a significant loss of research momentum in Australian universities. For university staffs, and we've seen it already in Tasmania, the federal government has gone out of its way to exclude public universities from JobKeeper payments. It's changed the rules three times to ensure they don't qualify. There's already been 12,000 job losses. We cannot afford to lose any more. Now isn't the time to withdraw further support from our education system and to impose a flawed policy which stakeholders, experts and even the previous Liberal Party members do not endorse. We are relying on our brilliant universities and their research to find a vaccine for COVID-19, but they can't rely on the Morrison government to protect their jobs. We are in the deepest and darkest recession in almost a century, and the decisions made by the Morrison government is taking it further and making it worse for all Australians. We need to incentivise our young people to retain and reskill. We need to incentivise and retrain and reskill older Australian workers, and there is no more importance for my home state of Tasmania, so therefore I will be voting, as Labor will be, against this very flaw bill and the attack on our universities, and particularly my university in Tasmania. Thank you, Senator. Polly, Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak in favour of this bill as a member of a party which has a proud tradition of supporting higher education in this country. When Sir Robert Gordon Menzies became Prime Minister in 1936, there were only six universities in Australia. Six universities. There were 14,236 higher education students out of a total population of 7 million. 14,236 higher education students out of a total population of 7 million. When Sir Robert Gordon Menzies retired from the position of Prime Minister, this country had 16 universities. Six to 16. And there were also 91,272 higher education students. 91,000. Six to 16 universities and 14,000 to 91,000 students. An incredibly proud tradition um, that the Liberal Party has in terms of supporting higher education in this country. Higher education in this country did not start with Gough Whitlam. It did not start with Gough Whitlam, however much those opposite would like to tell us. And in terms of what should be a university, again, I go back to the words of the founder of my party, Sir Robin Gordon Menzies. And I'd like to quote from a speech he gave in 1939. And this was an address on his first day as Prime Minister. On his first day as Prime Minister, Sir Robert Gordon Menzies talked about the importance of the university. And this is what he said, I quote, "'What are we to look for in a true university? What causes should it serve?' He put forward seven answers in response. And I quote again, the university must be a place of pure culture and learning, a training school for the professions, 
a liaison between the academic and the good practical person, the home of research, a trainer of character, a training ground for leaders and a custodian of the unfettered search for truth. And that last phrase, Mr Acting Deputy President, the unfettered search for truth is one that has stuck with me over quite some period of time. And when I look at universities today, I call upon all of our universities to reflect on that Menzies statement of an aspiration to an unfettered search for truth. Because, Mr Acting Deputy President, our university should not be fettered by codes of conduct which do not promote freedom of speech but trample on it. Our university should be unfettered by practices of banning speakers from campuses just because they're unpopular and just because certain radicals on the campuses do not wish to permit them to speak. Our universities should be unfettered from fetters imposed by foreign countries and jurisdictions upon what they can teach and how they teach it. Our universities need to aspire to an unfettered search for truth. The second introductory point I'd like to make in relation to this legislation is with respect to the contribution by Senator Jordan Steele. And I always listen carefully to the good senator from Western Australia. I'm a great admirer of his passion and his, uh, his ability to put his thoughts into words. But can I just say to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, there is no such thing as free education. There is no such thing as free health care. Nothing is free in this world. Someone has to pay. Someone has to pay. Nothing is free in this world. There is no such thing as a free lunch. The only question is how is it going to be paid for? Who pays what and when? That's the only question. Nothing is free in this world. And it is wrong to state that, to the contrary, that something can in some way be free and no one bears the cost. That's a utopian vision which does not reflect reality. And at this time, at this time of record budget deficits to help every person in this country, we need to reflect on that. We need to reflect on that, that every single dollar is absolutely vital and of so much value in this day as we move through this pandemic to the other side and rebuild the economy of this country and provide those hundreds of thousands of Australians with unemployment. And in that context, in that context, it is entirely reasonable. It is entirely reasonable that the government should look at the range of tertiary courses offered, specific units of study within those tertiary courses, and make a practical assessment, a practical assessment as to where the government should best direct resources and where the students who desire to choose to study certain courses should meet a greater proportion of the cost of those courses. That is entirely appropriate and practical in this day and age. And can I just, can I just touch on, on this concept of free education? There's this, and I understand my friend Senator Rennick talked about how he had a number of part-time jobs as he studied at university, and he picked fruit and vegetables, and he was also a glassy at the uh, Royal Exchange Hotel, which my friend Senator Murray Watt no, no doubt attended on many occasions. And in that context, in that context, he contributed to his education, but Mr Rennick is part of that generation that I belong to as a 50-year-old, where HECS was actually introduced when we were part of the way through our course. And I had no problem. I had no problem contributing to the cost of my higher education. Absolutely no problem at all. And I can remember having a discussion with a friend of mine who went into carpentry and building, and he said to me, Paul, why should I have to pay? Why should I have to pay so you can go to university and then graduate and earn big bucks? You should have to actually pay for, the, for your course. You should have to pay for that. Why should I have to pay for that? And I always thought that was an extremely reasonable proposition, because there is no such thing as a free lunch. There is no such thing as free education. Someone has to pay. And the only question is, how do we calibrate that in a modern society? I'd like to turn to a few particular comments in relation 
uh, to this bill that have been raised and actually present some facts. Firstly, the coalition government already provides more than $18 billion, that's billion with a B, a year to fund our universities. And this will grow, it's not decreasing, it's actually growing to $20 billion by 2024. From $18 billion a year today to $20 billion in 2024. So I think this needs to be content. It, this debate needs to be put in, put in context. I wonder what those opposite would say if we increased it to $21 billion. I think they'd complain even more. Second point I'd like to make is while some fields of study will see increases in student contribution amounts for specific units, approximately 60 per cent of students will see either a reduction or no charge, or no change, I should say, in their student contribution. 60 per cent see a reduction or no change. 60 per cent. Senator Polly, who spoke before me in this debate, wanted to focus on the 40 per cent. What about the 60 per cent? What about the 60 per cent? And those students enrolled in teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English and languages will pay 42 per cent less for their degree. 42 per cent less for their degree. And we know, we know there is a great need for clinical psychologists at this point in time. I've sat in estimates and heard uh, from the Department of Veterans Affairs how our veterans need access to psychological support. And we know in the aftermath of the bushfires and of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people are going to need a lot of support. We need more teachers. We need more nurses. We need more English teachers, especially assisting those new Australians to learn English so that they can get better jobs. We need all of those students in those courses, and it's fit and proper that they should pay less. Absolutely, because our community needs people with those specialties who can do those courses. Students who study agriculture and maths will pay 59 per cent less for their degree. 59 per cent. We need more maths teachers. We need more farmers educated in best farming practices who can work on our farms and increase productivity. And it's fit and proper that they should pay 59 per cent less for their degree. Students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, environmental science, IT and engineering will pay 18 per cent less for their degree. And again, again, these are decisions which are informed by what is actually happening in the labour market today. Can I say to you, Mr Deputy President, and this will, Acting Deputy President, and this will certainly not be the most profound thing said in this chamber, Australia does not need more lawyers. Australia does not need more lawyers. There are plenty of lawyers out there, I can tell you. And there are more people studying law today than there are actual jobs for them. There are more people studying law than just about practising law. And it is fit and proper. It is fit and proper that this government should give a message to people looking to undertake higher education, looking to undertake higher education, as to where their prospects lie the best. It is absolutely wrong. It is absolutely wrong that we should send a message to people that they should be entering into courses to study certain things when their employment prospects are less than if they were studying other courses. It's absolutely appropriate we send this message to them through the market. But if after all of that, if after all of that, and I know young people who want to study law, I know young people who want to study other humanities where the price may well rise under these reforms. I know those people are out there, and good luck to them. I support them, absolutely support them. But in doing that, in doing that, even if they choose to do that, under our higher education loan program, the help system, no student needs to pay anything up front. No student needs to pay anything up front, and student loans are only repaid when the student is earning over $46,000. Student loans only repaid when the student is earning over $46,000. So if you want to study law, study law. Good luck to you. Give me a call and I'll talk to you about the practice of law and how I've seen it develop in the years since I graduated university in 1991. Absolutely do it. But just know, just know the sort of 
profession you're getting into and how many people are actually practising in that profession today, how that impacts on your job prospects and how it could well be how it could well be that you might find it easier to secure employment in another field where this country is desperate, is desperate for more people to study particular fields in teaching, in nursing, clinical psychology, English language, etc. So be informed. Be informed as to what your prospects are. Be informed. And if you do choose to study any of those courses, any of the courses that are available to you from any of our wonderful universities. Note that a person on the lowest repayment threshold, which starts at 80 per cent of the median earnings for all Australian employees, will pay only $8.80 to $10.20 per week. We're talking about $10.20 a week after you've studied your course. Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, and you breach that lowest repayment threshold, so you have to start repaying, $8.80 to $10.20 per week. Is that too much to ask? Is that, seriously, is that too much to ask, Mr Acting Deputy President? Is that too much to ask? I mean, it's, it's quite baffling how those opposite can be so outraged, and one has to query the degree to which this outrage is, is really confected is really confected. I must say I was sitting here yesterday in question time listening to the questions coming from the opposition in response to the budget, and they were, really were particularly underwhelming. Particularly underwhelming. They couldn't lay a glove. Couldn't lay a glove on the budget that was brought down on Tuesday now, night. And now we have this confected outrage over what? Someone who goes to university, someone goes to university, they don't have to pay a cent whilst they're studying. They don't have to pay any fee whilst they're studying. And then once they reach the lowest repayment threshold, right, which starts at 80 per cent of the median earnings for all Australian employees, they're only going to pay $8.80 to $10.20 per week. Can I tell you there would be millions, millions of people around this world, millions of people who would love to have that opportunity to study in our universities and pay that amount, $8.80 to $10.20 per week, 80 per cent of median earnings. They would love to have the opportunity to do that in our country and study at our wonderful universities. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Thor. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I would like to begin by informing the Chamber that this is not my first speech. I rise to speak in this long debate on the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. The, Green, the Greens oppose this bill. Nothing is for free, says Senator Scar. In that case, maybe we should talk about the stolen land and resources from this country's first people or the free money to your Liberal Party donors in this budget. It saddens me that in my first week here in the Senate I'm witnessing firsthand the unfair and out-of-touch agenda of this government. This bill, along with this week's federal bu budget, shows how this government does not care about setting up a smarter, safer, healthier future for this country. They especially don't care about our country's young people. These young people are facing a pandemic, an economic crisis and a climate emergency. Young people in this country just want to have a chance, a chance to get an education if that's how they choose to contribute to their community. Young people just want a chance not to be tied down to decades of debt. Many of my fellow senators in this place and members in the House benefited from free uni education. Not just cheap education, free education. It's hypocritical that they are the same people that will apply happily the next generation of young people or deny the young people of this country the same opportunity. The government with this package is put pulling up the drawbridge so no one else gets to come in. Education is about opportunity. 
It's about having the chance to get new skills, get qualified and get on the path to a secure and rewarding job. Education is about being able to have an opportunity to go to one of our universities, some of the best in the world, without worrying about being crushed by a huge debt that follows you around for decades. Education is the great equaliser. That's why this government wants to make it harder for people to get one. This package will more than double fees for those students who want to contribute to our society by studying humanities and social sciences. This budget will also slash up to $900 million in funding for teaching and learning. This includes funding from STEM and nursing courses. That's how out of touch this government really is. They will slash nursing, social science, science funding in the middle of a global public health crisis. It's shameful. This bill will punish struggling students who are already struggling. For some students, it could take up to 20 years to pay off a three-year humanities degree, according to our modelling, and maybe even longer. That assumes graduates will be able to go straight into full-time work that pays them a good wage that allows them to put food on their table and a roof over their heads. It doesn't account for any years taken off any full time for parental leave or to care for a loved one or for any other personal reason. It also doesn't take into account further study that someone might need to do just to get a foot in the door. And the government's claims to support regional universities with this plan just doesn't stack up. The government's plan will force regional universities to teach more students with less money and forces their students to go into huge debts just to get their degree. The consequences for regional communities will be felt hard and for a lifetime. I'm particularly concerned that this bill will deepen inequality for Indigenous students in particular. This bill puts more barriers for our people to go to university, to get a job, earn a good wage that can support themselves, their families and their communities. Indigenous students are more likely to be loaded up with high hex debts because they often choose to study social sciences and community development as a way to give back to their communities. We should be prioritising and rewarding their hard work, not putting up more walls and building more barriers for our young people to get an education in any field they choose. Education is not just about being a cog in a machine. It's about being able to contribute fully to the society you live in. No person in this place or anywhere should ever make it harder for anyone to go to university particularly Indigenous young people who have been locked out of opportunities in our own country for centuries. I've seen so many photos of Indigenous graduates on Twitter, many of them the first in their families to go to university. I encourage all senators to search for the hashtag BlackFellaGradPicks. You'll see photos of our young people graduating as nurses, doctors, social workers, social scientists, surgeons, journalists, therapists, scientists and teachers. All of them make their families, their friends and their ancestors and elders proud to be graduating while wearing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags. As we approach graduation season all around the country, we will see even more Indigenous community development workers, counsellors, lawyers and engineers, and I can't wait to share in their happiness. In fact, I can't wait to welcome some of them into this chamber as fellow senators. Everyone here should be making it easier for Indigenous young people all young people to get an excellent education at our excellent public universities and for free. This package does not do that. It's far from it. Just yesterday we heard Senator Griff say in, in this chamber 
that in an ideal world there would be more university funding. I remind my colleague and all senators in this place that more funding for universities is not something that exists only in the imagination. It's something that every single senator in this chamber has the power to make happen today. But this bill is not it. No one should ever come to this place thinking that it's beyond their power to create a better and more educated Australia. In no place should we be making it harder for anyone who wants to study at university to do so. We've got a big challenge on our hands. Recovering from this coronavirus pandemic and the economic crisis it has brought. The higher education sector has been hit so hard. We've heard this thought throughout this debate. In my home state of Victoria, the higher education sector is hurting. So many jobs have already been lost and more losses are likely to follow. There's a big demand for places in higher education because people want to get new skills and get ready for a changed job market. But the package in this bill does not create anywhere near enough new places. We're also going to need to be smart. We need to grow and expand how much public money goes into research. Australia needs to be focused on actively getting ourselves out of this recession, not digging ourselves deeper into a hole. This bill guts research funding by rejecting the long-held notion that base funding, that is student fees plus Commonwealth contribution, should provide for teaching, scholarship and base research capability. This bill is a dud. It's unfair and it's going to hit young people especially hard. This package shifts costs of higher education from the government on to students. As my Greens colleagues have reiterated through this de debate, universities should be well funded, high quality and free for all students. Education is a human right and a public good, and this government has an obligation to ensure everyone has access to high-quality, well-funded, free, lifelong education. Higher education in this country has been hit incredibly hard by the COVID virus crisis. These new laws will only make things worse. The government should invest in our universities and TAFEs, not starve them of funds. Thank you. Senator Shaw. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to oppose the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill 2020. The Liberals and Nationals have broken one of the great institutions of Australia, our world-leading tertiary education system. Instead of fixing higher education, this bill exasperates all the worst elements of the current system. As Alison Barnes, the president of the National Tertiary Education Union, has said, it does nothing to address the funding and jobs crisis that is smashing our universities. Let's be clear about what's happening here. The government is punishing the university sector to appease the culture wars in their own ranks. The Liberal National Policy binfire was already threatening to destroy what's left of our universities. With this bill now pouring fuel on that fire, the COVID-related closure of our international borders has had a profound effect on universities' finances. COVID has put a $4.8 billion hole in their income. Over the next three years, they will lose $19 billion. It's not just universities, but smaller regional universities are really struggling in the pandemic. According to the Libs and Nats, it's support of the universities themselves, always a scapegoat. A scapegoat for their own incompetent and cultural war decisions. 
They have conveniently forgotten that the sector's dependence on international student income, which has grown 137 per cent in the last decade, was created entirely by the systematic cuts to public funding. We must never forget that it was the coalition who kept government funding for Australians getting university places. And it's the coalition who have tried time and time again to bring in American-sized debts for students to compensate for the deep cuts of funding. At the end of the day, what this bill is about is cutting funding from to the sector and shifting the cost burden to the students of working families, making it harder and more expensive for Australians to go to university, while also making it harder for universities to deliver a quality education. Worst of all, it punishes challenged students instead of trying to nurture their ambitions. This idea that we can penalise students by taking their funding fails logic. There is no evidence that supports this measure. It ignores the reality of how life works and will penalise students who need the most help to learn and to thrive. Award-winning Sydney University professor Ray Cooper told the ABC radio recently that in her first semester of university she failed dismally. She almost gave up, but then swapped majors and ended up being an awarded a university medal. She said, I was just bewildered and lost, and I didn't know how to navigate the system. Students studying law, accounting, administration, economics, commerce, communications and humanities will pay more for their degrees than students studying medicine and dentistry. This does not make sense unless we assume the government would like the lawyers, accountants, economists and journalists of the next generation to only come from richer households, those households that feel secure enough to pay a great deal for the opportunity to study these disciplines. And of course, our society will be greatly poorer for it. The NTU president, Alison Barnes, has again pointed out in her brilliant op-ed in The Australian, saying countless studies indicate that the employability of arts and humanity graduates will increase as employers seek out students who can critically engage with dynamic problems. Even the Business Council chief executive, Jennifer Westcott, normally a strident supporter of this government, has said, we need our brightest kids studying the humanities. Now, this package will not result in a single extra student doing STEM subjects. This is because the poor design of this bill actually gives universities less money to teach the STEM courses like engineering and science. Analysis by Richard Holden, an economist at the University of New South Wales, shows that universities will receive $4,758 per student per year less for engineering. $3,513 less for math and $3,440 less for agriculture. So universities will actually not be able to deliver the same level of quality in teaching these important subjects require. Agriculture. Note that. Where's the nationals? I know where Labor is, standing up for people in universities. When the minister announced this program in June, he said that it was designed to boost the number of graduates in areas of expected employment growth. But then in July, education department officials gave evidence to the Senate COVID inquiry that the government has no modelling about whether university funding changes will incentivise students to study science instead of humanities. This minister either hasn't done his homework or he is using it to cover to perpetuate the coalition's culture war on the sector. But it's not just the students who, are, who, who will be failing under the system. It's teachers and re they'll be failing under the system, the government. It's teachers and researchers too. Even COVID-19 Commonwealth funding for universities was at an all-time low. 
And what do the consequences? What are the consequences for our universities when you look at this? They look like insecure, further mass casualisation and endemic wage theft, where mainly young university staff are denied even minimum wages because their work is deliberately misclassified. For example, Victoria, which is the only state reporting casual employment data for universities, is, which is compelled by law, their data recently revealed 68.74 per cent of staff are employed as casuals or short-term contracts across the Victorian university sector. This has consequences for university workers, many of whom will have been in casual positions for many years and still have no job security. Shand Windscript, a PhD candidate and casual teacher at Melbourne University, recently described what it was like living on $300 a week. I certainly wouldn't call it a living wage. She was working seven days a week. She said it was feeling, felt like a trap. She wasn't getting super or receiving her entitlements like sick leave. COVID-19 will only make this situation worse. A report released in July from the Rapid Research Information Forum and handed to the federal government estimated that 21,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the university sector were at risk by the end of the year, with 7,000 estimated to be research-related academic positions. The bill does nothing to help that. This bill shifts the burden onto students regardless of where you study or what you study, particularly if you're a Western, a Western Sydney student. Based on the estimates of the Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion at UTS, University of Technology Sydney, the government's package will take half the funds currently allocated to supporting students from underprivileged backgrounds and give it to universities in regional remote areas. Not that they don't deserve it, but what are those people in, about those people in Western Sydney? What about the economic hub of that university in Western Sydney that employs and engages and makes Western Sydney more livable? The Senate inquiry into this bill heard testimony that the University of Western Sydney could lose $6.9 million a year under the government's package. Mr Acting Deputy President, why take it out on Western Sydney? This is just another example how this government pits communities against each other. Their failure of the member of Lindsay is stark in this example. Failed to stand up for Lindsay, failed to stand up for Western Sydney, and lost $6.9 million in the economy of Western Sydney supporting the underprivileged. As Verity Firth, former Minister for Education in New South Wales, has pointed out, Western Sydney University, for example, has played a key role in expanding access to higher education for working class and first in family students. There is no reason why funding that is aimed at equitable outcomes should not continue to support the role of Western Sydney University, which has played such an important part. And yet, based on Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion's research, calculations for Western Sydney University is the biggest loser from this package. But it's not just Western Sydney that is missing out. No city or region will be left unscarred by the injury to our universities. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. A strong university sector is critical to the national interest now more than ever. Instead, we have yet again another attack on Australia's university sector. This is a bill that flies in the face of our national interest and fair access to a university education. This bill is yet another failure, another failure from Mr Morrison's Liberal Party policy machine, a machine vested not in the national interest but in narrow ideological ones. It has an approach riveted uh, throughout this that is vested 
in an Americanised attempt to attack our education system. The Liberal Party simply wants to make it harder and more expensive for Australians to go to university. It simply wants to attack the research fundamentals of our strong university sector. There has been a despicable deal done with uh, Centre Alliance and Pauline Hanson to get this legislation through. It has no regard for the devastating outcome on universities and students. And I say shame on Senator Griffin, Senator Hanson. You have betrayed Australia's young people and you are responsible for the young people that miss out on a degree and all those young people that will pay more and every university job lost. Senator Lambie, thank you for seeing sense in not supporting this bill. And uh, Senator Griff, I mean uh, Senator Patrick, it is uh, an immense, uh, it's immensely pleasing to see the detailed uh, examination that you made of this legislation. You highlighted that you don't want to see a young Australian person from a poor background missing out on education and having the bright, a bright future. And it's a shame that the same level of decency couldn't be applied to other members of the crossbench. I would have thought that amidst the economic fallout and a global pandemic, even this government, this government should have had a better set of priorities. Upskilling Australians, drawing on TAFE and our university sector to rebuild our economy. Instead, we have a government that has attacked universities at a time when demand for education is growing. Increased unemployment from the economic fallout of COVID-19 uh, has seen increased demand in higher education. And this government has talked about its so-called 39,000 uh, places, increased places. Those places are not locked into this legislation. They are a wing and a prayer uh, in terms of a promise to the sector. There's no funding for those extra places in this legislation. Universities have already uh, been affected by the loss of international students. Uh, and the decision by the Prime Minister to exclude them from the JobKeeper wage subsidy. That's seen over 10,000 university uh, workers lose their jobs. Instead of bolstering the sector to aid access to education and economic recovery, we have a government that has attacked the sector and rushed this legislation under the c cover of COVID-19. It is just the latest attempt to cut funding, increase student debt and reduce equity. The impacts of this legislation are far too high a price to pay. The impacts of this legislation will leave a legacy that will fundamentally damage the most important principles and benefits of higher education in our nation. The government has quite simply bullied the higher education sector into accepting this package that is clearly against the interests of students, the economy, research and innovation, universities themselves and the nation. This government has rushed this legislation because they're up to no good. You fought tooth and nail against an inquiry that you didn't want. You had to, we had to contend with the government using its numbers to ensure an unworkable time frame to examine the legislation, all at a time when Year 12s are doing their exams and have been confronted with the most difficult year ever. So averse to scrutiny is this government that you didn't release the modelling on the impacts of your own legislation. You ducked responsibility to this parliament and to the sector itself. It is unacceptable that the government has asked parliament to vote on legislation without doing the decent thing and really highlighting and giving access to members of this place about the real financial impact on universities of this bill and on students. In the absence of government providing detail, I'll provide the opportunity to take some numbers uh, that senators and Australian students might find interesting under this ledge. So overall, the student uh, contribution increases by 7%. Some might say in the current circumstances that's fine. 
But let's look at the inequity of how that debt is distributed. 40 per cent of students will have their fees increase, but some degrees will increase by 113 per cent. Universities receive less, not more, to educate students in the very areas that you say you want to prioritise—32 per cent to teach medical scientists, 17 per cent less to teach math students and 16 per cent less to teach engineers. This is simply nuts. The University of Sydney highlighted nationally women and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are he heavily represented in fields that will have the highest student contributions under the proposed changes. The government says, and I'm sure I'll hear this further from uh, senators opposite, that the aim of this bill is to encourage price signalling to guide students into particular courses. Well, the simple fact of the matter is, if you want to guide students into maths and engineering, you need to allow universities enough funding to increase the places for those uh, fields of study. Time and time again, price signalling has been tried and failed. It doesn't work. There is no evidence. The committee saw no evidence that price signalling works. Instead of redirecting enrolments to a certain field of study, this bill means that some students will be paying $14,500 per year for their education. Uh, and Frankly, this is more than the combined uh, government contribution and student contribution uh, by some <coughs> by more than a thousand dollars already. It's the difference between the lowest fees paid by students and the highest fees will grow by a magnitude of four. The policy rationale here is just not supported by any evidence at all. High paying professions will have lower fees, lower paying professions will have higher fees. A graduate could pay twice as much for their degree and be earning much less as another graduate with a much lower student debt. It is nothing more than an egregious ideological agenda that has no basis in the reality of employability and job readiness for graduates across their fields of study. On top of clear evidence that price signalling doesn't work, universities and evidence to the Senate committee, they have admitted that the fee schedule is likely to motivate uh, perverse enrolment and spending outcomes. A number of universities told the committee they would jump immediately to the maximum student contributions because of the package's funding cuts. Now, this can only be code for taking that $14,500 that you might be charging a commerce, law, economics student uh, uh, or a humanities student and taking, not only taking some of the money that that student will owe in student debt as well as the Commonwealth graduate contribution and shifting that money to the, capped, uh, to the fields of study where uh, income for those places has been capped. So far from useful price signalling, this will uh, result in perverse enrolment outcomes across our university sector. Universities admitted that while the new student debt component would be higher than the total 2020 income per student, there was no requirement that these funds be spent on these same students, just as I said. Universities can move income from both student fees and the government subsidy to other faculties where student debt has in fact decreased and indeed the government contribution has also decreased. Now this is quite usual for universities to pull their funding and do this, but never before have we seen such perverse incentives for universities to enrol uh, to maximise enrolment in fields of study where they can make, where they can charge uh, a profitable fee so that they can cross-subsidise to other parts of the university. Now it's clear that international students have been used in this way uh, for some time uh, in accessing our quality education system, but we must look at equity in our own system. We must look at employability and we must look at 
fairness. Put yourself in the shoes of an art student. And I've spoken to a number of students, uh, Year 12s, that have accepted offers uh, at places like ANU or um, UWA. They accepted offers uh, before this bill uh, came to light, before they could see what their fee structure was, and they find uh, that they hear through the Senate uh, recordings, the Senate hearings, that they're likely to be paying uh, top dollar at the fourteen and a half thousand dollars. They've had no uh, opportunity to respond to price signalling. If you believe in price signalling so much, why are you rushing this legislation? Students have had to enrol in these subjects uh, before universities have made clear what fees they will be charging. If people have gone, uh, picked their courses uh, and are looking at forging careers in in-demand fields, they're going to be studying hard and getting an enormous debt, up to $14,500 a year, just to find out that as they begin their careers, try and save for a home deposit, that that money that they have in student debt is actually being used to cross-subsidise students in another faculty. Humanities, commerce, communications students, you'll be paying more for your degree than doctors and dentists, despite the fact that uh, your graduate incomes are not going to be as high, despite the fact that you're still highly employable and much needed in our economy. This is fundamentally outrageous. Year 12s have gone through enough this year. There's a bleak picture of university uh, life painted by this government. Every member of the Morrison government went to university, and some would say they've done all right off the back of their qualifications. And I find it absolutely galling that this government is trying to make it harder for disadvantaged kids to chase the career of their dreams. It is staggering. It is a staggering misunderstanding of the aspirations of young Australians and of the bright future that the mums and dads of our nation envisage for their young people. Perversely, this bill has managed to construct a funding arrangement whereby the areas of study this government wants to see more enrolments for, you're paying less for, to universities per student, and in the areas government wishes to discourage enrolment, off the back of these increased student fees, universities will have a greater income. In their submission to the Senate committee, in Innovative Research Universities said, total revenue for most disciplines the government wishes to grow, such as engineering, nursing, agriculture, will decrease, but revenue in other disciplines the government considers less important, such as law, business and humanities, will be increased. Total revenue per engineering and science student will decrease by some $4,758. Per nursing student, it decreases by $1,729. In agriculture, by some $3,444. This is patently ridiculous. What on earth are you people doing? It is utterly, utterly nuts. I make a plea to this place, and in particular to the crossbench, to those that have indicated their support for this bill. Please, let's not let the government succeed in decreasing uh, funding for the public provision of our world-class universities. It is a disgrace to be jacking up fees unfairly and distributing debt in this way. It disregards the aspirations of Australians seeking better opportunities through our nation's higher education system. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm speaking to the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. Australia is facing its biggest jobs crisis since the Great Depression, and our higher education sector must respond and play a critical role in supporting Australia's economic recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted vulnerabilities across all sectors of Australia's economy, and higher education is no exemption. However, there is good news. 
for this rapidly changing sector and for the students it serves. While the Morrison government is providing record high funding for the university sector, the system must adapt to be able to support Australians through this period. And it must be done in a way that supports the increasingly agile and innovative digital economy. We know that demand for higher education increases during economic slowdowns and that students seek newer, more relevant job skills to help them enter or re-enter the workforce. The coalition government's job ready graduates reforms will support increased demand from school leavers and provide more options for upskilling and reskilling workers who've lost their jobs due to COVID-19. The job ready package will create an impressive 39,000 new university places in 2023 and 100,000 places by 2030. It will also provide additional support for students in regional and remote Australia. The coalition government already provides more than $18 billion a year to fund our universities. This will grow to $20 billion annually by 2024. The Morrison government investment will produce job-ready graduates that reflect Australia's expected economic, industry and employment growth, which is why there is an increased focus on areas of industry and community priority, as well as work-relevant qualifications. These changes are good news. The new arrangements will encourage prospective students consider adding new skills sought by employers, as well as their own preferences. In addition, higher education providers will work more closely with industry to ensure graduates have the job-ready skills and experience that they need to move into new and more innovative and more challenging labour market. The Commonwealth Grants Scheme funding clusters and student contribution bans are being simplified to make government funding for universities clearer, simpler and more sustainable. Overall, Australian taxpayers will continue to pay for more than half of the costs of Commonwealth-supported places, with funding prioritised to the areas of high public benefit and those most needed by the labour market. This means that Commonwealth-supported students studying courses in key growth areas including science, nursing, teaching, engineering and IT, will see significant reductions in their student costs. In fact, around 60 per cent of students will see either a reduction or no change in their student contribution. The changes are based at a unit level, not a degree level. This means that by choosing electives that respond to employer needs in subjects like mathematics, English, science and IT, students can reduce the cost of their overall degree. And at the same time, they will be enhancing their skills by responding to the needs of the new job market. Students enrolled in teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English and languages will pay 42 per cent less for their degree. Students who study agriculture and maths will pay 59 per cent less. Students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, IT, engineering, they will pay 18 per cent less <laughs> for their degree. Additionally, these reforms align the total combined funding for higher education units with the cost of teaching them. The new higher education funding model is based on university self-reported data on the actual cost of delivery of teaching in universities. Current students who are already studying in a Commonwealth supported place will be grandfathered in, looked after so they pay either the new lower or the same rates. From the 1st of January 2021, Current students who enrol in units where the student contribution has decreased will have these amounts applied. Current students who enrol in units where the student contribution has increased will have grandfathering arrangements applied. This means their student contribution and Commonwealth grant scheme amounts remain as they are under the current arrangements. Current Year 12 students looking to enrol in a course of study in 2021 should be assured that they will continue to have access to the course of their choice under Australia's world-leading higher education funding model. Under our Higher Education Loan Program, 
the help system. No student pay, needs to pay anything up front, and student loans are only repaid when the student is earning over $46,620. A person on the lowest repayment threshold, which starts at 80 per cent of the median earnings of all Australian employees, will pay only $8.80 to $10.20 per week. Access to help is not determined by age, income or background and means that eligible students can participate in higher education without the barrier of upfront fees. Prospective students should also remember that an investment in higher education is one of the best investments they can make. Higher education graduates have a substantial advantage in the labour market with lower rates of unemployment and higher earnings than school leavers and voc vocational education graduates. The Job Ready package includes $900 million national priorities and industry linkage fund designed to strengthen industry and university partnerships and prepare job ready graduates. The bill extends Commonwealth support to more work experience in industry units of study this will incentivise universities to include more work integrated learning options in their courses and encourage students to gain more work experience from what they learn. And then there are the regional, rural and remote students. In addition to providing more student places at Australian universities overall, the government will provide more than $400 million over the next four years to increase opportunities for regional and remote students to attend university and to lift investment in regional university campuses. All Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students from regional and remote areas will have a guaranteed Commonwealth supported place upon admission to the university of their choice, a key Napthine review recommendation. For the first time, the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program will support regional, remote and Indigenous students in addition to low SES students to access and complete higher education. The bill amends the Social Security Act to reduce from six months to three months to eligible students receiving student support payments to be eligible to receive fares allowance for a return journey home. This is another important Napthine review recommendation. Regional communities will benefit from strengthened and newly established regional university centres enhanced research opportunities and growth through additional funding to regional university campuses. And the Tertiary Access Payment, or TAP, is a one-off $5,000 payment for school leavers from outer regional and remote areas who relocate more than 90 minutes to enrol in higher, tertiary education, higher level tertiary education. The new TAP will be available from 2021. These will be distributed to universities as a scholarship and the number of scholarships allocated to a university will be based on its historical enrolment of students. The TAP will also be accessible to students studying at non-university higher education providers and VET providers through Services Australia. Under the package, the Commonwealth contribution to university funding, coupled with the student's contribution, will be aligned with the cost of delivering the course. There will be a funding floor for higher education courses. Funding certainty is vital for universities in how they plan for future enrolments and research activities. This bill includes a floor for future Commonwealth grant scheme funding, and this means Table A universities will not receive less than their maximum basic grant amount for higher education courses than they did in a previous year commencing in 2025. The legislation includes the necessary mechanisms for the government to implement a transition fund for Table A universities so they maintain their revenue over the grant years as the reforms in the Job Ready Graduates Package are introduced. Student decisions about higher education reflect a range of factors. Price is an important consideration for some students, though it is not the only consideration. For example, in 2009, the eligible uh, applicants to tertiary admi admission centres from students applying to study science was 13,795. That year, with much fanfare, the former Labor government reduced the student contribution for maths and sciences. By 2012, the number of applications to tertiary admission centres and direct applications from students applying to study science increased 
to 26,373. In 2003, however, the Labor government very quietly increased the price by 78 per cent, and applications plateaued. Younger students make choices based on the advice of their parents, careers advisers, university open days and by talking with their friends. Older students are more price sensitive and consider the return on their investment and future career opportunities. The Job Ready Graduates Package is seeking to align our funding with the national interest by encouraging students to consider their employment prospects on graduation among those factors. A graduate with a good future in growing parts of our economy is a win-win, and university graduates with vocational degrees are the most likely to be in full employment, according to new data. The government's job-ready graduates legislation will make it cheaper to study in areas of expected future growth. We're creating additional university places for Australian students and making it cheaper to study teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English and languages, agriculture, math, science, health, architecture, environmental science, IT or engineering. The coalition government is encouraging students to tailor their studies to learn skills that will be in demand in areas of future jobs growth. That means breaking down the traditional degree silos by choose, students choosing units of study across disciplines and introducing a price signal to students by making degrees cheaper in areas of expected job growth. We want our students to receive an education that sets them up for future success. And as I said under the package, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students from regional and remote areas will have a guaranteed supported place upon admission to a non-designated bachelor or bachelor honours course of study at the public university of their choice. Health is one of the fastest growing disciplines that Indigenous students choose to study at university. Between 2014 and 2018, Indigenous enrolments in health grew from 1,666 to 2,343, a 41% increase. The popularity of STEM courses among Indigenous university students has grown in recent years, and the Job Ready Graduates Package aims to provide more opportunities for women and men to gain the qualifications they will require for the jobs of the future. Allied health and teaching are professions with substantial female workforces, and it's these subjects that will see significant reductions in student contributions, meaning less, less hex help to repay once graduates are working. Women who elect to enrol in course for the jobs of the future, STEM, health, education, will be more employable on graduation, meaning they will have a higher earning potential immediately. Over the past decade, there has been a growth in the number of females with STEM qualifications. We want to ensure that these trends continue and the Job Ready Graduates Package will support the ongoing growth of women with STEM qualifications and careers. The Job Ready, package also, uh, Job Ready Graduate Package creates an additional 100,000 opportunities over the next decade for students to pursue university. It puts $400 million into supporting rural and regional higher education. And it is unapologetically, unapologetically aligned to the employment needs of the country coming out of the COVID pandemic. Teachers, health workers, engineers, agriculture and IT degrees are all discounted significantly to encourage students. And just to remind this, this place that this will be around 60 per cent of students are better off or the same under these reforms. Strengthening student protections in public universities also aligns quality and accountability in Australia's tertiary sector. Every student studying in Australia can be confident, wherever they choose to study, that they will be assessed as being academically suited to that study, their academic progress and engagement will be monitored throughout the course, and they will be prevented from incurring debt for study for which they are not suited. These initiatives have been well received by university chancellors across the nation. It will support our students to prepare to contribute to our strengthening economy as Australia moves forward post-COVID. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, anybody who had listened to the course of this debate would think, first, that all Australians should and must go to university if they are to have a good and meaningful life. And then there's been people 
who would come away from this debate thinking that Australia has no ability to assist people from uh, poorer families to be able to get to university, that there's no loan scheme that allows people of lesser means to access university. And you'd be forgiven for coming away from this debate thinking that life isn't worth living unless you get free education. Well, what a load of utter rubbish all of that has been. So let's do some fact checking, shall we? University is not essential to earning a good living. University is not essential to having a good life. Trades, for instance, can offer you much more money, if that's what motivates you. They can offer you real chances to build serious businesses, to contribute massively to this nation and to your economy and to your family's financial independence. And for many people, they are much better suited to a hands-on type of learning and working. Let's do some more fact-checking. There's absolutely nothing to stop a smart, motivated person in this country from accessing education at university simply due to cost. Now, that might be uncomfortable for some people in this room, but it is the truth. What we call the HELP scheme has been known as HEX in my time allows for affordable loans that don't need to be repaid until that person is working and earning a pretty good living. That's fair. And it means that a kid of modest means like me, and indeed many people on the coalition side of this chamber, have been able to go to university despite the fact that they're nothing fancy. Now, there's also something that seems to be getting lost in this debate too, the idea that university is something that mum and dad always pays for, or the idea that you shouldn't be doing anything else but studying while you're learning. Now, my experience of university was that working part-time while I studied was not only something that helped me pay my way, but it was a big part of the experience of learning to be an adult. Working four jobs while I was at university taught me to prioritise my spending, to manage my time, to communicate with my employers about my commitments and manage them well. It taught me how to chat to people from all walks of life and appreciate their different strengths and interests. I can tell you the time that I spent selling linen in a shop, bookkeeping for small businesses, waitressing in a steakhouse in an Italian restaurant and tutoring school kids was good for me. <laughs> I learned <clears throat> skills that I draw on every day in this place and in my career before it. And indeed, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that I, earned a, I learned a lot more from that than I did from many of my university classes. The, the phrase free education gets bandied around a lot in this place by both Labor and by those in the Greens party. But you know what? That is nothing more than a bald-faced lie. Because everything you get for free has got to be taken from somebody else, particularly under the redistributionist worldview of those in the Greens. It's particularly hypocritical, though, when we hear this from Labor, because they didn't indulge their free education fantasy when they were in government under the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years. If they really believed that was the right thing to do, then why didn't they do it when they had the chance? The answer is that actions speak louder than words. It's nothing more than a slogan designed to mislead young people in particular, a lie on which they never plan to deliver. Now, the Greens, well, they might just be silly enough to genuinely believe in it, but with their usual approach of free everything for everyone, they've got no idea of how to pay for it. And that's the kind of reckless indulgence that is only available to minor parties who know they will never have to come good 
on their talk. Talk is cheap. But let's hope it stays that way because our nation would be an economic basket case quick as a flash if the Greens and their unicorn fantasy policies were ever the order of the day. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, you might not know that I used to be a sessional academic at a school of business and law in one of the major regional universities um, before I came to this place. It was a job I did part-time, there you go, part-time work again, while I was in full-time practice as a barrister. And I really enjoyed teaching my students. It was a really fulfilling activity to do. But I was regularly troubled by the concern that there were people enrolled in my classes. They enrolled every year. They never once submitted assessment. They never once showed up. They never once passed, of course, with that kind of a record. Um, and they got billed for it every time they did. It was a windfall for the university, who didn't have to apply any resources to educating this person. It was a bill to the Commonwealth, who was at least um, for the time being paying for that person's um, non-education. And it left a student with a bill, no education really, and no plan with which to pay it. So quite rightly, here this government is putting this kind of practice to an end. It's simply common sense. But I was also concerned about the job prospects of my students, who found class sometimes a struggle. There were many who I thought were better suited to a less bookish way of learning. And there were more practical types whose strength in the practical was something to be celebrated and encouraged. Because the fact is, not everyone is suited to the academic life. Not everyone gets the best out of university education. And while there's a real demand for people to be able to retrain at the moment, if we step back from the COVID crisis, I think there's a real conversation to be had about whether as a nation we are sending too many people to university, building them up with the expectation of careers in fields that simply aren't there. So this bill does something very good for students in that way because there is a reality that says we have particularly COVID-related unemployment, but at the same time we have skill shortages in some fields. This is about making sure people are getting all of the encouragement necessary to focus their education on the areas where there are jobs. And isn't that the promise that, as a country, we make to the people who go to university? The promise that what they are learning is something they will actually be able to use, that they'll have the dignity of a career in which they can work and earn a living and get ahead and rise to the top of their profession through hard work because we didn't delude them into believing they could have a career in a job that isn't there. Oh, I think it's just being honest. The fact is there has never been more spent on education, but we still have a real skill shortage even as we are dealing with unemployment. So let's not build false hope in students by educating them in jobs or fields for which the jobs just aren't there. When we have real demand in great career areas that do lead to a meaningful job. This bill does great work in this sphere. By making or providing for cheaper education in areas where this nation has high skills demand, we are doing the right thing by students because they won't finish university with a debt for an education that they can't repay because they've been educated in something for which there isn't a job. It's doing the right thing by students. We're putting them on a long-term path to success 
not a long-term path to disappointment. It's good for our economy because we're going to be able to meet those skill shortages so that businesses can snap up these talented, educated Australians and make the most of their talents to grow this nation's economy. And it's good for the taxpayer too, because it means as more and more of those educated people go into real work, they reach the point where they can start repaying their help debt so much sooner. And that's the right thing to do by the Australian taxpayer, particularly those Australian taxpayers who are not themselves university educated, who never got the benefit of the taxpayer subsidising their learning and yet are nevertheless expected to do it for others now that they are paying tax. Indeed, there are people who come to me from time to time and say, um, you know, I learned on the job, I did a traineeship, I worked really hard, I still work really hard, I never got five years at university um, paid for by the taxpayer, either in full or subsidised by half, um, and yet I'm expected to pay for it for everyone else. It's a pretty fair point. Why do we ask the construction workers and the labourers and the hairdressers and the shop assistants to subsidise the career prospects of our lawyers and our accountants and our marine biologists and our um, women's studies arts graduates. We, we ask them to do that, but it's a lot to ask for people who never got that kind of help themselves. So this bill makes modest increases in study areas where skills demand doesn't exist because we need fewer graduates in that area, and it makes it cheaper to study in areas where there is a skills demand. And when you step back and you put it like that, you go, well, this, this is just plain common sense. And the fact that we have spent so long in this chamber with people bleating at the injustice of it, carrying on as though this represents an enormous human rights violation, confected outrage of the most exaggerated sort, well, it makes me understand why so many Australians think this place is out of touch. Because most Australians don't expect this. They don't expect free everything. Most Australians don't expect to be educated for free in an area of unicorn fantasy study for which there are no jobs and for which others should be paying off despite the fact they didn't get the same kind of education themselves. I mean, this is, this is the kind of utter nonsense that explains to me precisely why Australians get frustrated with politicians. So let's, let's do another quick fact check before I wrap it up. There's been a lot of talk about student debt. And yeah, we do ask students to make a contribution to their education. But let's not pretend they don't also get support. Overall, Australian taxpayers will continue to pay more than half of the cost of Commonwealth supported places in universities with funding prioritised to the areas of high public benefit and those areas most needed by the labour market. And quite frankly, to do anything else would be a dereliction of our duty to the taxpayer. It's right for people to invest in their own education because they get some private benefit. But with that 50 per cent contribution from the Commonwealth, the public benefit that comes from having an educated society is also recognised. It's fair, Madam Acting Deputy President, to students, to our economy, to the taxpayer. It is fair for all. Senator Fairbairn, Fair Anti-Wells. Thank, Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, 
I rise to also make a contribution uh, to the debate on the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020, particularly as a senator uh, with my electorate office based in the Illawarra uh, and, of course, with a very successful university in the Illawarra. And I will focus my comments very much in that uh, regional uh, space. Um, the coalition government is providing record high funding for the university sector, but having said that, I think it's time for the sector now to adapt to play its part uh, in uh, supporting uh, Australians um, through this very difficult period. Now, um, Senator Stoker made a, a number of very uh, important points. And I think it's important for Australians to understand that it is not necessarily a measure of one's success to have a university degree. There are many things that we ask Australians to do, and regrettably in the 1980s uh, we saw through some of the changes that were made by Labor uh, and uh, then Education Minister Dawkins, we saw many technical colleges simply uh, uh, um, become uh, B-grade universities. And as a consequence of that and the passage of time, we devalued uh, the importance of a trade. And in effect, I think that we've seen we've lost a generation of young people uh, who have not undertaken trades and who have been forced into circumstances and in the belief that uh, a university degree, they had to have a university degree to succeed uh, in life. And, and I think that now we're facing skill shortages, which are as a direct consequence of those uh, actions. So therefore, I think it is important to put into context that uh, the Australian economy needs um, people to do all sorts of jobs. Now, some of those require university degrees and some of them do not require university degrees. But insofar as those jobs that do require university degrees, I think it's very important um, to look at uh, where we need people trained. Now, uh, this package uh, is uh, very important because it does support uh, regional uh, universities. And um, I'd like to make reference, if I may, to an article which was in the Australian Financial Review on the 29th of September by uh, Robert Bolton. And he, um, he starts his article by saying, new data on university research shows the fastest rate of growth is happening in regional and smaller universities. A finding University of Wollongong Vice-Chancellor Paul Willing says should reprioritise uh, budget thinking. Universities such as Curtin in Western Australia, Deakin in Victoria, Griffith in South East Queensland and Newcastle and Wollongong in New South Wales are snapping at the heels of giants such as Melbourne, Sydney and Queensland with regard to the growth uh, rate of research um, citations. Uh, in an article, uh, in a speech that uh, the Education uh, Minister gave on the 30th of September, uh, he refers uh, to obviously the importance of this bill, but he uh, underscores uh, the support that the bill is receiving uh, from entities such as the Regional Universities Network, um, and that the importance of investing in regional education also playing a dividend for regional communities. And he quotes the Napthine uh, Review, which I'd also like to state, increasing the participation of rural, regional and remote students will directly and positively contribute to the economic and social development of rural, regional and remote uh, areas. So um, I would like to also uh, refer to uh, a piece that uh, Professor Wellings, who is also the chair of the vice chancellors in New South Wales, and a piece that he wrote on the 30th of June in the Australian, and he he says that Australia has been shaped by many forces over the years. So it's not remarkable that the structure of universities and the way they operate have consist, con constantly evolved to align with the needs of the country. History has shown that interventions into higher education policy by the Commonwealth Government have also been part of moves to safeguard the country's prosperity when a black swan swoops. 
The crucial role in coronavirus recovery that universities play at present can be likened to the aftermath of World War II. The Commonwealth Reconstruction Training Scheme of the 1940s assisted thousands of returned servicemen and women to enter higher education with a focus on medicine, dentistry, engineering, veterinary science, agriculture and science. So let's look at the reform package. Basically the package provides opportunities across three important objectives that will increase the number of graduates in areas where there will be uh, employment growth and demand, such as teaching, nursing, agriculture, STEM and information technology. It will lift the educational attainments for students in regional Australia and it will strengthen partnerships uh, between universities and business to drive participation in workforce and increase productivity. Now we know that the reforms uh, will provide um, uh, the necessary funding to support additional uh, university places, 39,000 uh, by 2023 and almost 100,000 places by 2030. Now the approach and the new funding model and the approach to the new funding model is a more nuanced approach um, to one that determines a share of costs that need to be met by the government and students in different fields. Uh, and in uh, an article that uh, uh, Professor Wellings, also the one I refer to, he points out the key features of um, the package, which do co uh, are cause uh, for optimism. And I'd like to refer to some of the key ones. Um, the HEX help scheme remains unchanged. It provides certainty for the future. Um, the income contingent loan scheme, um, which was delivered by the Hawke government in 1989 with the aims of expanding the higher education sector and promote greater access um, to promote economic growth. Demand and affordability will not change. Let's not forget, despite all the hype by those opposite, students will be free to study what they want um, and the universities will have the necessary flexibility to adjust the number of um, bachelor, sub-bachelor and postgraduate places uh, within uh, their funding um, allocations. The funding uh, from the Commonwealth is aligned to the actual costs of teaching, um, as presented in the 2016 Deloitte Access Economics Report Cost of Delivery of Higher Education. And this importantly recognises um, and supports um, the activities that are conducted by universities uh, and uh, the benefits that they generate. Um, we know the unemployment situation uh, is dire and as we have seen, uh, universities are already providing short courses that address national uh, priorities of teaching, health, science and IT. Um, there will be tremendous opportunities for growth in metro and urban areas on the fringes of Sydney, Melbourne and southeastern Queensland in particular. Um, and this will be due to the fact that more places will be provided for domestic uh, students in areas where there will be uh, employment uh, uh, prospects. There are as I've, um, as I've said and as others have said, very strong regional and social inclusion um, elements and the increased funding uh, for the universities will provide for greater focus on regional, rural, low socioeconomic status and Indigenous <coughs> students. Um, there will be a three-year transition uh, period for uh, these reforms um, and so that will enable the universities to adapt uh, and to uh, prepare themselves for the necessary um, changes. I think it is important to also, uh, at this point, um, uh, stress, and I'll uh, do this in, in conclusion. At the moment, the university sector is facing um, headwinds uh, from different areas. Now, let's, let's be honest, uh, some of those are of their own making. And as I've had the opportunity to speak to different people in the university sector, I have um, stressed to them that 
for some universities, the dependence that they have placed, particularly on overseas students and most especially on university uh, on students from China, have now resulted in uh, them facing financial uh, difficulties. And clearly, uh, universities, not all universities, followed um, the advice and the edict of their own business schools in practicing um, diversification, which I would have thought was uh, business practice uh, 101. And yes, while the rivers of gold were flowing in relation to foreign students and most especially um, from China, uh, now we have seen uh, that universities will now have to cut their cloth according to um, a different uh, design. And at a time when the government is in circumstances where they have to bring into this place foreign relations legislation, which most particularly will address the activities of universities, I think is a telling factor that universities have um, undertaken and have engaged in activities uh, which have uh, created a, a negative perspe uh, pers uh, perspective uh, as far as they're concerned uh, by the uh, Australian uh, uh, public. So I say to those universities, uh, you have made uh, mistakes. I think it's important for you to admit those mistakes, but the government is now putting in place a very good package. And my very strong advice to those vice chancellors in particular who have engaged uh, in um, uh, seeking to, uh, I think, uh, provide misinformation in relation to this package. I think it's time for you to get on board, uh, to accept that the circumstances have changed and that uh, it's time uh, for you to do things differently and to accept uh, that this is a good package and support its passage. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank the Senate and those senators who have contributed on the Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. This bill implements the government's Job Ready Graduates package, which was announced by the Minister for Education on the 19th of June. The bill demonstrates our government's commitment to reforming Australia's higher education sector to drive growth and support into our regions and in areas of national need and to position universities to best achieve the objective of producing job-ready graduates that help Australia drive employment creation out of the COVID-19 crisis. The bill better aligns the funding of universities in supporting students to what it costs to teach those students. This allows the government to then support growth in the higher education sector and to support the creation and funding of an additional 100,000 university places by 2030. The bill also directs more public funding towards students studying in areas of projected employment growth, as well as areas of industry and community priority, meaning that there will be a significant decrease in fees for students studying in these areas. These funding changes will encourage students to pick the areas of study at university that are most likely to help them secure a job, to grow our economy and to ensure that universities are focused and have the capacity to produce job-ready graduates across all areas. Importantly, this bill will reduce student contribution amounts for more than half of all commencing students. Students enrolling in teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English and languages will pay 42 per cent less for their degree. Students who study agriculture and maths will pay 59 per cent less for their degrees. Students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, information technology and engineering will pay 18 per cent less for their degrees. And crucially, of course, Mr President, this all occurs in the ongoing framework of the HexHelp system that ensures no Australian student need face upfront fees in relation to their access to university. The bill includes grandfathering arrangements to ensure no student enrolled in a course prior to 1 January 2021 is worse off as a result of these reforms. These grandfathering arrangements will extend the amended Commonwealth contribution amounts in the bill ensuring universities receive 
the same Commonwealth contribution for those grandfathered students. In response to feedback from the higher education sector, the bill will create the new disciplines of, pathway, of professional pathway social work and professional pathway psychology in Commonwealth grant scheme funding. This change will result in an increase in the Commonwealth contribution and reduction of the proposed student contribution amount for social work or psychology units undertaken as part of those qualifications that are part of the professional pathway. We look forward to working quickly and closely with the sector to settle in the most efficient and effective way to implement these arrangements. The bill also extends Commonwealth grant scheme funding to more work experience in industry units of study, which will enable more students to gain critical workplace skills while they study. The bill also allows the government to establish its $900 million National Priorities and Industry Linkage Fund, which will provide universities with additional support to collaborate with Australian industry to design courses that best equip students with the job-ready skills and experience that they need to succeed. The bill also improves flexibility for unities, universities and how they provide places based on what they receive in Commonwealth Grant Scheme funding. This will enable public universities to better respond to student, industry and community demand and ensure Australia's workforce has the right skills at the right time. The bill will also introduce a maximum basic grant amount floor for higher education courses. This will provide funding certainty for public providers by establishing that their funding for higher education courses for grant years 2021 to 2024 must not be less than the amount specified in the Commonwealth Grant Scheme guidelines and for 2025 and later grant years must not be less than the provider's maximum basic grant amount for those courses for the preceding grant year. The bill also implements some key recommendations made by Dr Dennis Napthine in the National, Regional, Rural and Remote Education Strategy. It will introduce demand-driven funding for Commonwealth-supported places for regional and remote Indigenous students. Following the passage of the bill, all regional and remote Indigenous students who are admitted to a public university in a non-medical bachelor or bachelor honours course of study will be guaranteed a Commonwealth-supported place. It improves access to fares allowance by reducing the number of months a student must be receiving eligible payments for fares allowance from six to three months for a trip home. The bill also enables the government's plans to introduce grant payments through the Indigenous, Regional and Low Socioeconomic Status Attainment Fund. This will allow for more support for regional, rural, Indigenous and low SES students to access university, graduate and enjoy the benefits higher education offers. The bill also strengthens and extends student protection and provider integrity measures under the Higher Education Support Act. As such, importantly, these amendments do not penalise students for circumstances beyond their control, as the ability to have units discounted due to special circumstances is important and warranted, and as such, new subsection 36-13-2 acknowledges the systems and processes that higher education providers have in place to identify, protect and provide support for vulnerable students who may be experiencing difficulty in their studies or who may have had the, not had the academic ability to undertake a specific higher education course. The bill also contains various technical and administrative changes. In the committee stage, I flag that I will move amendments to correct some minor technical issues in the bill to amend the proposed completion rate provision in section 36-13 of the bill to specify circumstances where a higher education provider will be satisfied that it is impracticable for a student to complete the requirements of a unit of study, to extend until 30 June 2021 the loan fee exemption for all undergraduate students accessing fee help, to reintroduce from 1 January 2021 a 10% discount for students who are eligible for hex help assistance and pay part of their student contribution for a unit up front, and to reintroduce the student learning entitlement, which will commence on 1 January 2022. I thank all senators for their contributions in debating the, these measures, especially those who have engaged in such constructive discussions with the government as we work to improve access to the higher education sector and graduate outcomes, as indeed I thank many across the sector, the many stakeholders, including universities, students, employers and industry groups that have worked with Minister Tien and the government to provide useful and constructive feedback on the bill and the government's job-ready graduates package. Mr President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to before we proceed to the second reading vote. So the question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, tell her for the noes. Senator Hughes, please. Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes. Thank you. The result of the division is ayes 7, noes 36. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, the question is now that the bill be read a second time. Well, the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Yeah. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith tell for the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, it being passed 11.45, I'll call, the, oh, I'll call the clerk before we move on to— A bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education and social security and for related purposes. It being passed 11.45, we'll move on to other business. Yesterday, I uh, the Deputy President informed the Senate that I had received letters from Senator Griff and Senator Roberts seeking appointment to the single crossbench position on the Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction. In accordance with the standing orders, a ballot will be held to determine which one of the two senators who have nominated is to be appointed. Before proceeding to a ballot, I must ring the bells for four minutes. So ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The Senate will now proceed to a ballot. Ballot papers will be distributed to senators who are requested to write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate they wish to vote for. I remind senators the two candidates are Senator Griff and Senator Roberts. Distribute the ballots. Not yet. I was going. I was going. Have all senators voted? They have. I will ask clerks to collect the ballot papers. I invite Senator Griff and Senator Roberts to act as scrutineers. And with the leave of the Senate, I am going to ask that the ballot be counted in one of the lobbies to allow us to proceed to other business, because we have a pretty full agenda before 12.45. Have, have all senators? No, still some being collected. Oh.
Has every senator voted? Oh, still going? You think senators would be a bit more practice at voting? Now I'm going to ask for the third time. Have all senators voted? Oh, I'll ask the scrutineers to leave the room and they'll count the ballot and announce it accordingly. And I'll call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? Um, is I move that I question. Hang that on, I Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Uh, I move that a motion to provide for a motion to provide for the uh, consideration of legislation may be moved yeah. immediately and determined. Uh, oh, so I just move the motion. Ah, I move the motion to circulate in the chamber. Senator Wong. Uh, order. Can I indicate? I think Senator Gallagher will respond uh, that the, the opposition wishes to vote against the guillotining of the Higher Education Bill. But thank you for your you know, confidence. Uh, so I propose uh, that uh, items Placida five, 1A, Placida 5, uh, paragraph B and paragraph C be put separately, noting that is the opposition succeed in defeating those, it would require a, a, an amendment to paragraph D. Sorry. Do you wish me to say that again, Mr. No, President? No, sorry. Yeah, please do. Sorry, I was trying to get a copy of the motion. Okay. Please do. With consultation with the, the, with the uh, in order to enable the opposition to give expression to its opposition to the guillotining of the higher education bill, I propose that the Senate put separately uh, paragraph one uh, a placet of five uh, b and c, noting that if the opposition, if the Senate rejects those paragraphs, there would be a, a consequential amendment required subsequently. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'll just speak uh, briefly uh, following uh, Senator Wong's contribution around, um, you know, subject to what Senator Wong has outlined, uh, the opposition's position on the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill, which is um, part of this motion, and uh, to sit on Friday to deal with those bills. The opposition will be supporting uh, that. Um, our view is um, that the government has decided to wrap up a range of tax measures in one omnibus bill uh, and require that all be put together. This doesn't, that does not allow us to, vote, to separately deal with rather significant tax measures that are included in this bill, which we would prefer to have the time uh, to work through. However, we will not stand in the way of the income tax cuts, which we have been calling for since August uh, last year, to be brought forward and for that money to flow as quickly as possible into the pockets of working Australians around this country. Now, as I said, our preference would be that the government didn't choose to play politics and that we were able to deal with these bills separately um, and allow for uh, a, a longer consideration of the, the large tax measures, uh, including those that cost $27 billion, um, but that isn't possible. Um, we're not in a perfect world. We're not in the world where, where we can choose some of these elements, and as such, um, we will support the passage of those bills um, as outlined in the motion uh, through debate on Friday. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just rise on behalf of the Greens to say that we will be vehemently opposing this disgraceful government's motion to guillotine a guillotine a bill that hikes fees for universities, cuts funding for universities, and then guillotining it, us not having even the time to go to committee stage and debate the ream, the ream of amendments <laughs> that this government has sent through just an hour ago. And like really shame, shame on Centre Alliance and shame on One Nation for buckling, for buckling under the government for some petty deals that you've done, which Minister Birmingham defined as minor technical amendments to this legislation. You've been taken for a massive ride, you know. You've fallen hook, line and sinker for government spin. You've been totally duped. There's nothing else to say about this. 
some of the things that you want are not even in legislation. So you said, fingers crossed and hope for the best. Yeah. That's, I do know what I'm talking about. I do know. Yeah, there might be some secret deal that you're not letting us on, but this government isn't even giving us the decency to actually talk about something which is going to affect all future generations of Australians, which is going to take away the right of education from generations of Australians. This is how bad you are. If you think this bill is so great, then let's talk about it. Let us talk about the amendments that you're putting up. Let's talk about our amendments that we want to put to this bill. Yes, it's a terrible bill. There's some absolutely horrific aspects of the bill that we want to move amendments on. Why won't you let us talk about this? Because you know, you know that this is a bad bill. You know that this bill is going to disadvantage indigenous people, it's going to disadvantage women, it's going to disadvantage first in family, it's going to disadvantage regional Australians, it's going to disadvantage people li living in the cities, it's going to disadvantage every single person in Australia. <laughs> And again, the amendments that you're moving to this bill actually are in the same vein as the budget that you have delivered, putting more money into the pockets of rich people. So one of the amendments that I qu quickly had a look at, because I haven't even had a chance to look at the others, is actually giving a discount to people who pay fees up front. And who are those people who are going to pay fees up front? I think Senator Sambi Lambie said it exactly like it was. It is the rich, it is the rich who can afford to pay fourteen thousand dollars a year. And you're giving a you know a tax break to them yet again. Because that's what it is. Absolutely right. You you don't care. You don't care about anyone else in this country but the super wealthy and the rich. That's all you care about. You've told us that again and again in this week during your budget speeches, again and again. You stand up here and say, you know, that people shouldn't go to university, or, you know, or the Greens say that everyone should go to university. That's not true. We want education that is available to all, so people can have a choice to do what they want to. Absolutely, that's what democracy is about. And we are sitting here crushing the democratic rights, the democratic freedoms of people in this country. But you're also crushing democracy overall when you try and guillotine us from speaking on things, from debating things that will actually put up a very bleak future for Australians. That's what this bill is going to do. You don't even understand that. It's, it's cutting research funding. You know, the, the money that you announced in the budget goes nowhere near the billions of dollars of research funding that this bill actually cuts out. These are the people who have already lost their jobs in droves. They're not coming back. Our researchers are not coming back. And we need those people. We need those people to come out of the recession, to come out of this pandemic, Order. Thanks, Larissa. Yeah, I think, Mr. President, you should probably call order. Uh, Senator Rennick has been order. ranting at me for the last order. 10 minutes. Order. I, I'm dealing with the procedural matters. Can I honestly say, down the end of that chamber, there are very few people with a halo, but everyone should remain quiet. Now a senator has asked for the respect of the chamber, I'm going to demand it. Order. Um, can I finish ruling on this before I actually? Senators need to remain quiet while I am issuing a ruling. Senator Rennick, I was actually just asking senators to remain quiet while I'm issuing a ruling. Senator Faruqi to continue. Do you want to take a point? Or Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would um, urge you to ask Senator Rennick to withdraw his foul language directed at Senator Faruqi. Well, I couldn't hear anything. If well, there's, uh, Senator, no, Senator Hanson Young, I'm going to do what was normally done in this, which is where something was not on the Hansard, I invite a senator, if something was said that was unparliamentary, to withdraw. I had no chance of hearing anything then. 
Is any, if anything unparliamentary was said, I encourage it to be withdrawn. Okay, well, in that order, order. Thank you. Senator Rennick has withdrawn. Senator Faruqi to continue, and I remind senators of the need to remain silent in the chamber. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, thousands upon thousands of students, of uni staff have contacted us all sitting on this side and you all sitting on that side, telling you how horrible, how bad, how, how horrific the consequences of this bill are going to be. Yet obviously on that side, they're falling on deaf ears. Well, they haven't fallen on deaf ears on this side. So we still want to continue on and talk about these things and try and change some of the things that are in this bill. We want to debate your amendments. We want to see what you are amending. We want to have a chance to look at what they are and give you the chance to defend them. But you can't. But you can't defend them. That's what the issue is here. You cannot defend a single thing in this terrible bill. It is defenseless what's going on in this bill. Shame on all of you. And we will absolutely be opposing your guillotine motion Shame. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, President. And here we go. The fix is in. A dirty secret deal between the government and the Labor Party to jam the tax cuts through this Senate with no inquiry whatsoever. And we, uh, what we can tell, what we can tell uh, from this dirty deal is that $18 billion of government expenditure based on a flawed, trickle-down, neoliberal model that we know is not going to work is now going to be jammed through this Senate with no opportunity to scrutinise the details whatsoever. Labor isn't even bothered to go through the motions of being an opposition party in this place. I mean, what is actually the point of the Labor Party anymore. Bringing forward the stage two tax cuts will mean that the millionaires get $2,500 a year, the working poor get 250 bucks a year, and if you haven't got a job, you just line up for your regular kick in the teeth from the neoliberals in this place. The Labor and Liberal parties are trying to con this country and con Australian people into thinking these tax cuts are going to trickle down. Well, I'll tell you something. It's been 40 years since Hawke and Keating while we've been waiting for trickle down to work and the people at the bottom are dying of thirst. This is a sad day for democracy. It's a sad day for this Senate. But you know who the saddest day uh, it is for? is the Australian Labor Party capitulating again to the neoliberals, capitulating again to the government. They don't even want an inquiry into $18 billion worth of government expenditure. Order. Seriously, why don't you just go and join the, the Liberal National Party, Senator Watt? You can Order. interject all you like, but you might as well just join the LNP and sit over there and just form the neoliberal trickle-down economics party. You're a disgrace and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Senator Cormann. All right. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I'll just speak very briefly uh, just to say that uh, uh, this is quite a lengthy motion. It's clearly been prepared in advance and, and, and not much notice was given. I'll just, I'll just point that out. That, uh, that, uh, that, that, so that is a little bit disre disrespectful. Uh, just in relation to the gag motion, um, I, I just want to point out to the chamber that, uh, and I'll just quote from a, a tweet from Rebecca Sharkey from the other place on the 3rd of uh, September 2020, where she said, earlier this week, the government gagged debate on the higher ed bill, which meant few of us got to speak. This is not democracy. So I just um, ask Central Alliance to uh, reflect on that when they vote in relation to this particular uh, gag motion on the higher ed bill. And I'll just point out, you know, having, having formerly been a member of the uh, Central Alliance party, 
Uh, the rules in relation to gagging of debates were basically that we would never, uh, they would never gag a, a second reader, and they would only gag uh, the committee stage in circumstances where there was obvious filibustering going on. Uh, what, 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 this gag, what this gag will mean is that genuine questions that, uh, are to, that were to be asked will not uh, be able to be asked, will not be able to get uh, clarification on elements of the bill uh, where there is uh, uncertainty, and that may also affect uh, later interpretations of, in, in uh, any proceedings as well. So it is, um, it, it's an awful thing to do uh, that we should not be gagging debate on the higher education bill. Senator Cormann. Motion will be put. The question is the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion be put. Moved by Senator Cormann. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey, tell her for the ayes. Senator Seawitt, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 50, noes 8. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the motion moved by Senator Cormann with the following clauses excised at the request of the opposition. Oh, sorry, upset, put, put next, put subsequently. So this is the motion moved by Senator Cormann except for, which I'll put after this, clauses 1, Roman V, B and C. That's correct. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So this. Stop the bells. The question is the motion, as I just described it, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Pat Davy, tell if the ayes. Senator C would tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 50, noes 8. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that clauses 1, Roman v, b and c of that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that clauses 1, Roman 5, B and C of the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 7. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. 27. Sorry, 27. So the matter is resolved in the affirmative, and we therefore adopt the motion, entire motion as moved. We now move to the placing of business. Uh, it, oh, sorry, I should announce the ballot result. Uh, the ballot result is Senator Griff receiving 51 votes, Senator Robert received nine. Senator Griff is therefore elected as the member of the crossbench on the Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction. We'll now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Smith. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion to authorise the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works be authorised to hold a private meeting, otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33-1, during the sitting of the Senate today from 1 p.m. Qu question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12:45 p.m. today, and b government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 2 p.m. today, and c general business notices of motion numbers 825 and 828 be considered during general business today. The question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The aye has it. The ayes have it. Um, any, I've got some postponements from the clerk. There being no other matters, the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one for today in the name of Senator Waters postponed to the 9th of November 2020. And general business notice number 820 in the name of Senator Roberts postponed to the 10th of November 2020. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item seven of the order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we will now go to notices of motion. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fair of Auntie Wells. Um, Wells. Draw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one and two standing in my name for eight sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the asset corporations, foreign financial <laughs> services <laughs> providers, foreign AFS licenses, instrument 2020. 198 and asset corporations foreign financial services providers funds management financial services instrument 2020 199 thank you are there any other notices of motion senator urquhart thank you, Mr. President. Um, i uh, rise to give notice on behalf of senator wong of a motion concerning the rural regional and transport committee thank you senator urquhart there being no other notices of motion, we will now move to the consideration of selection of bills committee report. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. I present the ninth report of 2020 of the selection of bills committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. Senator Dunham. Uh, I move that government amendment as circulated. Okay. So Senator Dunham has moved the government amendment as circulated. Which is okay. So I've got a series of amendments to that. I'll take the separation first, then I'll go to the amendments. Senator Gallant. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, we would like to separate out B B uh, from and put those questions separately. Okay. So I'm just going to look at the clerk. Okay. So B and D was it, Senator? It's subsection B, B, oh, B. Yeah, B, B, B of B. B of B. Okay. Yeah. So I also have an amendment to B of B from Senator Faruqi, and I'm going to put that amendment first because then I will put yours separately. Senator Faruqi, could you move your amendment? I understand that it has been revised. Yes. Um, so, thank you, Mr. President. Um, could I? Um, at the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the economic recovery package, job maker hiring credit, Amendment Bill 2020, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 6 November 2020. Okay, so I'm going to put the amendment by Senator Faruqi, and then we'll deal with it separately according to the opposition request. The question is that Senator Faruqi's amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. 
The nose have it. The eyes have it. All right, I'll put it again. Those in support of Senator Fruki's amendment say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Okay, so I now have another amendment moved by Senator McKim. <laughs> Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that at the end of the motion the following words be added and in respect of the Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 1 December 2020. So the question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Yes, Senator Seward. With the leave and have it recorded that the Greens voted. Sure. With the leave of the chamber, we'll cancel the division, Sorry. and it will be recorded Sorry. that the Greens voted in favour of that motion. So, I now have two other amendments. Oh, sorry. Yep, this is the government amendment. So. I'm now going to put the amendment moved by Senator Dunham with the amendment of Senator Faruqi incorporated uh, to the Selection of Bills Committee report. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. So I now have Senator Gallagher to move some amendments, I believe. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, shall I do, I'll do the cashless. Uh, sure. yep. If I could just add, add in at the end of the motion in respect of the Social Security Administration Amendment, continuation of cashless welfare bill 2020, the Community Affairs Ledge Committee report by 26 November 2020. The question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Please, I'm more, I think senators would appreciate that. Senator Gallagher. Record the um, opposition's, the opposition's voting position. Thanks. The, the noes have it, but we've recorded the opposition op, uh, position supporting the amendment. Senator Seward. Can you, our extreme opposition to this. This is outrageous that this bill will not be reviewed. Okay, so this the, is so permanent Senator, entrenching Senator, Senator of these Seward, trials. Please, this is not, uh, that, so you supported the amendment moved by the opposition, uh, but the call on it was the noes have it. Senator Gallagher, you have another amendment. Uh, thank you. This is uh, also to seek, in respect of the EPBC amendment streamlining environmental approvals bill, that the bill be referred immediately to the Environment and Communications Ledge Committee for inquiry and report by the 11th of November. So the question is I that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The amendment is therefore negative. I will now put the report of the selection of the bills committee as amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, in accordance with the resolution just agreed to prior to that, I will now put the questions required to dispose of the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020 as we pass 1245. I will first deal with the amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. These are on sheet 1033. The question is that item 40 and division 2 of schedule 4 stand as printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that item 40 in Division 2 of Schedule 4 stand as printed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell if the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell if the noes. Division is eyes 28, nose 26. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I'm going to seek some quick advice from the clerk. I will now deal with the amendments. So the, the amendment one on that sheet does now not need to be put. And my, my advice is from the clerk. So I will now deal with the amendments and the request circulated by the government. I understand there is an addendum and supplementary explanatory memorandums, and I call the minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, I table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum and two suppl supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government amendments to this bill. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. You were seeking the call. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I request that the amendments on sheets RV 130 and RV 133 be please voted on, put separately. So. I don't have the sheet in front of me, so I'll just. Yeah. So you're voting separately on those amendments? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. So let me just get the correct words from the clerk, because I don't have the grey sheet. I've only got the run sheet. The question is, um, you would like amendments. One to four on RV one three three put separately, or do you want one and four put separately? No, there's two different. So it's put. Oh, sorry, I got a different sheet. Yeah. Yep. So. So the amendments one to three, five and six, and request four on sheet RV one thirty. Okay. Be put separately to the amendments on sheet RV one thirty. Thank you. So let me just deal with a matter before that, which is, uh, is it the wish? Uh, that the statement accompanying the request circulated for this bill be incorporated in Hansart immediately after the request to which it relates. There being no objection, so ordered. I'll now put that, um, the, according to Senator Faruqi, that amendments one to three, five and six, and request four on sheet RV one thirty. The question is that, that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that amendments 1 to 3, 5 and 6 and request 4 on sheet RV 130 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is, Senator Fricke, I've been advised I should deal with Amendment 7 next, and then I'll come back to those other ones you wanted separated, that item 16 of Schedule 5 stand as printed. Looking at the clerk to make sure I've got it right. The question is, that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, stand as printed. Okay. The question is that item 16 for Schedule 5 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. I'll now go to the other item Senator Faruqi asked to be separated, which was that the amendments on sheet RV133 circulated by the government be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I, I, circulated by the government, I, uh, I heard a very small. I heard a very quiet eye. I heard a very quiet eye. I heard a very quiet eye. The question is that the amendments on sheet RV133 circulated by the government be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to, subject to a re request. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No, no. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to subject to a request. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith tell of the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell of the nose. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, because this bill has been agreed to subject to a request, it will not be read a third time. A message will be sent to the House requesting that the House make that amendment. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 4, Sport Integrity Australia Amendment, World Anti-Doping Code Review Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This, be, this bill seeks to amend the Sport Integrity Australia Act 2020 and the National Sports Tribunal Act 2019. These amendments would align Australia's anti doping legislation with revisions of the World Anti Doping Code and international standards, which come into force on 1 January 2021. Australia has ratified the UNESCO International Convention Against Doping in Sport. That means we have an international obligation to align our anti-doping arrangements with any revisions of the WADA Code. This bill seeks to give effect to that. In order for Australia's anti-doping legislation to remain appropriately aligned with the revised code and international standards, the amendments in this bill will need to be passed and given assent before 1 January 2021. Labor supports Australia being at the forefront of global efforts to deal with doping in sport. In turn, we support Australia fulfilling its international anti-doping obligations and therefore these arrangements, which will ensure our domestic anti-doping arrangements remain aligned with the WADA Code. This bill does three key things in response to the WADA Code revisions. It adds relevant non-participants to the persons who may be subject to the National Anti-Doping Scheme. It gives the Sport Integrity Australia CEO discretion not to publish the details of an anti-doping rule violation when the athlete is, is recreational or does not have the mental capacity to understand that the anti-doping rules, and it allows the CEO to respond to misinformation. This bill also makes consequential amendments to the National Sports Tribunal Act 2019 to enable a non-participant to apply to the tribunal for arbitration of a dispute arising under an anti-doping policy. In addition to the measures I've mentioned, which, to the, which respond to the WADA Code revisions, the bill will also extend the definition of athlete to include persons who competed in sport within the last six months. This amendment is designed to deal with the potential for the current definition to be interpreted narrowly as only a person who currently competes, which would restrict Sport Integrity Australia's ability to investigate possible anti-doping rule violations. Initially, stakeholders, including the 
the Australian Athletes Alliance did raise some concerns with the opposition about the potential for this measure to impact retired athletes. Labor has worked with those stakeholders to seek clarification on that aspect of the bill. The government has since made it clear that this section of the bill does not apply to formerly retired athletes but rather to athletes who, for some reason, perhaps injury, are on a short break from competing. Athletes intending to com compete again continue to fall within the national anti-doping scheme to ensure that they remind, remain compliant with their obligations under the World Anti-Doping Code on their return to competition. Stakeholders have advised the opposition that, given the clarification, they believe this aspect of the bill is appropriate. Labor supports measures that strengthen Australia's protections against evolving threats to the integrity of sport. We recognise that these protections, particularly in relation to doping in sport, can place a large burden and a lot of pressure on athletes. We will continue to work closely with stakeholders and observe the implementation of Australia's new sport integrity operations to ensure they deliver the dual goals of protecting Australian sport and Australian athletes. Labor supports this bill. Thank you, uh, Senator. Minister. Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thanks, Senators, for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart. Sorry, I just wanted to correct something. Not, not quite now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the aye has it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to sport and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall now call the minister to move the third reading. Uh, move minister. The bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. All those against, nay. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating sorry. to sport and for related purposes. Yep, sorry. Senator Urquhart. Apologies. I, um, earlier I moved a, or foreshadowed a motion in the name of Senator Wong. It should have been in Senator Brown, so I'd just Green. like to correct the— uh, Sorry, I got the wrong colour. Green. <laughs> Um, so I'd just like to correct the record. You're seeking by leave? To yes, make by that leave. Amendment. Okay, thank you, Clark. Is leave granted? Thank you. Leave's been granted. Yep. Clark? Thank you. Government business, order for day number five, Family Law Amendment, Risk Screening Protections Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. President, this bill provides legislative support for a domestic violence risk screening pilot program being rolled out by the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia. This program, called the Lighthouse Project, is being trialled in three court registries, Adelaide, Brisbane and Parramatta. The Lighthouse Project will screen for safety risks in all applications and responses for parenting only orders filled with the courts. The information from the screening tool will be confidential and only used to screen for risk and referral to support services. Cases will be triaged to provide additional assistance to at-risk parties and identified suitable case management path pathways, which will include a new specialist court list designed to assist families that have been identified as being at high risk of family violence. The Lighthouse Project was funded as part of the 2019-20 BEFO announced by the government on 17 December 2019. Funding of $13.5 million was announced for for the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia to pilot a systematic approach to identifying and managing family safety risks. It is regrettable but unsurprising that the Morrison government has taken so long to introduce this necessary bill and bring it on for debate. It should have been done in the first sitting week of the year, but it's better late than never. Of course, passage of this legislation does not guarantee the success of the Lighthouse project. It will simply enable it to happen. It's up to the government, government to ensure the project is implemented properly and that the project is successful. Labor senators will be watching carefully. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Um, Minister? Uh, well, Senator Griff was 
listed he's not to here, speak. So he's not I here. I thank so senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasurer Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill might proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to taxation and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I, I move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill. Is that motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. No is have it. Is a, if the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the uh, provisions of um, paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to these bills in a table a statement of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered through these sittings. Is leave granted? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is the motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against? Uh, Senator? Yeah, this is where we speak. Right? Correct. <laughs> yeah. She has to ask first if leave You're seeking leave? Into the bill. All oh, right. Was it? First, she Senator. Clarification. Um, firstly, could I just ask that our opposition to the uh, preceding few uh, be recorded? Be recorded. Thank you very much. And could I just seek clarification on the question currently before the chair, please? And that is that these. Yeah. Bill be read a second time. Is. We've done that. We now, yeah. So we've we're now moving on to the, to the second reading debate, and Senator has the call. Is that clarified it for you? Uh, yeah. Look, pardon my misunderstanding here. I thought we were returning to the routine of business as per the. Uh, no, we're now moving into this bill and the second reading debate. Radio. All right. You'll be hearing from us shortly. Yes. After, After the motion. motion. Yes, Senator, you have to oh. call. Uh, thank you. It's quite a heady introduction into this, the tax uh, bills. And can I um, rise, uh, welcome the opportunity to rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 economic, economic Recovery Bill 2020, perhaps a little earlier than uh, we had expected uh, to be having this debate. This debate um, brings together a number of tax measures announced in the 2020 budget, uh, in total five of them, uh, which I will speak to separately. But I would like to start my contribution by acknowledging the very uh, difficult economic times uh, the country is in, uh, the very significant economic challenges uh, facing the country the number millions of Australians who have had their lives uprooted, um, uh, their jobs lost, um, businesses shut over the last uh, seven months as the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic has um, brought in changes which have had 
not only significant health consequences on our community but very significant economic consequences as well. Um, and I think this bill um, or this budget was the government's opportunity to address both in the short and long term some of those uh, significant challenges. Uh, the budget in itself um, is the third, I think the third economic package that the government has introduced in response to the pandemic. It comes at a time when we are in a deep recession, uh, the first recession of this country in almost 30 years, um, where we have three and a half million Australian workers being supported by a wage subsidy scheme that Labor called for and the government adopted in JobKeeper. And we have uh, over 1.6 million Australians um, on the JobSeeker or the old New Start payment. I think over 2 million Australians who have uh, been receiving the coronavirus supplement to assist them to get through uh, the very, very difficult times and put money uh, back into the economy at a time when it was desperately needed. So we are in a, in a very unusual and challenging time um, for so many Australians. Uh, the budget, I think, was the opportunity for the government to respond to some of those challenges, not just in the short term but in the long, long term. And in many ways, um, it was a missed opportunity. The budget outlined um, a debt and deficit trajectory that this country has not seen before. Um, we have combined deficits of $480 billion, um, a deficit of this year of $213 billion. Uh, we have net debt increasing to just under $1 trillion and gross debt exceeding one trillion and in fact confirmed by the finance minister that will it will um, peak in 2029 based on this budget uh, not any subsequent economic responses that might be needed at 1.7 trillion dollars so I, I don't think I can um, not take the opportunity to remind the government of the hypocritical and uh, damaging campaign they have run demonising debt and deficit over the last decade. In many ways, the challenges faced by the Australian community and the responses required have uh, been a complete rejection of the approach that the government has taken in terms of their so-called debt and deficit disaster language that they have been using. Uh, to, to weaponise um, any sensible budget narrative about the use of um, the government's budget, the levers available to it, to support people, to support the community, to support a society um, over the last decade or so. The contradiction and the hypocrisy of a disaster and all of the dangerous language they used at the time when they faced a situation of inheriting gross debt in the order of $280 billion compared to releasing budget papers which have now outlined gross debt reaching $1.7 trillion is not lost on the opposition. And I would hope, out of all of the um, learnings uh, from this last seven months, that there has been some in that regard, that the budget does exist to serve a purpose. It is not the same as a household budget. It has a very different purpose. It is there, um, it is given, uh, well, it is gov used to be used in a way that delivers outcomes for people. Uh, so when you um, introduce a budget like you did in 2014 that slashed a whole range of supports for vulnerable Australians um, in search of uh, your fiscal strategy at the time um, to leave a whole load of people behind at any expense uh, because you were running this narrative that that has, out, that has impacts and it causes damage. And I think, um, again, the complete rejection of that fiscal strategy and an adoption of one which acknowledges the role 
uh, and the need for government to invest in people and invest in our community when it's needed is, it, is an important one. Um, we have heard in recent days the government trying to pretend that debt under Labor is terrible and a disaster and debt under them is manageable and fine and no issue here. Uh, and so I do make that point. In terms of uh, the bills that we see before us today, these do form a large component of um, the government's uh, stimulus response, in a sense, to the, the problems that we are seeing in the economy. They uh, bring forward of the stage two tax cuts to 2021 um, at a total cost of $18 billion. Um, Labor has been calling for these tax cuts to be fast-tracked, I think, since uh, August last year. We think they part, play part of the, a key role in part of the response. They shouldn't have uh, at any time been considered the entire response, uh, and so our support is, is contingent on that. They have a role to play. We are not going to stand in the way of um, millions of, of families, working people across this country, getting some extra dollars in their wallet every fortnight. Um, we think that does have a role to play and it is a change that we support. Uh, we would have preferred to have dealt with that bill on its own and separated out some of the other measures that perhaps aren't as time critical and could have been dealt with in a more orderly way, allowing the Senate to have the scrutiny of um, to use its scrutiny powers to, to inquire into those. Um, however, the government's made it clear, and you know they've played this game before, where they package up a whole range of initiatives into an omnibus bill and serve it up on a plate. And, and if you're not for all of it, then you're clearly um, standing in the way of um, of getting the tax cuts out the door. Um, we, you know, I mean, this is this government's style. It's it's push through, barrage through blame everybody else, point the finger, make, take the attention off themselves. Um, we would prefer, and I want to make this point very clear, that the other measures, um, including the um, small business turnover, the amendments to the R&D like tax incentive, uh, and particularly the very large, um, the large uh, measure of temporary full expensing of depreciation assets at $27 billion um, have a longer uh, have that we have more than 48 hours essentially uh, to work through the detail of them. Um, we do support um, the uh, sorry I should make it clear we do support the increase the small business turnover threshold. We do support the um, loss carry back against previous profits. Um, there is a price tag attached um, uh, to that loss carry back of five billion, not an insignificant amount of money at all, but um, we do think those uh, are sensible. In fact, I think we had proposals very similar to those um, before and that they should be supported. I think where we have concerns and it is relating to largely to the amendments to the R and D tax incentive cuts and the full expensing of depreciating assets or the instant asset write-off of, of 100 per cent. Um, that is a cost of $27 billion. Um, it is a massive measure that I think the Senate sh should have had the opportunity to inquire into for a bit longer than 48 hours. Um, I think the uh, member for Rankin in the other place has raised a number of issues around that. Um, well, one is the fact that there is no long-term solution to business investment in this country. Um, this is a very short-term measure um, and it will create a very significant cliff at the end of it, um, which I'm sure the government acknowledges, but they haven't dealt with in this budget. Um, it doesn't deal with a long-term business investment strategy. We have known business investment has been tanking in this country for long before the pandemic. It was a problem. And if you talk to anyone in the business community, the major issue they raise around the lack of appetite for business investment is the lack of an energy policy. And I think everyone on that side of the chamber knows that too, but it is a tricky one for them to resolve. But that is the, that is the solution 
in many ways, to, to provide confidence and certainty to the business community if there was an energy policy certainty at the same uh, time. Uh, I think in terms of the time that the Senate has available to it today uh, on those two measures that I've drawn out, including the R&D, and I, I know Senator Carr has a much better knowledge of the issues and the disagreements um, around the research and development tax incentive, including the cuts that were being proposed of $1.8 billion and how they relate to this um, new program that's being put in, um, whether the money is real. Uh, I think uh, we need to understand that a bit more. We will have the opportunity and estimates uh, to explore that a bit further. But I mean, I guess in the interests of the, this government wanting to pursue its strategy of pushing this through the chambers so quickly, that any problems relating to these two, two measures are really worn on your head. Um, you have to be responsible for if there are changes that need to be made as, as the um, detail of these programs is rolled out, then you need to make them. Um, you know, I don't think you should accept that our, our support uh, for this bill, the omnibus bill, of which we have had no choice around how these measures are separated out, gives you a blank cheque endorsement of these programs. Um, these are your programs. You've had the opportunity of months to design them. You, you are telling the Australian people they will work, they will deliver the outcomes and the jobs uh, that, that we need to see across this country. Um, then you know, it really is on your head as to uh, needing to address any problems or if these policies don't do what we need them to do, which is to um, make sure the unemployment lines in this country is as low as it can be, as quickly as it can be. Now, we have very significant concerns around that. We think the other um, issues that are related to the budget and not in these bills, but uh, I think are interlinked in the sense that you are putting all of your effort behind these measures uh, to drive the economic recovery at a time when you are cu cutting job seeker, cutting um, job keeper. I think the, the failure to address the job seeker uh, permanent increase in this budget is just mean. It's simply mean. There is absolutely no reason why, in, in the first weeks of October, that the government is not in a position to give an answer about what it's doing for the 1.6 million people surviving on that payment in the long term. Uh, it's just wrong. You know, you've given, you've trying to give certainty to in a whole range of areas for the next 18 months to two years, but people who are surviving on the lowest of incomes don't deserve that kind of certainty. Um, the cuts to JobKeeper again, the restriction of JobMaker uh, to those under the age of 35. We have to explore some of the thinking behind that because it leaves almost a million people on that payment who aren't eligible. No plan for aged care. I think it's well understood that the that 51 per cent of the population seems to be ignored in this budget and there's a lot of concern around that. No, no addressing issues around childcare, women's homelessness, social housing. I mean, I'm sure we will continue to debate this budget in the months ahead and through estimates. Um, and whilst we support the passage of these omnibus bills, we do lay down some markers that we do have concerns with a couple of the measures, um, and um, it's firmly in the government's court to change those. But it's also firmly the government's uh, position that these be passed uh, today, um, and um, the government, the opposition, will be supporting that. But we have raised some concerns, which we hope the government is listening to, and will take on board. Thank you, Senator. Senator McKim. Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm absolutely delighted to rise and speak in this chamber in relation to this bill. Absolutely delighted, because the budget that was delivered on Tuesday night delivered for all Australians. The budget handed down on Tuesday night delivered for all Australians, every single Australian, including in my home state of Queensland and including people living in where my office is located in the Ipswich region of Queensland. It delivered for those Australians. Senator Gallagher referred to there being no business investment strategy. That is simply incorrect. 
simply incorrect. There are a whole range of matters which were brought down in the budget uh, on Tuesday night which will promote business investment. Because the one thing you have to realise, Madam Acting Deputy President, is you don't have to dictate to private enterprise. You don't have to dictate to the entrepreneurs in our society. You don't have to dictate to the people who want to get ahead in this country what they should do with their capital and with their income. You simply need to get out of the way. You simply need to get out of the way and you need to structure the tax system so that it incentivises people and doesn't penalise people. That's what you have to do. You don't have to dictate to them that you should invest in this or invest in that. Get out of the way. Government should get out of the way and structure a tax system which provides incentive for investment in this country, not disincentive. And that's what the budget delivered on Tuesday night. That is exactly what the budget delivered on Tuesday night. And there are a number of initiatives in the budget which fall into that category, and that included the immediate write-off of eligible assets, which will be an absolute boon for 99 per cent of businesses across this country. There will be investment made that we can't even uh, dream of in this country coming out, coming out of uh, out of this budget. And it also includes promoting the use of gas, more supply of gas, increase the supply of gas, bring down gas prices, promote manufacturing. It's quite simple. Incl increase the supply of gas, bring down gas prices, promote manufacturing. And that's what this budget will also do. $2 billion for research and development. A sovereign manufacturing initiatives, sovereign manufacturing initiative which, which will provide specific incentives for our manufacturers to develop those industries and provide jobs. And the tax cuts themselves, the tax cuts themselves, which were brought down on Tuesday night, will also, will also deliver jobs. Because when Australians have more, are allowed to keep more of their money in their own pockets, they'll go out and they'll spend that money. Or they'll invest that company in companies which invest that money and generate wealth and create jobs. That's what happens. That's what happens when you let private citizens keep more of what they earn. And one of the matters which really attracts me to the tax uh, relief which is being provided through the budget is that it is proportionate and it is targeted. It is proportionate and it is targeted. So the people who receive the greatest proportion of the tax relief are low income earners. Low income earners. So someone with a taxable income of $30,000 a year their total change in tax compared with the 2017-18 year will be 21.3 per cent less. 21.3 per cent less tax paid by someone with a taxable income of $30,000 a year than what they paid in the 2017-18 year. And we know people in those lower income brackets are more likely to spend each dollar which they are allowed to keep after tax. Someone earning $35,000 a year. Their tax saving compared to the 2017-18 year will be 14.8 per cent. 14.8 per cent. And then by the time you get to someone who's earning $200,000 a year, the total change in tax falls to 3.8 per cent. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. The tax cut should be targeted at the lower middle income earners. And they are. They are, as those percentages draw out in stark relief. One of the other aspects of the tax changes that were brought down on Tuesday night, which I fully support, is the fact that you can carry back losses. So a company that generated profits in the year ending 30 June 2019 can carry back the losses which they incur or have incurred in the year ending 30 June 2020 and offset those losses against tax paid in the year ending 30 June 2019. And I think that's an absolutely tremendous initiative. It recognises the fact that companies, the owners of those companies, have been paying taxes to the Commonwealth over a period of time. Those taxes are used to pay for health and services. And then, and then when the company is earning a loss, has generated a loss, not only could it carry forward that loss, but it can actually carry it back so it can get a tax refund and use that money to either reinvest in the business or help it get through this period. And I think that's an absolutely tremendous initiative. Some of the other initiatives in terms of the tax relief 
have been targeted just to make sure, just to make sure that the lower middle income, uh, income earners are the ones who are actually going to uh, receive those, those tax cuts. And they'll spend that money. They will spend that money which they've been allowed to keep through these tax cuts. Treasury estimates that reducing—these aren't my estimates, these are Treasury's estimates—reducing the personal income tax burden on hard-working Australians through this measure will boost GDP by around $3.5 billion, billion with a B, in 2020-21 and $9 billion in 2021-22, and will create an additional 50,000 jobs by the end of 2021-22. An additional 50,000 jobs by the end of 2021 to 22, and those are Treasury's estimates, not my estimates. Treasury's estimates, and we need every single job in the current economic situation that we can get. We need every single job, and these tax cuts will help generate those jobs. How? By putting more money in the pockets of the hardworking Australians who've earned that money, allowing families to keep more of what they earn, and allowing them to spend more on what they need what their personal circumstances need. They will be the ones who make that choice, not government, not government, but the hardworking Australians who've earned that money will be the ones who make that choice. And I just remind this chamber again, I just remind this chamber again, the income tax cuts are proportionate. They are weighed in favour of low income earners and middle income earners. As I said at the outset of this speech, someone who earns a taxable income of $30,000 the percentage change in tax saved, 21.3 per cent. Someone earning 200000 it goes down to 3.8 per cent. Someone earning $60,000, their tax saving is going to be 17.8 per cent, compared to someone who earns $160,000, their tax saving is only going to be 5.1 per cent. 17.8 per cent, someone who earns $60,000, 5.1 someone who earns $160,000. And that's how it should be. That's exactly how it should be, to make sure that those tax cuts are targeted to help those Australians who are uh, in the low and middle income tax bracket. And we should remember, we should remember, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that eight in every 10 Australians are employed in the private sector. Eight in ten Australians are employed in the private sector. And in order to rebuild our economy and create more jobs, we need to kick-start that part of the economy, that private sector. And it has been estimated that with respect to the contribution that is going to be made with respect to the tax relief given to businesses so they'll be able to take advantage of the instant asset tax write-off, that this will also be a boost to GDP, it will be a boost to job creation, and it will be a boost to uh, providing opportunities for everyone in our society, wherever they live, whether or not they live in the cities, whether or not they live in the country um, or in our regional centres. And in my own area of region of Queensland, where my office is in the Ipswich region, I know that there are so many companies that are going to take advantage of these opportunities. I visited uh, a great aviation company, TAE Aviation, based in, uh, in the Ipswich region, based in an uh, industrial centre in Bundamba. And as this budget was brought down on Tuesday, as this budget was brought down on Tuesday, I was reflecting on how they will be able to use the tax relief which is given to their business to actually invest in more capital, up-to-date machinery, expand their product range and provide opportunities to the young people in the Ipswich region, which they're already providing, I should say, and they're doing a great work in terms of providing those opportunities to young people in our regions. The $2 billion with respect to uh, research and development is also desperately needed in the economy at this stage. And it will be exciting, it will be exciting to see what Australian initiative, Australian enterprise, Australian knowledge and Australian know-how generates with that R&D incentive. And I'm looking, forward, I'm looking forward to visit businesses and hear about how they're applying that R&D incentive to, again, generate jobs, create wealth and provide opportunity for all Queenslanders, for all Australians, notwithstanding whatever their background is, wherever they come from, but provide them with the opportunity to fulfil their true potential. 
Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on these bills and also take the opportunity um, to consider the context in which they're presented. Senator Scar has given us a long dissertation about the underlying philosophy for economic management for this government. And he spent quite a lot of time talking about how what we need is for government to get out of the way. Well, I'd make two observations. One, it's a pretty funny thing to hear from a group of people who've just delivered a budget indicating that we're about to uh, hit up a trillion dollars in debt. It's a pretty jarring thing to hear in that context. The second thing I'd say is this. It's also pretty tone deaf. Because if the pandemic has shown us anything, it is that government matters. Because when a virus beyond our control sweeps through our country, sweeps across the globe, government can't get out of the way. And we've seen overseas what happens when they do. Uncontrolled spread of the virus, uncontained disruption to the economy, unemployment, financial hardship, financial distress. It was actually the inclination of this government to take that same approach. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to provide financial support to households, to provide financial support to businesses, to provide fiscal support to the Australian economy. Wage subsidies, wage subsidies totally impractical, not on the table, until they were. Measures to support businesses not interested until the Labor Party pushed for them, because it's been the pattern all through this period of COVID-19, all through this year, that the government has only acted to support the economy when we push them to do so. Measure after measure after measure, a response to a Labor suggestion, and we have tried to be constructive. It is a national crisis and an international crisis, and we have tried to play a role that a good opposition should at this time, to hold this government to account, but to be constructive. But these guys make it pretty hard because they're contempt for ordinary people. They're contempt for the information they hear from people on the street. Their exclusive focus on their own interests make it very, very difficult to support the direction that they seek to chart. We didn't have a lot of confidence in their economic management. The economy was already floundering before we came into the pandemic. Every now and then, when the government gets desperate, it sort of thinks, what are we going to do? It just searches around in the bottom drawer for some ideas about how they're going to grow the economy and restore productivity and actually get the country moving again. And usually they say, oh yes, we've got this marvellous Productivity Commission report from 2017, shifting the dial, lifting Australia's productivity. And I thought, I'll just have a look at that. I recall it has a good set of initiatives. If you go into the Productivity Commission website, it indicates that there is still no government response to the shifting the dial report. So you've got an economy with flatlining productivity, a desperate need to get jobs moving, this is even before we come into the pandemic, and a government that can't be bothered to even go and respond to the document that they commissioned from the Productivity Commission. Well, I'll remind people on the other side what was in that. There were some suggestions about healthier Australians reforming the health system. There was a whole set of recommendations about future skills and work. There's a set of recommendations about better functioning towns and cities. <laughs> There's a whole section about improving efficiency of markets with an intense focus on the energy market, the great policy failure of this government to manage to get through seven years without a single energy policy that's actually implemented, but 20 policy ideas that they never got around to doing anything with, and five more effective governments. Because wouldn't it be nice? if there had actually just been some economic reform of some kind in any one of those domains prior to hitting January this year. Wouldn't it have been nice to go into the pandemic 
with an economy that was actually firing on all cylinders? Wouldn't it have been good to have had a training system that was actually preparing our young people and preparing people throughout their lives for jobs of the future? Wouldn't it have been nice to have an R&D system that was actually supporting the innovation in the business community? Wouldn't it have been nice to have done something about women, about the pay gap, about the retirement incomes gap, about their participation in the labour market? about their need for childcare that is affordable and of a high quality? Wouldn't it have been nice to have done something about all of those things, all of those reform options that have been laid out time and time and time again for a tone-deaf government that refuses to listen and refuses to take responsibility for their role in the Australian economy? Well, we've had to wait to a pandemic to see them actually take responsibility of any kind and then, as I said, only when pushed by the Labor Party. And so we find ourselves this week with a budget, a budget that tells us that we're up for a trillion dollars in debt, but which signals no coherent story at all about the future of the Australian economy. People will know that I've spent quite a bit of time since I had the very good fortune to be elected to this place, thinking about the role of women in our economy. This pandemic has highlighted how significant the female workforce is, how important the female workforce is, particularly when things go bad, but also how precarious the nature of women's employment truly is. Because when the pandemic hit, who got laid off first? the casuals. And who comprises the casual workforce? It is the women of Australia. And so it's women's hours that suffered the greatest hit. It's women's jobs that suffered the greatest hits. It's women who took up more and more care obligations at home when children were at home and being homeschooled. And it's women who bore the risk of turning up to frontline roles in nursing, in cleaning, in retail, in teaching, in early childhood, to continue keeping things ticking over while we face down this pandemic. You might have thought that the conversation that has started to bubble away amongst Australian women would have filtered through to those on the other side. You might have thought they would have found it within themselves to come up with just something of meaning for Australian women and their workforce participation in this budget. But no, it is a budget devoid of empathy or interest in the lives of Australian women. It is a budget devoid of empathy and interest in the economic security of Australian women, and it contains very little for them. We are spending twice as much on an IT system for the Department of Human Services as we are on the initiatives in the Women's Economic Security Statement. It is incredible. It is a contribution to women. The Women's Economic Security Statement comprises one third of one per cent of the new measures in the budget. I think that, in part, this situation arises because there are so few women in the Cabinet. So few women on ERC, and worse, so little interest by the men of the coalition in listening to the women around them. And it is just shameful because if they listened to the women in their electorates, listen to the, the women in, who work in their schools, listen to the women who are dropping their kids off each morning, they'd know that there are a whole range of priorities that Australian women wanted to see addressed. But we won't find them in this budget. You won't find anything about tackling the pay, the pay gap. You won't find anything about improving access to childcare. You won't find anything about the disproportionate uh, taxation that occurs when women increase the number of working days from three to four if they happen to be the second income earner in their household. You won't find any responses to that. You won't find any relief for the women who emptied out their superannuation accounts because they were 
shut out from JobKeeper, because JobKeeper was designed in a way that didn't support the working lives of Australian women. You won't find any money, any additional money, for women fleeing domestic violence and looking for support from frontline services. It is incredible to me and tone deaf, incredibly tone deaf, that in a period where there has been article after article after article in every mainstream news outlet about the rise in prevalence and severity of domestic violence, that this was not made a priority in the budget this year. What a depressing, a depressing indication of the seriousness with which this issue is taken on the other side. How can you wrap up a trillion dollars in debt and not do something about the epidemic of violence that is sweeping through Australia's households? This is not a budget that responds to the economic needs of this country. It is not a budget that responds to the social needs of the households in this country. It's not a budget that does the job Order. in charting Senator our Senator McAllister, it's been 2 p.m. You will be in continuation and we will go to questions. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that of the approximately 754,000 women currently without work and on job seeker or youth allowance, 61 per cent are aged over 35 years? The minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator McCarthy for her question. What I can confirm, Senator McCarthy, is that when the pandemic first hit, that we did see that women were disproportionately impacted by uh, the pandemic when it came to job losses. What I can also tell um, Senator McCarthy is that prior to the pandemic, we did have a disproportionate number of older Australians uh, and also older female or women. Um, who were represented on our social security payments. Um, this was probably a result of many things, including many measures that have been put in place prior um, to, uh, to the pandemic and, and many measures that have been put in place over a number of years, uh, not the least of which um, was the increase in the number of young people that were coming off unemployments and going into work. Uh, also the fact that we had changes to our pension arrangements, like the wife pension, and these changes had taken place over quite a long period of time and successive governments. And as a result of the fact that we had started to see uh, probably a disproportionate number of older Australians on um, unemployment benefits or on, on welfare, uh, the government has taken a number of initiatives to, to support um, older people who find themselves unemployed. Order. Um, Senator Rustin, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order. It was a very um, a succinct and specific question, uh, which asked the minister to confirm the numbers of women without work and on job seeker and youth allowance. That were the they were the only words and subject uh, points raised. So I would ask the minister. We've been. It's an excessive minute. I understand she has had taken time to get to the answer. She could confirm Senator McCarthy's question. It, it was a very specific and factual question, and I've said in the chair that. When such specific and factual questions are asked, the directly relevant test is quite a narrow one. So, Senator Wong, you've reminded the minister of the question. I do so as well. Um, Senator Rustin, to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I will get the exact statistic for um, Senator McCarthy to make sure, because as you would quite imagine, the, you know, we do see the figures around unemployment moving around quite significantly at the moment. But I will certainly make sure that I get the absolute and specific statistic um, provided to you. Um, uh, yes, and so in fact, um, I mean, I, the, I can give you statistics that are old, but I would like to make sure that I give you a statistic that is current post-pandemic, because as you would be aware, that um, statistics pre-pandemic probably probably don't mean a great deal. But um, anyway, as I was about to, to inform um, Senator McCarthy, there have been a significant number of measures that have been put in place in recognition that we have um, a high number of older Australians who find themselves um, in, uh, are out of work. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator McCarthy, <coughs> a supplementary question. What advice does the minister have for the 460,000 women who are aged over 35 years, are without work? face a future of living on $40 a day, have been excluded from the Morrison government's hiring credit scheme and will need to compete against younger, subsidised job seekers. 
Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator McCarthy. Um, one of the things that I, I can absolutely confirm to Senator McCarthy is that this government understands that their older Australians often find barriers to getting into work, which is why, uh, amongst a number of initiatives that were put down prior to the pandemic, if you'd listen, I'll actually tell you about the measures that we've put in place, um, including, for instance, as an example, uh, the Restart program. And um, we talked a lot at the budget this week around. Um, uh, the, 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 sub, the wage subsidy for younger Australians, um, and, uh, and I'd just like to advise the chamber that in the 18-19 budget, the government put in place the, the restart program, which is actually a wage subsidy for older Australians. So older Australians over the age of 50 have access to a $10,000 wage subsidy, or their employer has a, uh, access to a $10,000 wage subsidy. And I'm really pleased to be able to advise the chamber that 50,000 older Australians have actually been the beneficiary of of that wage subsidy specifically dedicated to older Australians. Well, Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Research released by the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office last week re revealed a 23 percentage point increase to 71 per cent in the number of women on unemployment benefits for years. The Morrison government excluded many of these women from JobKeeper. Isn't their exclusion from the hiring credit scheme just the latest example of the Morrison government leaving women behind? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, not at all. Um, the, the Morrison government uh, has been absolutely uh, dedicated to supporting all Australians, either before the pandemic but most particularly through the pandemic, with an absolutely unprecedented amount of money that has been provided to support all Australians, and that includes older Australians. But as I said before, we already had in place a number of very significant packages to help older Australians, but we must not forget that when the pandemic hit, we saw a doubling or a 100 per cent increase in the number of people who were uh, requiring the support of our unemployment benefit system, a 150 per cent increase in those under the age of 35. And I would suggest that if I had come into this place after the budget where we hadn't actually addressed youth unemployment, you would be standing here criticising me for, because we were not actually assisting uh, young people who have been disproportionately impacted by the number of jobs that have lost. So um, I think our track record in supporting older Order. Australians Senator stands. Senator Rustin. Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the Morrison government's 2020 and 2021 defence budget delivers for Australia's national security? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much to Senator McLaughlin for his question and also for his very strong support for the South Australian defence industry and more generally. So, thank you. Protecting our nation's security and sovereignty is essential to Australia's economic stability and also its prosperity. The 2020-21 Morrison government's defence budget is all about a safer and stronger Australia now and into the future. This government remains firmly committed to keeping Australians safe while protecting our nation's interests and also assisting our economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. This budget sees sustained and very strong investment in Australia's defence with a 10-year funding model of $575 billion over the next decade. This delivers on the Morrison government's commitment to grow the defence budget to 2 per cent of GDP in the 2021 financial year, and this achieves a commitment we made in 2013. Our focus in the budget and in our strategic update is on regional security, on maintaining our capability edge while creating Australian jobs. It also focuses on boosting cyber resilience and also supporting Australia's sovereign defence industries. This budget locks in $270 billion of investment over the next 10 years to continue to develop the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force. There is also a $1 billion investment that provides new and also unprecedented opportunities for Australia's defence industry that has been impacted by COVID-19, and this will sustain over 4,000 Australian jobs. Defence is also committed to supporting Australians right here at home during emergencies of national significance. 
And that's why the Morrison government is strengthening the ADF's ability to respond to natural disasters, to domestic emergencies and also to pandemics, both here in Australia Order. and Senator also Reynolds. overseas. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government's defence investments are creating jobs and helping rebuild our economy, including in my home state of South Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator McLaughlin for that question. Continuing to develop Australia's sovereign defence industry is crucial to our nation's economic recovery and also, as I've said, to the creation of many more uh, multi-generational jobs for Australians. Currently, there are already over 15,000 Australian companies in the defence supply chains, and that represents over 70,000 Australian workers who are benefiting from our government's investment in defence. And these numbers are continuing to grow, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And South Australia is a key part of the government's investment in building Australia's maritime defence capability and also our defence industries. And just last week, the Prime Minister was in South Australia opening the $535 million world-leading shipyard in Osborne South, which heralds the beginning of another local shipbuilding job boom in South Australia. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline the importance of long-term certainty for the defence budget? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, as I've said many times in this chamber, Australian strategic environment is increasingly complex and it is also increasingly contested. That's why the, this government's unprecedented investment in defence capability and also long-term funding certainty that we have committed to in this budget is vitally important. It is important not only for the Australian Defence Force and for defence, it is also vitally important for Australia's defence industries. This 10-year investment of $575 billion, as I've said, $270 billion for new capability, will strengthen not only the capability and the resilience of the Australian Defence Force, but also of our industries and of the many tens of thousands of jobs right here in Australia. This government is de delivering the much-needed certainty for both uh, the Defence Force and the ADF. And the result of that will be that our Defence Forces will not only today be postured to deploy military power to shape our environment, Order. to Senator deter Reynolds, actions time and for the also answer to has respond expired. if necessary. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Approximately 200,000 women have lost their jobs since March, and 110,000 have left the labour force. Why did Mr Morrison's budget provide nothing to support women's workforce participation? The Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Keneally for her question. Well, I would actually refute the, the budget that was brought down on Tuesday night by Mr Morrison and the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, didn't contain anything in relation to women's workforce participation. In fact, the very substance of the Women's Economic Security Statement is around uh, enhancing women's economic participation. We all know that prior to the pandemic that economic participation by women in the Australian workforce was at, actually at an all-time high, and we also had seen the gender pay gap reduced to its lowest level ever. So as part of the Women's Economic Statement, uh, Security Statement on, on Tuesday night, we sought to uh, undertake a number of initiatives that were really focused on making sure, uh, more, making sure that we were focused Order. very much on providing specific and particular initiatives around workforce participation. But that must not be ex uh, uh, exclude the fact that many, many other initiatives in the budget that were not contained in the Women's Economic Security Statement are also available for women to be able to access. Order. And I think you know, the misunder you know, those opposite can be mucking around, but the the reality is that every, just about every single measure Order. in the budget um, that women have uh, are able to benefit from all of those measures. So, you know, women benefit from university educations. Women benefit from, from workplace and employment. To, I mean, Senator uh, Senator Cash's um, skills programs also benefit women. Order. But targeting specific women's economic participation was the Women's Economic Security Statement. Uh, and there are a number of initiatives that were contained in this, uh, this statement with five very specific priorities uh, to build and Order. repair women's workforce participation 
and further close the gender pay gap. That was absolutely the specific reason and the absolute priority of the Women's Economic Security Statement, along with many other measures Order, in the Senator budget. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Recent studies by KPMG and Grattan reveal women returning to work can lose 20 cents for every dollar they earn from an extra day's work due to childcare fees. Why did the Morrison government's budget fail to make childcare cheaper for Australian families? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, what I would say is the Morrison government has a very proud track record when it comes to the affordability of childcare for Australian families and particularly for Australian women seeking to return to the workforce. And it is a very, very important component of making sure that women's workforce participation are at high levels. And as I said to the answer to the primary question, before the pandemic, Australia's women's workforce participation levels were at an all-time record. But um, also, I would also draw to the attention of the chamber the fact that this government, the Morrison government, will spend in this 2020-2021 year $9 billion supporting Australian parents with childcare subsidies. That is in addition to the $900 million that was specifically set aside during the pandemic to help Australia's uh, parents through the very, very difficult circumstances that they all found themselves during the pandemic, and particularly those people that were taking on important care and support roles. Order. Senator Keneally, order on my right. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Mr President, women have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, taking on two-thirds of the unpaid care work at home. Why, despite racking up $1 trillion in debt, is there no assistance to help get these women back into the workforce? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I would once again refute the premise of the, of the statement that was just made by Senator Keneally that the government is not doing a number of things to assist all Australians, including Australian women, back into the workforce. As I said, you know, an absolute record investment in childcare to enable them to be able to get back to work. The investment that has been made in the portfolio area of Minister Cash around making sure that we focus on reskilling. I mean, in the Women's Economic Security Statement, as as an example, I mean there are a number of initiatives and a number Order. of initiatives that Order focus specifically about empowering women, getting Order. women into leadership roles, and making sure that, uh, that, that women and Order. are Senator able Rustin, to participate. Please resume your seat. There's interjections across the chamber. I can't hear the minister, Senator. Senator Wong on a point of order. I'm going to give leave to Senator Rennick to that, make the statement about childcare. That's not a point of order, Senator made. Wong. That's not a Go point ahead. of order, Senator Go Wong. Ahead. Please resume your seat, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your seat, Senator. Points of order are for points of order, not for debate. Senator Rustin. You may continue in silence in the chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. President. But what, as I was saying, in the Women's Economic Security Statement, there are a number of, uh, of initiatives that particularly target making sure that we are providing the support for women to be able to get back into the workforce, get ahead in the workforce. You know, expanding and boosting the Female Founders Initiative, a fantastic initiative that uh, that was already underway. I mean, the paid Order, parental Senator leave Senator Rustin, scheme. time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. Um, the arts and entertainment industry was the first and hardest hit by COVID restrictions. It will be one of the last to recover. It has seen the highest, the second highest number of job losses after accommodation and hospitality, which of course rely on the arts and entertainment sector as well. For every million dollars in turnover, arts and entertainment produce nine jobs. Construction produces only one. Yet the Treasurer on Tuesday night didn't even utter the word art in his speech. Why has the $112 billion a year arts and entertainment industry been so forgotten by your government? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Far from being forgotten, because the arts uh, and entertainment industry was one of the first and hardest hit. It was one of the first to get the support uh, from the Morrison government. Uh, the Morrison government is working hard to deliver on our plan to support Order. the arts and entertainment sector during 
uh, COVID-19. We have secured almost $800 million in extra arts and entertainment funding on top of our record annual investment of around $750 million in core funding and on top of the $336 million provided to date through JobKeeper. Uh, during one of our nation's most testing times, Australians have looked to our have looked to our leaders to provide accurate and honest information, provide support to those uh, who need it and manage public money responsibly. And that is, of course, why uh, our government has provided very substantial support uh, to this uh, sector. And it would be great if uh, senators across the chamber uh, could recognise that very strong commitment and contribution that we've made. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a supplementary question. The German government has pledged 1 billion euros in response to this crisis. The UK government, 1.57 billion pounds. France extended their unemployment scheme for actors, performers, musicians, technicians, guaranteeing their pay for 1.3 million people. Senator Cormann, how will your ignoring of the arts play in your bid for general secretary to the OECD? Senator Cormann. Uh, well, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just uh, reconfirm, and I'm sure that uh, our friends in uh, France, uh, nos amis en France, uh, un, uh, and our friends in Germany, unsere deutschen Freunde, <laughs> Uh, we would be very impressed to see uh, the very serious commitment uh, that uh, the Morrison government has made to supporting the arts and entertainment sector uh, here in Australia. Of course, uh, every country and every economy uh, faces, uh, uh, deals with the challenges uh, it faces in its own way, uh, consistent with its um, capacity, uh, and uh, you know, we are doing the best we can in the context of what is clearly a very challenging situation, and I think that uh, all reasonable Australians and all, all of our friends across uh, the OECD uh, would um, very much agree with that. Senator Hanson, you have a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. It's mostly women who have worked in the sectors that have been hardest hit hospitality, retail and the arts and the entertainment sector, yet the Morrison government has largely left them out. Minister, do women matter? And has Tony Abbott's women's problem infected the Prime Minister? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Of course, uh, women matter. They matter very much. And under our government, uh, after the first six years of the Liberal National uh, government. Uh, we had the highest workforce participation of women ever on record. Uh, the gender pay gap was the lowest ever on record here in Australia after six years of uh, a, a coalition Liberal National uh, Government. Uh, and uh, you know, of course, uh, women and young people were particularly hard hit uh, from the economic impact of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but uh, women and young people also have proportionately been the biggest beneficiaries of the recovery getting underway. And our plan to get Australia out of this COVID recession, our plan uh, to maximise the strength of our recovery uh, and our, our economic and our jobs recovery uh, is uh, very much uh, going, to, uh, going to be um, beneficial to all Australians, but in particular uh, women and young people around Australia, because they will proportionally uh, benefit the most from the, from the strong recovery that our government is working on. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question, my, sorry, my question is to the Minister for Finance. Probably my last question to you in question time, Senator oh. Cormann. I know you'll miss me. I refer to analysis by the Institute of Public Affairs based on data from the Morrison government's budget and the ABS, which reveals that gross Commonwealth government debt will peak at $2.05 trillion in 2045. Is this analysis by the Institute of Public Affairs accurate? Senator, the Minister for Finance, Senator Corbyn. Uh, th th thank you very much. I, s I thank Senator Gallagher for that question. Um, you know, really, I, I think Senator Gallagher wanted to make sure that before I leave this chamber, I truly had seen everything. I truly had seen everything. I now, I now have the Shadow Minister for Finance quoting the Institute of Public Affairs <laughs> as, as, as uh, Exhibit 1, as, as Exhibit I. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just say the answer to that question is uh, no. I can't uh, confirm that analysis. Uh, I mean, any, any, I mean, the Labor Party is trying to suggest uh, that we can't uh, make projections 10 years out, and uh, Senator Gallagher is suggesting that somehow there is a capacity to make uh, pro uh, projections 35 years out. Let me, let me, let me just say, and, and of course, and of course, and of Order. course. And of course, the argument, the argument that is being prosecuted by the opposition right now 
The argument the opposition is prosecuting right now is that we should, be, we should spend more, we should spend more, and we should have a lower deficit and lower debt. Like that is internally inconsistent, I've got to tell you. Look, I mean, of course we are facing a very challenging set of uh, figures. Uh, we, are, we are, though, in a better position than most other countries around the world as a result of the hard work that we've done during our first six years in government. Let, imagine, I mean, the reason, the reason your figures weren't worse after six years of Labour government is because you started with a surplus, a no government net debt, a positive net asset position. Guess what you left us behind? You left us behind massive debt and deficit and a deteriorating trajectory. A deteriorating trajectory. So we have turned that situation around. We are in a better, stronger position than we would have been if we hadn't fixed the uh, situation you left behind. But of course, I mean, we know Austra every reasonable Australian knows why we're here when it comes to the fiscal position we are in. That is because, because of the COVID recession, because of the COVID recession and the impact Senator of the COVID Watt. recession on revenue in particular and government payments and because of the decision, the cost of the decisions we've had to make to Order. support the economy and to support jobs. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The analysis by the IPA also revealed that gross Commonwealth government debt will not be paid off until the year 2080. Can the minister confirm that a child born today will be 60 before the Morrison government's record $1.7 trillion of debt is paid off? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. A child born today will have better opportunities to get ahead Senator in Watt, the future because of the hard yards that our government did Senate. in the first six years in government to repair, my left. To, to repair the budget Order. and to strengthen the economy. And a child born today will be in a better position, have better opportunities to get ahead because of our plan to get Australia out of this COVID recession, because of our plan to create jobs, because of our plan to maximise the strength of the economic and jobs recovery. People across Australia know that if we had not stepped up, if we had not stepped up earlier this year, uh, young people today and into the future uh, would have uh, been worse off, would have faced more, uh, a more challenging environment and would have found it harder to get ahead. It is as the result of our hard yards in our first six years in government and through this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic and this coronavirus uh, induced recession, it's because of our work that young people today and into the future will have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister confirm the IPA's assessment that under the Morrison government, and I quote, a budget surplus will not return until 2046. Um, Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm quite. Um, I'm quite impressed by uh, Senator Gallagher's optimism about the Morrison government in 2046, uh, and you know, I, 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 I really I commend her for her optimism that we will still have good government, good Morrison government uh, in Australia in 2046. And let me tell you, the Australian economy uh, will be stronger and better for us. Sen order, 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 Senator, on both sides of the chamber at this end. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. For the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis to be accepted scientifically, it must be based on physical empirical data. During my meetings with the CSIRO, it was confirmed that CSIRO Order. relies only on erroneous, unvalidated, computerised climate models, not physical data. This is a third admission of CSIRO's lack of empirical evidence proving causation. Both types of climate models have repeatedly failed to match physical data and observations. Yet CSIRO has allowed this government to take confidence in climate models, and that has led to economically destructive policies on the Australian economy. Senator Cormann, will you support an inquiry that would analyse and assess quantitatively the accuracy and levels of confidence in CSIRO's climate models? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, Australia is committed to effective action on climate change. The debate that we've had in Australia over the last decade is about what the best uh, methodology uh, would be to achieve, to achieve effective global greenhouse gas emissions in a way that is economically responsible. We think it is very important to maximise the um, emissions reduction effort in a way that is economically responsible, because that, of course, uh, it, you know, our success in uh, securing 
emissions reductions in a way that is economically responsible and doesn't undermine the opportunities uh, for uh, working families to get ahead is a, is a very important uh, way to lead by example for the rest of the world. Because if the rest of the world can see that we can achieve both uh, emissions reductions and economic and jobs growth, then other countries will follow our lead. And that is, of course, I mean, we, we want all countries uh, to uh, do the best they can to help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in a way that is economically responsible, and I commend that approach to you. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Respected economist Dr Alan Moran has compiled government data to show climate policies and renewable subsidies are costing Australians $13 billion extra in higher electricity costs per year, and that is $1,300 extra per household. Minister, is it fair and reasonable that the most vulnerable people in our society, the poor, the elderly, students, the unemployed, are paying 39 per cent of their electricity bills on a fanciful, pointless crusade to change global temperature. It is a highly regressive Order, impost on Senator these people. Senator Roberts. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Our, our government has worked very hard to reduce the uh, costs of electricity and to improve uh, the, uh, you know, both the reliability as well as the affordability of uh, energy supplies, at the same time as uh, working to reduce emissions and meet our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Paris. And I'm uh, pleased to report to the Senate uh, that uh, you know, we are being very successful in that endeavour. Electricity prices are coming down, both for households and uh, for business, and uh, emissions are uh, coming down, and we're meeting our emissions reduction targets, both uh, those agreed to uh, in Kyoto and those uh, that we've committed to in Paris. Uh, so, I mean, we, we are actually uh, achieving what we set out to achieve, but we're doing it in an economically responsible fashion, uh, which we believe uh, is uh, very important and it's, uh, it's, only, it's, only fair, uh, given, uh, it's only fair for the working families of Australia that that's how we do it. Senator Roberts, final supplementary question. Using the government's own data, Dr Moran calculates that energy users subsidise every wind turbine $526,000 every year for 15 years. Australia has 2,691 wind turbines, and that means you are making electricity users pick up the bill of $1.4 billion each year. That's $21.2 billion over their short lifetime. How can you justify adding this massive cost burden to consumers and to industry? Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Again, I mean, you know, our, our government, uh, for uh, very good uh, policy reasons, is committed uh, to um, effective action on climate change. I mean, we are part of the global community, and we are part of global efforts to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we've got to, we've got to, we've got to do that in a globally coordinated fashion. We've got to do it in a way that is that is economically responsible. That is the policy of the Australian government, and that is what we are uh, effectively pursuing. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Res Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Australia's resources sector represents 9 per cent of Australia's GDP, employs over 65,000 people in Queensland alone, and the resources an sector is anticipated to pay over $4 billion in royalties to the Queensland Government in the 2019-20 financial year. The Morrison McCormack Liberal National Government has committed more than $200 million worth of measures to support the resources sector as part of this week's budget. Can the minister outline why our government is steadfast in its commitment to this important industry? The minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President, and I thank Senator Canavan for his question. Of course, Senator Canavan, a renowned champion of the Australian resources sector in particular, and the Australian resources industry, Mr President, is a world leader when it comes to the extraction, to the production and to the export of high-quality resources. The industry represents a significant proportion of Australia's economy and it is the backbone for many regional communities and towns across Australia, as Senator Canavan and indeed all of my Liberal and National colleagues know and appreciate. The resources industry represents some 9 per cent of Australia's GDP and, importantly, that grew last year last financial year by some 0.5 per cent, worth $7 billion extra to Australia's economy as a result. In 2019-20, our resource and energy exports reached a record $290 billion for Australia. Our iron ore was the first commodity to ever record more than $100 billion in export revenue. Our gold industry is poised to become the world's largest producer 
forecast to record some $31 billion of production in 2020-2021. Even in the midst of the most significant global pandemic and economic shock, the resources industry is investing in Australia and in Australians and Australian jobs, with mining capital investment increasing by some 5.4 per cent over the course of the last financial year. The resources industry is already a supporter of Australian jobs, employing some 247,000 Australians in August this year, an increase of almost, almost 6,000 compared with February this year. And of course, they are just direct contributions. The resources industry supports so many more jobs than those direct contributions. That's why the Morrison McCormack government recognises its importance and continues to invest in the industry Senator and its Canada growth potential. A supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what commitments our government has made as part of this week's budget to ensure that continued investment and expansion across our mining industry in this great country? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, we've made a number of new investments to support energy, minerals, groundwater resources and improve their understanding and development during this budget. A $124.5 million expansion of the Exploring for the Future program will improve the understanding of Australia's resources, identifying the resource potential of key regions across Australia. We understand the importance of developing our natural resources, which is why we have committed $28.3 million for five strategic basin plans, charting a quicker pathway for their development. We also recognise the need to provide communities living in gas development regions with independent and transparent information, hence our support for the CSIRO's Gas Industry Social and Environmental Research Alliance with some $13.7 million. As part of our commitment to emissions reduction and to meeting the targets of the Paris Agreement, we have provided a further $50 million towards the Carbon Capture Use and Storage Development Fund. And indeed, Mr. President, our government, in recognising the potential for use of our resources, is of course Order, investing Senator in Birmingham. manufacturing. Senator and their... Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, is the minister aware of any risks to the mining industry and jobs in my home state of Queensland? And while I have the time, while I have the time, um, could I also ask if the minister has the time on this Saturday to come up to Claremont in Central Queensland? and attend our Bob Brown tribute rally, where we'll be highlighting those risks once again. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Canavan for the further question and, indeed, the invitation, uh, Mr, Mr President. In terms, in terms of threats, uh, Senator Canavan and others know a little more about Queensland politics than me, but it's tempting to say one of those threats, indeed, could be Jackie Trad. Uh, so I understand, a name that I hear again and again in terms of, uh, in terms of the risks, Mr President that are faced by the Queensland resources sector. Sadly, Queensland, even coming in pre-COVID, had amongst the highest unemployment, the highest level of bankruptcies and the lowest business confidence in Australia. And it's an economy that is so reliant on the resources and energy and mining sector. That's why it's disappointing to see delays in approvals, delays in approvals for developments such as the New Hope's New Ackland Stage 3. It's a prime example of legal and bureaucratic intervention delaying the potential creation of new jobs, new opportunities in a state like Queensland, and of course losing the potential for 500 additional jobs through these types of delays doesn't Order, help Senator anybody. Birmingham. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for, Order for Home on Affairs. My right. Sorry, I'm going to ask Senator Faruqi to start again. I've asked for silence during questions. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for, for Home Affairs. Last month, ASIO advised the Parliament that right wing violent extremism occupies approximately between 30 and 40 per cent of ASIO's current caseload in counter terrorism work, an increase from 10 to 15 per cent prior to 2016. This is an extraordinary increase over a very short period of time. In August, the nine papers reported that ASIO has been focused on the possibility of extremists being inspired by killers such as the Christchurch gunmen. As a Muslim and as a progressive senator, I find these reports incredibly troubling, but they align with what I see online, on social media and in the correspondence I receive. While it's good that the security services are investigating these threats, there appears to be zero political appetite to invest in new initiatives to address the growth of far-right extremism. Thank you. Just what is the government doing to tackle the growing threat of far-right extremism and white supremacy? <laughs> I could. Good question. 
The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. And Senator Faruqi, um, the government has made it abundantly clear uh, that we are absolutely committed to protecting Australia and Australians uh, from all threats. Uh, in terms of our laws, you will be aware that our arrangements are ideologically agnostic and they focus on the threat of criminality. Uh, as a government, we make no distinction in targeting threats to the Australian community. Our agencies, and I commend our agencies, are working hard to tackle the threats from all sources, whether they be from Islamist extremism, right-wing extremism or any other source. Australians should have confidence that Australia's counter-terrorism arrangements work equally well for right-wing motivated groups and individuals as Order. they do for Islamic extremism. I will make the point, though, that under the former Labor government, Labor actually cut $128 million from the AFP between 2010 and 11 and 2013 and 14. But, uh, Senator Faruqi, our laws and arrangements are ideologically agnostic and they focus on threat and criminality. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, a national anti-racism strategy has not been funded at the federal level in five years. In July 2020, inquiry submission, the Australian Human Rights Commission reiterated its support for a strategy, stating a national anti-racism strategy is necessary to protect the unity, safety and security of our society and to ensure that our citizens and diaspora communities are protected from racial discrimination and race hate. Why does the government continue to refuse to fund a national anti-racism strategy? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Faruqi, you would be aware uh, that we have laws in relation to racism. Those laws already exist, and if you are in breach of those laws, there are consequences. Order. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Is the minister concerned by MPs in the Liberal and National parties who have in the last few years attended far-right rallies, spoken at far-right rallies, and engaged with and given interviews to far-right media outlets? And will Order. the minister... Will the minister Order. condemn those members for their behaviour, including George Christensen MP, who last week fessed up to following extremist social media groups? Will you condemn him and others? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, and unfortunately I did not actually hear the last part of your question, Senator Ruki, Faruqi, uh, due to the noise order. in the chamber. Sorry, are you on a point of order, Senator Faruqi? Point of order. Um, if the minister didn't hear the question because of all the shouting going on, um, I would like the indulgence of the Senate to repeat the question. With the, I was going to ask, could you repeat the last part of your question, and can I ask senators again to remain silent during the question, even if it is a contested matter, there's a time for it to, debate, to be debated afterwards. Senator Fruki, if you could repeat the last part of your question. Will the minister condemn those members for their behaviour, including George Christensen MP, who last week fessed up to following extremist social media groups? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Ruki. Um, I am not aware of the circumstances that you are referring to, uh, but certainly uh, I would condemn right-wing extremism. I would condemn left-wing extremism. Well done. Senator Sheldon. Right. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. What guarantees can the minister give that the government's hiring credit scheme will not be used by employers to cut the hours of existing employees who are ineligible for the subsidy in order to employ new workers to replace them who are eligible for the subsidy. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. That is a very fair question and it's obviously something that we've considered as we designed uh, the program, uh, the job maker. The hiring credit is uh, only available for additional jobs employers cannot reduce their current workforce either by dismissing 
employees are reducing their hours and re-engage new workers performing the same work to receive the hiring credits. I mean, we've put some integrity measures in place, and the most important ones uh, are uh, the fact that um, any employer who wants to take advantage of this scheme uh, has to demonstrate that both their payroll, as the, the, the size of their payroll, as, wo as well as the number of employees is going up. Uh, so the business's total employee headcount, minimum of one additional employee from the reference date of 30 September 2020, and the payroll of the business for the reporting period as compared to the three months to 30 September 2020 um, has, to, has to be higher. So to demonstrate that the job is additional, those specific criteria must be met uh, to, uh, and so they must uh, meet this double-barreled additionality criteria in order to be able to access this uh, credit. Uh, all, all employees uh, have protections also, as uh, Senator Sheldon would be aware, under industrial relations laws from unfair or unlawful dismissal, including non-genuine redundancies, and there are other integrity measures in place to ensure that employers cannot reclassify existing workers from contractors to employees to receive the hiring credit or move employees between entities within a single group. I hope, I hope that addresses uh, Senator Sheldon's question. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. What assurances can the minister give that the government's hiring credit scheme will not incentivise employers to lay off casual workers working greater than 20 hours a week and then hire more workers who are eligible for the subsidy. Senator Cormann. So thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I think that I've fundamentally answered uh, that question. Um, I mean, that's, I mean we, we clearly, as we were putting uh, this um, uh, scheme in place. We've put these integrity measures in place. And I mean, what is the incentive to, for the employer not to do this? Well, if the employer were to do this, they would no longer be eligible for the scheme. Uh, I mean, I, I would have thought you know, if, the, if the employer wants to access the scheme, they can't do what uh, Senator Sheldon has just described. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary. What assurances can the minister provide that a young worker hired under the government's hiring credit scheme will still have their job once the scheme ends in October 2021. Senator Cormann. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, uh, the, the usual industrial relations laws apply, and uh, you know, what we are doing through this hiring credit is give uh, young people an opportunity uh, to uh, work you know, over this 12-month uh, period and to uh, establish a track record of work performance, which uh, will stand them in good stead uh, as they pursue uh, their career moving forward. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the budget's job maker plan is backing small businesses to recover, rebuild, reinvest and employ more Australians as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator O'Sullivan for his uh, question. And, Mr. President, uh, you'd be aware that this week's budget is all about jobs, backing those Australians uh, who are in jobs and ensuring that they stay in those jobs, and obviously getting as many Australians back into work as we can. And uh, a fundamental part of that plan is backing our small and family businesses every step of the way. Uh, they are the engine room of the Australian economy in so many different ways. They're major drivers of employment, uh, in fact, employing over six million Australians and contributing around $418 billion to our national economy. Uh, the CEO of the Council of Small Businesses Australia, Peter Strong, he has welcomed the Budget 2020 as providing great things in it for small business people. And Mr President, in terms of what we're doing for small businesses across Australia, we are, of course, allowing them to invest in themselves. We're supercharging the instant asset write-off uh, by delivering temporary full expensing, allowing businesses to write off the full cost of eligible depreciable assets until 30 June 2020. And of course, we understand that so many businesses have done it tough as a result of COVID-19, and they need that important cash flow. So we're providing $4.9 billion in tax relief through temporary loss carryback. This is going to allow businesses impacted by COVID-19 to write off their bad years against their previous good year. We're also expanding access to small business tax concessions. We're providing $105 million in tax relief to an additional 20,000 business and their employers. Importantly, in our, the skill space, we're removing costly barriers for business to train their employees by exempting employer-provided retraining 
from fringe benefits tax. Uh, this will allow small businesses to capitalise on our $7 billion skills investment. Small and family business, Mr President, they are the backbone of the Australian economy, uh, and in the Budget 2020 we are backing them Order. every step Senator of the Cash. way. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, COVID-19 has meant that many businesses have had to adapt, innovate and build their digital capability. How is the, budget maker, sorry, the budget's job maker digital business plan supporting small businesses to grow digital and grow their businesses? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, one of the things that uh, COVID-19 has shown us is the importance of digitisation in building resilience for small businesses. In fact, so many of those businesses that were able to pivot overnight, and in particular in the hospitality industry, were those businesses who were digitally literate. Um, COVID-19 has just well and truly accelerated digital growth in our economy. And an important part of our budget is supporting small businesses to adapt to this challenge. We are investing, as you're aware, $800 million in our job maker digital business plan, and that is all about supporting small businesses to embrace digital technologies. We are investing over $19 million to support small businesses to go digital by expanding the Australian Small Business Advisory Service Digital Solutions Program, otherwise known as ASPAS, to a further 10,000 small businesses. And in fact, the Chamber of Commerce, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, have endorsed the policy, noting it will create the jobs Australia needs. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. We've seen the impact of health restrictions and shutdowns, how they've put enormous pressure on the mental health of all Australians. How is this budget helping to support the mental health and well-being of Australia's small business owners? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as we'd all be aware. COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on Australia and Australians, but in particular has brought considerable challenges uh, for our hardworking small business owners and their staff right around Australia. But that is why the government uh, in this budget is investing $7 million, a further $7 million, to support the mental health of small business owners through our Business Balance Initiative. Business Balance will expand Beyond Blue's new access program to small business owners and it will provide them with free, accessible and tailored support to help manage the pressures of COVID-19. We're also providing funding to expand Deakin University's free accredited professional development program to build the mental health literacy of trusted business advisors like accountants and bookkeepers. Um, the investment has been welcomed by Beyond Blue Chair, the Honourable Julia Gillard AC, and it will assist small business owners who have been affected Order. by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Today, Mr Morrison referred to those expressing concern that women have been left behind by his government's budget as, and I quote, voices of disruption, of division. Does the minister agree with Mr Morrison that Australian women concerned about being left behind by this government are just voices of disruption, of division? The minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator O'Neill, for your question. One of the things that has probably most greatly concerned me um, over the last few days in response to the budget by those opposite uh, and, and, and others um, has been the lack of understanding of the depth of the measures that are in this budget that support Australia's women. Um, and you know, as, as a, a woman in this place um, and, and representing today the Minister for Women, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Payne, um, it is very distressing that, that we have not seen the kind of credit for the massive level of investment that have been made in all Australians over the last seven months as we have managed our way through the pandemic and again on Tuesday night with the measures that have been put in place to help Australia's women. 
And as I said, apart from all of the general measures of which the majority have been uh, accessible to women, um, there have been dedicated measures that have been specifically targeted towards assisting women in this budget. Um, we've been through them on a number of occasions in this place, but I'm more than happy to stand here again and talk about some of the great initiatives that were contained in Tuesday night's budget uh, for women. And these are on top of a number of measures that have been contained in other announcements over the past seven months, as Australia has come to terms with a pandemic that has never been experienced by the, in the lifetime of anybody that is sitting in this chamber. But we, we will absolutely stand by a record uh, as a government in supporting women, and I too am happy to stand by my record in the time that I've been the minister responsible for families and social services about initiatives that we have undertaken to assist Australia's women. As I said, the, the Women's Economic Security Statement absolutely specifically targeted to make sure that we return the work, level of work participation by Australia's women back to the highest levels and hopefully Order, hopefully Senator Rustin Senator O'Neill a supplementary question Thank you Mr President In response to criticism of the Morrison government's budget the Prime Minister's office has said that and I quote no one credible was making that criticism Is that really the government's position Senator Rustin yeah. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and thank you once again, Senator O'Neill, for, for your supplementary question. What, uh, what I would say um, is that I have been extremely disappointed at some of the commentary that we have received about the budget that has, has had absolutely lacked uh, any understanding or acceptance that there have been a number of measures in this budget that are specifically Order. targeted towards women, but equally Order. we have a number of uh, measures. In fact, just about every single measure that is contained in the budget has a, that it applies to women. Um, and the idea that we would have a budget that is gender specific in every single measure that's contained in it is completely ludicrous and completely ludicrous. Well, I noticed Senator McAllister asked me about just one measure. I can go Order. through many, many measures. We can Order. talk about the paid parental leave changes. We can talk about um, you know, the, uh, the advanced apprenticeships. For women, we can talk about um, the female leaders uh, initiative. We can talk about a Senator number Rustin, of measures. Time for the answers expired. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In his International Women's Day address last year, Mr. Morrison said of gender equality, and I quote: "We want women to rise, but we don't want to see women rise only on the basis of others doing worse." Is this why Scott Morrison's budget has left women behind? Senator Rustin. Well, first and foremost, the Morrison budget, delivered by the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, on Tuesday night, did not leave women behind. In fact, I would say that the budget on Tuesday night was one of the most comprehensive suite of interrelated measures to support all Australians, uh, and the support has been specifically targeted at areas of greatest need. Clearly, there are initiatives contained in the budget that are targeted specifically to women. We've been through them on numerous occasions, but as I said, I'll go through them again if you want to ask me another question. But equally, we have got measures that, are, that have targeted other areas of our community where there's a greatest need. Clearly, the, the, the work um, credits that has been put in place was targeting the fact that so many young people had lost their jobs during the pandemic. Um, you know, clearly, there are other initiatives that are contained in the budget that are uh, focused on Indigenous Australians in areas of need. This budget is targeted, Order, focused Senator and measured. Rustin. Order. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Order. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. The Morrison government is ensuring maximum opportunities exist for young Australians with the best available opportunities in education and employment prospects and the most appropriate assistance for those that require help during the COVID-19 crisis. How is the government's plan for jobs, as outlined in Tuesday night's budget, supporting young Australians to access job opportunities and rebuild their connections to employers during these times? Question. The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thanks, Senator Chandler, for her question. Mr. President, we know 
As a government, that young Australians have been adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting impacts on essential services. Mr. President, but Tuesday night's budget paved the way for a road to recovery. The coalition government has committed $4 billion to support young people into work through the JobMaker hiring credit, which provides a wage subsidy of $200 a week for up to a year to make eligible position available for a young person aged 16 to 29 years or $100 a week for those aged 30 to 35 who have been receiving the JobSeeker payment, youth allowance or parenting payment for at least one month within the last three months before they were, before they were hired. Mr President, the Morrison government has always focused on creating jobs. Since the coalition was elected in 2013 at to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the Australian economy create 1.5 million new jobs. The budget on Tuesday night further demonstrated our government's commitment to getting the Australian economy back on track and Australians back into the workforce, with young Australians being a key focus of that commitment. Mr. President. The JobMaker hiring credit will accelerate growth and employment during the recovery by giving organisations incentives to take on additional employees, additional employees, Mr. President, that are young, young job seekers aged 16 to 35 years old. It's expected, Mr. President, that the uh, JobMaker hiring credit will support around 450,000 positions for young people to move back into employment. As the Treasurer outlined in the budget speech, Mr President, having a job means much more than just having an income. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, I recognise and this government recognises the important role of our apprentices to our economy and communities across Australia. What initiatives is the government investing in to recognise the importance of our young apprentices and trainees? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. This government is acutely aware of the devastating impact that COVID-19 has played on the employment of many young Australians. That's why the Morrison government has announced $1.2 billion to encourage employers to take on apprentices and trainees through a new commencement wage subsidy. Mr. President, this $1.2 billion additional dollars will enable us to support 100,000 new apprentice commencements. And Mr President, as someone who started their working career as a tradie, I can only commend it to any young person out there who's looking to start work. It's, it's a great start off in life, Mr President. This measure will help prevent future skill shortages and create opportunities for women and young people, including recent school leavers, Mr President, and employers of any size or industry Australia-wide who engage in Australian apprentices, uh, apprentices from 5 October through to 31 September 21 Order, will Colbeck. be eligible under this Senator program. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. On top of recent actions to engage young people and identify the mental challenges they are facing, what investment is the government making to ensure young Australians have access to mental health support? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and this is one area where uh, young people have been significantly impacted uh, and we all remain extremely concerned about their mental health. And we're committed to ensuring the mental health of young people is maintained throughout the on uh, our ongoing investment into youth mental health and suicide prevention measures. The Australian government, Mr President, has invested an unprecedented $5.7 billion in mental health in 2020-2021 alone. We've doubled the number of Medicare-funded psychological services from 10 to 20 through the Better Access initiative, and additional mental health support will be available to young people living in bushfire-affected regions and those bearing the brunt of COVID-19. On top of this, Mr. President, we are the government is driving the largest expansion of the Headspace network from 124 services to 153 services nationally by 2022. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a very short statement. 
Leave is granted. Senator Wong. Uh, I, I thank the Senate. I, I note that uh, today is given today's announcement, Senator Cormann's last question time. Uh, I know that we will have the opportunity tomorrow to say nice or not nice things about him, should we wish. But I did want to take the opportunity on his last question time to make a comment about ministerial accountability. Ministerial accountability to the people through the parliament is, a, is central and fundamental to our democracy, and question time is central to that accountability. And whilst I would say that at times I thought he could have given better answers, Senator Cormann does understand. He understands that belief in democracy demands respect of norms and institutions, and he sought to reflect that in his behaviour. Uh, my hope is that more in the executive government, government could always do the same. Senator. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator um, Wong for his um, kind remarks and look forward to a, a more extensive conversation tomorrow. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, and I seek leave to move a motion relating to the sitting of the Senate uh, on Friday, 9 October 2020. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Uh, I move that divisions might take place on Friday, 9 October 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Oh, Senator McAllister. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin to the questions asked by Senators McCarthy, Keneally and O'Neill. Well, the Prime Minister uh, has uh, described those expressing concern that women have been left behind by his government's budget as voices of disruption and division. And more disturbingly, some young man, I assume it was a young man in the Prime Minister's office, took time out of his busy day to ring up a female journalist and take her to task for her coverage of his government's budget and saying that no one credible, no one credible was making criticisms of the government's budget on the grounds of its inadequacies in terms of women. Well, when the minister representing the Minister for Women was asked about these comments, her response is simpler to say she's concerned about the level of understanding about how her budget works. How patronising. How patronising to say that the voices of Australian women, when they raise their voice, raise objections about how this government performs, how this government responds to their issues, the answer is, oh, they clearly just don't understand. Well, I'll tell you what, if I have to choose between the Morrison government and the credible women who are raising concerns about their budget, I know who I will choose. I will choose the credible women every single day. And for the people on the other side who don't understand the issues, because I think it's this government who doesn't understand, it's not Australian women, let me take you through it. We are facing the worst recession in almost 100 years. It's a recession triggered by a global pandemic and it has disproportionately affected Australian women. Women have lost their jobs and they've lost their hours and they've lost them at a faster rate than men. Since March, since March almost 200,000 women have lost their jobs and 110,000 women have left the labour force altogether. At the peak of the coronavirus restrictions earlier this year, more than one million women had no work whatsoever. And outside the workforce, a whole lot of new tasks accrued to women in the home. Homeschooling, looking after unwell people, a massive increase in the burden of work at home. But during the pandemic, what did the government do? What did they do to support women? Well, they set up JobKeeper in a way that excluded short-term casuals, which overwhelmingly impacted women more than men. They withdrew JobKeeper from the childcare sector, unbelievably, and the women who were excluded from other measures of support were told that what they should do was draw down from their already meagre super balances, forcing women to choose between their financial security now and their financial security in retirement. The government had an opportunity to redeem themselves in this budget. They had an opportunity to fix some of this stuff up. Because there is no doubt 
that Australian women have borne the brunt of the pandemic and the Morrison recession that's accompanied it. But despite racking up more than a trillion dollars worth of debt, the Prime Minister's office rehashed the women's economic statement and allocated $230 million in new funding, 0.024 per cent of the new spending that is in the budget. Now, for absolute clarity, we are spending more in this budget on a waste recycling program than we are on the women's economic security statement. We are planning to spend more on buying petrol than we are on the women's economic security statement. We are spending twice as much on putting in a new computer system in the Department of Human Services than we are on the women's economic security statement in this budget. So when credible women say to you on the government benches, your budget does not deliver for us. A humble government, a listening government, would actually take that concern seriously. It would listen and respond. It would not try to demean and diminish the voices of people who raise their concerns about your performance, because that is essentially the kind of arrogance that will not be rewarded will not be rewarded because people who raise concerns about women's issues are not voices of disruption or of division. We are ordinary voices of Australian women who are tired of having our interests ignored by a government that only sees the world through male eyes, that appears incapable of appreciating women's perspectives, disinterested in addressing it and hostile to hearing women's voices. I stand with the credible women. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Rennie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. What a great day to be doing Take Note, because I get to talk about my favourite subject, women. And I'd like to give a shout out to my beautiful wife, my beautiful daughter, my beautiful sisters, my mother, my passed away, passed away mother, my grandmothers. They are all working women. They were all working women. And the one thing that we will never do on this side of the chamber is leave women behind. Is leave our women behind. But the other thing we will never do on this side of the chamber is leave our children behind or leave our families behind. Or leave our families behind. You know, and I and I'd like to reflect on the comments of another great Australian woman. Quinton Bryce, Australia's first governor, uh, female governor general, who, when talking about uh, you know, the, the complexities of trying to raise your children and going back to work, she said, "You know, you can have it all. You don't necessarily have to have it all at once." And I think it's terribly presumptuous of those on the other side of the chamber to think that that they know what every woman wants. You know, some women don't necessarily want to go back to work straight away. Some might like to stay home while their children are young. And if that's what they want to do, we on this side of the chamber will support that. Because we on this side of the chamber believe in believe in choice and believe in our children. Order. And that's different to Order. that side of the chamber that believes in command and control. This side, choice, children, families, that side that side of the chamber, command and control. But of course, there's more to it than what these uh, Labor like to make out, and we've got it here. Our old friend Auntie, the ABC, and they're not the greatest friends of the coalition. But uh, fact checked a few years ago, uh, did a fact check on was Labor's childcare fund only ever about the union? Was it only ever about the union? And the result was in the ballpark. And if I can just read it. It says there are reasonable criticisms of the amount allocated to the fund, the un uneven way it was distributed and the adoption of a first-come, first-served policy. This process favoured the union. This process favoured the union. And that is one thing we will never do on this side of the chamber, is unionise parenthood. And that is the difference between this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber, because that side of the chamber puts unions first. It doesn't put our children first. It doesn't put women first. It doesn't put the welfare of all Australians first. It puts the unions first all the time. And whenever they're talking about these issues, you can always be sure that in the background, it's always about the unions. It's always about the unions. So let's just uh, look at some of the numbers in the budget here. 
because there's these allegations that there's no money in the budget for women, there's no budget, you know, uh, uh, money in the budget for you know women's support. So let's just quote a couple of figures here. Uh, women are getting 242 million uh, in uh, sorry, let's see some uh, for the uh, 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 women's workforce participation. So we're spending 240 million to get women back into work. And should I also say that we're putting the, there's nine billion dollars for childcare, nine billion dollars in this year's budget for childcare. But on top of that, there's 20 billion dollars for the family tax benefit. Now, I uh, forget who it was before, one of the Labor um, members, senators, said, mentioned that two-thirds of people who stay at home are women. So we're, we're supporting uh, stay-at-home parents to the tune of $20 billion. There's parental income support of another $7 billion. There's child support of $2 billion. Support for the childcare system, $1.5 billion. Another $600 million for families and children. So all up, there's about $40 billion to help families, help families. You know, women are a part of families. So there is a lot of money in this budget for both childcare, for families, and to help women get back in to the workforce. So I totally refute the allegations that the, LN the coalition doesn't support women. And we should just touch on a few other big discounts in the budget here. I noticed Senator McAllister before, of course, raised the issue of superannuation. If we look at the biggest tax concessions in the budget, guess what it is? The second and third biggest concessional taxation of superannuation entity earnings, concessional taxation of employer superannuation contributions, over $40 billion in superannuation contributions. Wow. So I'll tell you what. Thank you, you want... Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And uh, I, I find it hard to believe some of the contributions and some of the answers that we've received to our, our questions today about the actual fact of what is confronting Australian women at this time and the tone deafness, not only of the answers they've given us today, but their inability to hear the reality, to see and understand the reality of what is happening to Australian women right now in the course of this Morrison crisis that's been inflicted on us. The Morrison, I do mean the Morrison recession, but it's a crisis of a great proportion because there is no adequate response. Just where I live, in the seat of Robertson, for example, before the recession, the Central Coast had the highest underemployment of unskilled female workers in the entire country. They have not been noticed. They have not been heard. There is no response, despite putting us in debt as a nation to the tune of $1 trillion. Those women's needs remain unanswered. These were women at the front line of the aged care crisis and the front line of the pandemic, and the government has now turned its back on them. Women on the central coast of New South Wales lost work hours much faster than men. They were 50 per cent more likely to stop looking for work than men, and they are suffering more significantly than men. You think a government would know about these things. You think the government would have some plan in their response, in their budget, to that reality. Data from the New South Wales Parliamentary Library shows us that employment growth slowed to a trickle while more people than ever were leaving the coast to commute for many hours for jobs. That's the reality before these guys got to the pandemic. And it's so, so much worse now. Senator Rennick mentioned the union movement, and I want to stand firmly with the SDA union and other great union leaders who are the only voice standing up for workers who are much maligned by this government. As they said, this is a blue budget for a pink recession. There is totally inadequate support for women. 200,000 women who work in accommodation, food services and retail trade sector all missed out on JobSeeker due to its design flaws around casual employees. They're suffering. Their families are suffering. And of $1 trillion that is going to be wrapped up as debt for this country, there is no relief in sight for those women. The number of women on JobSeeker has jumped by 124 per cent over the past 12 months. 
surging past their male counterparts in August. And what does it mean for the women who end up on JobSeeker? Well, let me just give you a little bit of the flavour of what it was like for an amazing woman who gave evidence to a committee hearing that we had in Launceston at the end of 2019. This is the kind of Australian woman that this government is leaving behind. Her name was Deborah, and this is what she said. I've worked a total of 35 years for Australia, and my last position was for 22 years. I've worked 30 of those 35 years in factory work, so it was physical labour and your body can only take that for so long. In 2016, I was made redundant. The factory I worked at closed in November of that year, and I was made redundant in July. I went to Centrelink to be told that I had to live on my redundancy for 18 months, which I did. After that, they put me on New Start. Now, the equivalent of that is job seeker. So to say that going from a paid job to New Start is a shock to the system is a bit of an understatement because budgeting is impossible. There's just no money to budget. There's just not enough money to go around. I followed all the instructions from Centrelink and my job provided to the letter. I had my payments suspended five times so far this year due to no fault of mine, and that's stressful. When you get a text message, actually on Wednesday, I reported, and when I got to the end of my report, it said, your payment has been suspended. suspended. I had to get out of that, ring my job provider and ask what is going on. It happens all the time. My medical scripts cost about 80 plus a month. I've used all my redundancy. I have few savings left. Frankly, I'm scared about what's going to happen to me when my car rego and my insurance etc come in because there are no savings left. That's what I've been living on. I mean, am I going to be forced to live in my car? It makes me very sad and it's demeaning when our Prime Minister says that New Start recipients are a blight on the Australian economy. That is the Mr Morrison who created the budget that we saw on Tuesday night. That is why Australian women are Thank being you, left Senator behind, because he Your simply has doesn't. Expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, um, it is bizarre, to say the least, uh, to hear uh, uh, opposition senators come into this place and talk about the Morrison recession, as we just heard Senator O'Neill uh, mention. So, I mean, obviously, uh, this is a, an issue which has gone right through the Labor Party. Uh, Mr Chalmers uh, yesterday sent around an email talking about the Morrison rece recession, as if the COVID-19 crisis didn't exist. Now, the budget papers during the week uh, revealed that, yes, the Australian economy has shrunk by 7 per cent in the June quarter, and that compares to a 20 per cent reduction in the UK and 12 per cent in New Zealand. So this is the, the global recession that the Labor Party don't seem to be able to come to terms with that is inflicting damage upon the world's economy. But given that this discussion is about women, uh, I will now turn to that matter. Now, this budget is about uh, improving the economic standing of this country and improving the standing of all the citizens of Australia. And yes, uh, our whole economic response to this pandemic uh, has been to, to try and be as broad-based as possible. We've spent $100 billion on the JobKeeper scheme, and that has kept businesses afloat, it's kept people in their jobs, it's kept people alive. Now, we can talk about the issues that have been raised during this take note, uh, and as I say, the budget is based on uh, uh, a rising tide lifting all boats, and all boats being the Australian people. But of course, there is a gender pay gap, uh, which is the lowest that it's been uh, on record under our government leading into this pandemic. And so there is a recognition across our government that there, are, uh, there is a need to deploy measures uh, to deal with some of the issues that women in particular face. Now, in relation to the childcare, which is often raised, I, mean, I have never seen this as an issue for women. It's an issue for families. Uh, it is an issue for men and women. It's an issue for everyone. Uh, and so, uh, you know, um, solving childcare is not solving something which is a problem that should just only accrue to women. It is, a, it is a, something that families need to work together on and I don't see these issues as just falling into a women's bucket. Uh, but ac across the board, uh, we have deployed measures in this budget uh, which deal directly with some of the shortcomings in our economy. Now, one of the roles I'm performing in this place is chairing an inquiry into fintech. Uh, and during that inquiry, uh, it has become clear that there is 
a need for us to do more training, to spend more time and more effort and more resources on ensuring that women have the skills uh, to, to, run tech, to, to run tech businesses to be successful in the tech space. And so in this budget we have deployed uh, $25 million into STEM cadetships for women. We've also put money into boost uh, enterprise amongst women, uh, with uh, 280 odd startups expected to be created because of this scheme. Now, uh, in the course of this inquiry, it's been a great pleasure to meet many, many founders uh, and CEOs of fintech and regtech businesses uh, who are women. So. Uh, there are many of them that are successful already, and we want to see more and more businesses in this, in this space. Now, in this budget, there have been a number of uh, recommendations of the FinTech Committee adopted. So the research and development tax incentive recommendations have been adopted, and there's also been changes to the uh, FBT, or Fringe Benefit Tax Arrangements, that will be forthcoming. Now, all of these things are designed, of course, to improve the, the amount of private investment into the tech space where men and women work, uh, but we do want to see more women in this space, which is why we're deploying the, scheme, the STEM I should say, scheme. Uh, and again, I, I, I would reflect on some of the interactions that we've had at, at the committee where there have been just some brilliant women who've uh, come up with a tech idea and they've gone into the market and they've established these businesses and they're now deploying things in the buy now, pay later sector and whatnot. Now, this is a, a, a great tribute uh, to female enterprise, but we do want to see more, so we are trying to, to provide some positive discrimination here in this field. But I would summarise my comments as saying this is the budget for all Australians. Uh, the rising tide does lift all boats. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator McCarthy. Madam Deputy President, $1 trillion in debt and nothing for women over the age of 35. In the Morrison government's budget, women are being left out and left behind. Day after day, we see new evidence of the disproportionate impact COVID-19 is having on Australian women. But in response, the Morrison government has failed. Women have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, taking on two-thirds of the unpaid care work at home. Even before the pandemic hit, a significant number of job seeker recipients were middle-aged women. In August, there were 754,100 women receiving JobSeeker. Of those, 61 per cent of these women were over 35. And the same research revealed a huge increase in the number of women in their 40s, 50s and 60s who relied on unemployment benefits for years. A third of women aged at least 55 have been on unemployment support for at least five years. 460,000 women who are aged over 35 years are without work and face a future of living on $40 a day. They have been excluded from the Morrison government's hiring credit scheme and will need to compete against younger, subsidised job seekers. So if you're a woman in your, in your 40s who's been on JobKeeper during this recession, had your hours reduced, working in one of the industries such as hospitality or retail, and come March or April you lose your job, what is in the budget for you? Nothing. The Morrison government excluded many women from JobKeeper. The Morrison government only provided JobKeeper for two-thirds of early educators and then ripped JobKeeper from the sector before any other profession. 96 per cent of women are early educators, or 96 per cent of early educators are women, women working on the front line of the COVID-19 crisis. Now, what about First Nations women? Let's have a look at their story. There's no additional education funding for young First Nations women. The Clontar Foundation funding supports the education of young First Nations men only. No additional health or legal justice services for First Nations women. No new money uh, for further frontline domestic violence services, including no additional emergency and social housing to meet increased demand due to COVID-19. No COVID-19 recovery support for unemployed Indigenous women over 35 years of age to regain employment. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare estimates 
that of the 64,644 First Nations people who sought specialist help for homelessness back in 2016 to 17, 61 per cent were women. First Nations women comprise 34 per cent of all female prisoners, compared to 2 per cent of the overall Australian population. Although the majority of people in prison are male, 97 per cent, First Nations women are the most rapidly growing population of prisoners with rates increasing by 150 per cent since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, twice the rate of other females and double the rate of First Nations males from 2000 to 2016. These women have often experienced poverty, grief and loss, domestic violence, racism and poor mental health. Senator Rustin has noted the Women's Economic Security Statement contained $240 million specific initiatives for women, $1.1 trillion of debt in the Prime Minister's Women's Economic Statement contains just $240 million for 51 per cent of the population. This is a pittance compared to multi-billion dollar commitments directed to various male-dominated industries. The 2020 budget contains nothing to address a significant job losses in industries dominated by women, yet women have represented more than 50 per cent of job losses during the coronavirus-led economic downturn. There is no new funding for frontline domestic and family violence services that support women and their children escaping violence, nothing new to address the gender pay gap, nothing on superannuation and women's economic security and retirement, nothing on childcare, nothing, nothing on social housing, nothing, no plan for women in Australia. The question is the motion moved by Senator McAllister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answers given to uh, my question, which was to Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister, in relation to the lack of support for Australia's artists, arts community, the art and creative sector, and the industries, of course, that rely on our artistic and creative workers. Artists right around the country were shocked on Tuesday night when the Treasurer, after six months of uh, the industry suffering uh, because of the various levels of restrictions and the hard blow uh, to the industry because of COVID-19, that the Treasurer could not even utter the word art in his budget speech on Tuesday night. And it is just a disgrace. Hundreds of thousands of Australian workers within our arts and creative sector have been left out in the cold. Very little support has been put on the table for them. The government talks about the fact that they could have access to JobKeeper or JobSeeker uh, without actually understanding that because of the nature of this industry, many, many artists and creative workers across the country have gone without anything. They don't qualify for JobKeeper. And some may be on JobSeeker, but of course uh, we know that the government's about to force those people back to living on $40 a day. So um, it's hardly helping uh, those who are struggling uh, within those areas of work. And the, the fact that the budget uh, has failed to recognise that this industry needs support, that it was one of the hardest hit, the first hit uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, recession and will be the last to come out. You'd think that this government would have bothered to put more support on the table, but of course nothing. And one of the saddest things about all of this, of course, is that it pales in comparison to what other countries have done. And I asked Senator Cormann in about this. In the UK, the government has put one and a half billion pounds on the table because they understand that the arts and cultural institutions and industry and sector is vital to a functioning uh, uh, democracy, vital to the economy. So too, um, of course, has uh, Germany, billions of euros put on the table. Um, we know that uh, in France they have uh, allowed for the unemployment and a special unemployment scheme for actors, for performers, uh, for artists who are out of work because of COVID-19. 
And of course, Senator Cormann is about to uh, uh, go and try and win the plum job of Secretary General of the OECD. Um, it's not much of a track record you're taking from Australia, uh, Senator Cormann, when it comes to the arts and the creative sector. But of course, one of the worst parts of this budget, one of the worst parts of this budget, has been that it's those sectors, majority. Uh, employing women who have been the hardest hit. We're talking the arts and the uh, entertainment sector, we're talking hospitality, uh, the uh, tourism sector, retail. And despite all of that, most people who have lost their jobs because of COVID being women, most people who have lost their hours because of COVID uh, being women, most people who are suffering through this recession being women. There's really nothing in there for women. So if you happen to work in the arts and the entertainment industry and you happen to be a woman, it's a pretty bad budget for you, a terrible budget for you. You've been left on the scrap heap. It is just absolutely appalling. And it does beg the question, does this government have a problem with Australian women? Does this government have a problem with supporting Australia's women to get back into work, to have enough income to pay the bills and to have affordable childcare so they can get on and do it. Why has this Prime Minister left Australia's women on the scrap heap? Why has this Prime Minister left women out in the cold? He doesn't seem to like art very much. He doesn't seem to like culture very much. He loves the footy. He loves his tradies building renovated kitchens, and he's done nothing for women. It's a pretty sad day for Australian women and a pretty bad budget to boot. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I have received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move uh, a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. I move that uh, senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 27th of September of the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan AO, a Senator for the Australian Capital Territory from 1975 to 1988 and a Minister. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Senator the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan AO. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. Um, I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 27 September 2020 of the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan I.O., former Senator for the Australian Capital Territory and Minister for Education, Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women and Special Minister of State in the Hawke Government, places on record its appreciation for her service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its profound sympathy to the family in their bereavement. Uh, Mr President, um, Susan Ryan uh, was a passionate advocate for gender equality and a pioneer in the fight for the interests of Australian women. She leaves behind an extensive legacy uh, full of firsts, one of the Australian Capital Territory's first senators and the first senator to represent uh, the ILP. Labor's first female cabinet minister, the first woman to hold the Women's Affairs portfolio and Australia's first age discrimination commissioner. But her sig signature achievement was the um, passage of the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, legislation that made sexual harassment unlawful and was a largely successful attempt to ensure that women had the same access to jobs, services and accommodation as men. The Act has had a lasting impact on Australian women. It encouraged more women to seek an education and employment making it possible for women to hold employment and have a family life. These important social changes raised Australian family incomes and gave women more opportunities and economic independence. Born on 10 October 1942 in Sydney, Susan was one of four children to Arthur and Florence Ryan. 
growing up in Marubra, Susan was educated at the Brigadine School and was the first in her family and school to receive a scholarship to the University of Sydney, where she studied teaching. Upon graduating in 1963, Susan married Richard Butler, with whom she had two children. She worked briefly as a school teacher, and then after the arrival of their first child, Justine, she switched careers, running a small business from her home in uh, Cremon, the living parish hymn book publishing company. In 1965, uh, the family moved to Canberra, and Susan embarked on a Master of Arts degree in English Literature at the Australian National University. Her studies were interrupted when Richard was posted to the Australian Embassy in Vienna, and shortly after arriving, Susan and Richard welcomed the birth of their second child, Benedict. In 1970, the family moved again, this time a posting to New York. But less than a year later, Susan would return to Australia with her two children and resume her uh, master's degree. She joined the Women's Electoral Lobby in 1972 and the Bell Conan branch of the Australian Labour Party shortly thereafter. The Women's Electoral Lobby began to push for direct political representation. In 1974, Susan agreed to stand for pre-selection in the new ICT seat of Fraser. While she was unsuccessful at that election, coming third in the ballot, Susan would get her chance again in 1975 when legislation to provide the ICT with two Senate positions was enacted. Running on the slogan, a woman's place is in the Senate, uh, Susan was elected as one of the first two senators to represent the ICT and the first woman and uh, ILP senator to represent the territory. Susan entered Parliament during a dramatic and challenging time for the ILP. The party had just suffered a landslide election defeat after the dismissal of uh, Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister by then Governor General John Kerr. But Susan was not deterred. Uh, she came to this place to work hard and make a difference. She had ideas and ambitions, and two years later, when Bill Hayden became opposition leader, he gave her the shadow portfolio responsibilities for communications, arts, and the media, as well as for women's affairs, a portfolio she would hold until her resignation in 1988. Susan was, forced on the, was focused on developing social policy, and when Bob Hawke led Labour back into government in 1983, she was appointed as Minister for Education and as the Minister for Women's Affairs. She was the first woman in the Labour Party to hold a cabinet position. During her time on the front bench, she would deliver important reforms, as I've previously mentioned, including the Sex Discrimination Act, the Affirmative Action, Equal Opportunities and Employment Act, the Public Service Reform Act, and the Equal Opportunity Commonwealth Authorities Act. But after five years in Cabinet, Susan decided it was the right time to retire from her parliamentary career, and she took up a role as the managing editor of Penguin Books. Susan felt she had given the best she could to politics, and in 1990, she was awarded an Officer of the Order of Australia for service to the Australian Parliament. In her 1999 memoir, Catching the Wives, Susan reflected on her achievements, saying she was driven by the view that women should be able to pursue opportunities unencumbered by stifling stereotypes, and that women and men should be judged on their merits. Concepts that uh, thankfully um, are entirely straightforward and universally accepted today. Uh, Susan served in many roles in her post-political career, including executive, uh, executive director for the Plastics Industry Association, executive director of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and Pro-Chancellor of the University of New South Wales. She also continued to fight to end discrimination and better rights for all Australians, serving as Australia's first IH Discrimination Commissioner and later the Disability Discrimination Commissioner. During her time as the IH Discrimination Commissioner, she worked tirelessly to advance the rights of older Australians. After the release of the 2015 Intergenerational Report, she argued that Australia should move to a retirement age of 70, given we are living longer than ever before. In 2015, Susan wrote, in fact, and I'm quoting her now, why are individuals leaving paid work at 60, or often earlier, rather than 70, if they are more likely to live to 100 instead of 150? Age discrimination in employment is a huge barrier to preventing older Australians from continuing in the workforce. 
She said the report also implied that all of those older than 65 are in need of substantial and growing public support and ignored the economic potential of older people. She argued that it was time to have a conversation about how to realize the economic and social potential of an aging population. In her first speech to the Senate in 1976, Susan noted that there were only six women in the Senate. In 2019, the Senate reached gender equality in terms of representation. In part, this was achieved because of groundbreakers like former Senator, the Honorable Susan Ryan. Susan Ryan will be remembered as someone who dedicated her life to social justice and to making this nation a better and more equal place for all Australians. To Susan's partner, Rory, and her surviving children, Justine and Ben, on behalf of the Australian Government and the Senate, I offer our deepest condolences. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. We honour today the life and contribution of former Senator and Minister, the Honourable Susan Ryan. And I speak on behalf of all Labor senators in offering our sympathy and solidarity to her family, especially her partner Rory and her two children, Justine and Benedict, her gran and her grandson Amir, and to her many friends. It is often said you cannot be what you cannot see, and yet someone has to go first. Those are the truest of leaders who have the vision of what is possible the courage to take on the fight against those vested in the status quo, the intellectual power to craft the strategy, the charisma and humanity to bring people with them. For us, for Labor women, that was Susan Ryan. She could see it. She could see a woman at the cabinet table and she could see what Australia needed. What Australia needed that woman to achieve and she made it happen. She wasn't a time server, she was a reformer. She came through first, but she brought others with her. She showed us the way. My generation of Labor women looked up to Susan. She inspired us in word and deed. She took a personal interest in all of us. When I saw her here, she would greet me with an enthusiastic hug. and She'd always offer me encouragement and assure me I was doing well that she was proud of me and of so many others who had followed her. That pride was mutual. Labor women have lost our sister and we will miss her. Susan was born in Sydney and her early life had education at its center. After convent schooling, she completed a Bachelor of Arts at Sydney Teachers College before relocating with her family to Canberra where she embarked on a postgraduate degree in English literature. And this was interrupted when she accompanied her then husband, Richard Butler, on two overseas postings. As she described it, marriage at that time meant going wherever your husband went. She made the most of these experiences to gain knowledge and exposure to new and different thinking. She reflected that on her return to Australia from their first posting in Vienna in 1969, the preoccupations of Labor at that time were vastly different to that of comparable parties in Western Europe. Opposition to the war in Vietnam was a touchstone for those in her generation who were politically active and with whom she would later serve. On their second posting in New York, Susan was sparked in different ways by the ideas of Germaine Greer, Betty Friedan, Kate Millett, Gloria Steinem. And she found herself questioning the place of women in society relative to the place of men. She questioned why everything in personal and public life was arranged for the convenience of men and why people pretended even dull men were clever. At the same time, gifted, passionate women were passed over, neglected and restricted. She said, those of us caught in this whirlwind saw that society was structured, manufactured by its rulers to achieve these endless disparities between the sexes. Our subordination was not destiny. It was a construct of men in which we had acquiesced for far too long. Well, Susan Ryan would acquiesce no more. And the, her arrival back in Canberra led to deep engagement in both labour and feminist politics. At the same time as becoming active in her local labour branch, Susan Ryan joined the women's electoral lobby as a foundation member. Across the country, like-minded women came together and began to organise politically. Women like Wendy McCarthy and Eva Cox. 
Their objectives are familiar, perhaps depressingly so. Confronting sexism, ending discrimination in education and employment, taking control of reproductive health, improving access to childcare and achieving equal pay for equal work. In the Australian Labor Party, Susan Ryan hoped for a practical pathway to redress the wrongs done to women using legislative power to effect change. She rejoiced in the victory of the Whitlam government, although she missed out on an appointment to the groundbreaking new role of women's advisor. Her political activism led to a role running the National Secretariat for the Australian, Australian Council of State School Organisations, a role who would connect her with another early leader of our movement, Joan Kerner, for the first time. And they would go on to have an effective partnership and lasting friendship. The Whitlam government lasted only three years, but it changed our nation forever. Susan saw Labor as the key to a more humane, vibrant and equal society, believing that a feminist lobby was necessary but not sufficient. Instead of being on the outside lobbying, she wanted to be inside making the laws. And before long, she was encouraged to run for pre-selection. Susan Ryan was elected to the ACT Legislative Assembly and after a false start seeking pre-selection for the House of Representatives, she ultimately prevailed in pre-selection to the Senate. In her characteristically tongue-in-cheek telling of it, she said she overcame several reasonably glamorous male candidates. She was elected by the ACT as its first senator in 1975, one of just six women in the federal parliament, all senators. And in the wake of the Whitlam government's defeat, she had made most of the opportunity to help rebuild Labor. She cut her teeth in the Senate in her first couple of years by taking every speaking opportunity, a whip's delight. This saw her contribute on debates ranging from ranging from Aboriginal affairs, social welfare, health and education to broadcasting, employment, defence and national security. When Bill Hayden became opposition leader after the 1977 election loss, she became the first woman to serve in Labor's shadow ministry. And her portfolios over the next six years included communications, the arts and media and later Aboriginal affairs. Perhaps most significantly though, in 1979 she also gained responsibility for women's affairs. The predecessor in the role had been a man. Imagine a man serving in the women's affairs of portfolio in any modern political party. When do you, would you have to go back to? Anyway, she would hold this portfolio in opposition and in government for nearly a decade until her resignation in 1988. Labor entered the 1980 ca campaign with a program for women called Towards Equality. And we made gains at this election, not enough to take government but gains that delivered new female parliamentarians to the rank. However, to the ranks. However, these were offset by the defeat of others, mostly as a result of internal pre-selections that saw men take the place of women. This became one of the many impetuses for the introduction of affirmative action provisions within Labor, first for internal positions and eventually for parliament. Affirmative action is part of why I am in this place today. And I was proud to take Susan's legacy on affirmative action forward. With my dear friend Sharon Jackson, the then member for Hasluck, at the 2002 Special Rules Conference, we changed the rules to ensure more talented women got into the parliament. And Labor now has more women than men in the Senate. And that is the reason why the, reason why the majority of senators in this place are women for the first time in Australian history. There are many opposite who argue that affirmative action is unnecessary and undermines the principle of merit-based selections. I recall that catch cry from some of the Liberal Party, quote a girl. I'll leave it to others to judge the extent to which merit is the key metric for the selection of all of those opposite. Affirmative action recognises that structural change is required to achieve equality. It recognises that power doesn't just fall into the hands of those who haven't had it for much of the course of human history. After the 1980 election, the Fraser government no longer had control of the Senate, and Susan Ryan used this opportunity to pursue two significant private senators' bills. The first of these was legislation that sought to implement anti-discrimination and affirmative action measures for women. This approach garnered support, fanned substantial media debate and committed Labor to action. And whilst that bill did not progress into law, Susan had started the fire, and she would not stop until all of us were guided by its light. 
The second bill related to her portfolio of Aboriginal affairs and sought to, affairs and sought to provide land tenure to First Nations people living on reserves in Queensland. At the time, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander citizens in Queensland were more thoroughly dispossessed than in any other part of Australia. With the backing of the Labor caucus and cross-party support, Susan Ryan confronted the blatant racism of the BLQ Peterson regime head-on. This time, the bill passed the Senate. Only the 30th private senator's bill to do so since Federation, but did not get a vote in the House of Representatives. And whilst progress on land rights was not as quick as Susan Ryan had hoped, there is no doubt she helped to spur momentum. <clears throat> when the Hawke government took office in 1983, Susan Ryan became the first female cabinet minister in Labor history. She was appointed Minister for Education and Youth Affairs and Minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women. She set about implementing the feminist agenda she had envisioned. At the top of this was to bring her private senator's bill on sex discrimination into law. That the Sex Discrimination Act passed the parliament in the first year of the Hawke government speaks volumes about Susan Ryan's advocacy and the impact of capacity to transform ideas into action. It has become common in some quarters to dismiss many of the policy achievements of the Hawke government as some kind of bipartisan project that was shared across the parliament. That is plainly inaccurate. The Sex Discrimination Act encountered significant opposition, both inside and outside the parliament, because of the magnitude of its reform. It's hard to remember that at this time it was not unlawful to discriminate in this country on the basis of sex and employment, education, accommodation and the provision of goods and services. A woman's credit rating and earning capacity weren't enough to get a loan from a bank. She could only secure credit if a husband or a father took responsibility. Landlords refused to rent homes to single mothers. Community clubs throughout the country were able to bar women. Women were sacked because of their age, marital status or pregnancy. All of these injustices and inequalities were in the sights of Susan Ryan. She called the Sex Discrimination Act, and I quote, probably the most useful thing I've done in my life. I think that was a serious understatement. It is hard to imagine life in this country without it, or indeed an argument against it. Every woman and every girl has benefited from Susan Ryan's leadership. Nevertheless, the opposition was fierce. <coughs> Indeed, 38 Conservative members and senators voted against it, including the then leader of the National Party and one Liberal MP who went on to be a Howard Government Minister. The Sex Discrimination Act was followed by the Affirmative Action Act, which became law in 1986. At, the, at that time, the Australian labour market was the, no sex segregated in the OECD. The Act ensured women in the workforce had the opportunity to be recruited, trained and promoted on an equal basis with men. Susan Ryan heralded it not, not just as one of the biggest single steps forward in Australia's history for equality of opportunity for women in the workplace, but as a model of consensus decision-making consistent with the Hawke government's overall approach. In parallel to these, and other achievements for Australian women. Susan Ryan was also making significant inroads in education policy. When she started as a minister, just three in 10 Australians completed high school. By the time Labor left office, eight in 10 students finished school. Because of the change she and the Labor government of which she was a part started. In her four years as minister, Susan created over 36,000 places in higher education, four and a half times the number created in the last four years of the Fraser government. She also strongly argued against the reintroduction of tertiary fees at significant personal political cost. Susan believed in education as a tool for social justice. She recognised its importance in lifting people out of poverty. On her retirement, Bob Hawke reflected that she had been a minister who drove rapid change and fundamental reform, and she remains Australia's second longest serving minister for education. In a final year, she also served as special minister of state and in other roles whilst retaining her position in relation to as minister assisting the PM on the status of women. 
until her departure in 1988. In the 30 years after she left Parliament, Susan Ryan will continue to make a substantial public contribution and held various roles in the private sector. She was recognised in 1990 with the award of Officer in the Order of Australia for her contribution to this parliament. She held various roles in the superannuation sector. She continued to work for human rights and in July 2011 was appointed our first age discrimination commissioner and in 2014 disability discrimination commissioner. She brought a particular, fo particular focus to the economic security of women. She also served as pro-chancellor of the UNSW and her interest in seeing Australia becoming a republic led to her taking on the role of deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement from 2000 to 2003. Mr President, Senators, Susan Ryan broke new ground in Australian politics and unsurprisingly she endured misrepresentation and abuse. She had to cut through the predictable and tiresome preoccupation of public commentators, even her colleagues, with how she looked and her marital status. We need only to reflect on how other female political leaders have been treated, and I think especially of Prime Minister Gillard, to recognise that Australian politics and public discourse still has much further to travel. 36 years after the passage of the groundbreaking Sex Discrimination Act, we continue to see gross underrepresentation of women across our society. And I have returned to the structural nature of inequality and discrimination. Many who have power in society like to believe it is because they earned it. It's because they are the most talented and the most worthy. But you know what? More often than not, they started out with power. And that means others started without it. And unless we take action, unless we make deliberate policy decisions, those structures will stay in place, recreating themselves generation after generation. And not only is that unjust to those who started without power and remain disadvantaged from birth to death, it is a great loss to us all. It is a great loss to society because people have talents and abilities that never see the light of day. In acknowledging all of Susan's many achievements, she would also expect me to point out some of what remains to be done. Because across this country we find more women in lower paying jobs and more in precarious employment resulting in women finding it harder to be economically independent. Susan Ryan's wisdom help us give us the, some of the tools to see how much more there is still to be done. The organisation we now know as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency tells us that the full-time remuneration gender pay gap is at 20.8 per cent, meaning men, men working full-time earn 25,600 plus on average a year more than women working full-time. The full-time based salary gender pay gap is 15.5 per cent. You see, as Susan observed, society was built by men for men. And that is why Labor women understand there is a limit to leaning in. We need to break down the structural barriers that block women's full participation and equality in Australia. We already have women retiring with 47 per cent less superannuation than men. Around three quarters of the Australians who have been forced to withdraw from their super this year are women. That is not empowerment, that is impoverishment. Women over 55 are the fastest growing group of people at risk of homelessness in Australia. Women over 60 represent the largest cohort on job seeker. And without access to affordable childcare, many parents will be forced to give up or turn down work. And we know that it is a sacrifice most often taken by women. Study after study has shown that affordable childcare would increase women's workforce participation. This budget, which should have been a blueprint for our economic future beyond the pandemic, does nothing to increase women's participation, nothing to, in to tackle insecure work or improve access to childcare, nothing to redress the gender pay gap or shrinking super balances, and no plan to help women and their children escaping family violence, and a cabinet with Susan Ryan at the table would never have made those decisions. She would never have acquiesced. And she taught those Labor women who have followed her not to acquiesce either. She was the first, but her legacy in this nation will last. Not just in the law she wrote, but among the Labor women who follow her because we will continue the project of building a truly equal Australia. Our entire movement mourns the loss of one of our greatest. 
And as we mourn her passing and in closing, I once again extend my personal sympathies and the sympathies of all my colleagues to Susan Ryan's family, to Rory, Justine and Benedict, and Amir and her many friends. I spoke with Justine earlier today. She spoke of how completely her mother dedicated her life's work to the labour movement. Susan Ryan was more than an effective legislator, although she was certainly that. She really wanted to make Australia better. Justine told me how she recently found her mother's first campaign T-shirt, which declared a woman's place is in the House and in the Senate. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this chamber today, and looking at those behind me, it is clear that is yet another campaign that Susan Ryan won. Yeah. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I rise today to express condolences on behalf of the Australian Greens to the family, friends and colleagues of the Honourable Susan Ryan AO. And I'd like to associate uh, our party with the remarks that have been made already about this remarkable woman. Um, as has been said, former Senator Susan Ryan was a trailblazer for women's representation in parliament and gender equality in all workplaces. I imagine she would have been pleased to see that just this week the Senate has finally reached the point of being majority women, with the arrival of our Green Senator Lydia Thorpe, uh, a proud First Nations woman, on Tuesday to this place. Um, Susan Ryan once said of her motivation for entering politics, I felt from the youngest possible age that it was unfair, intolerable really, that females were regarded as second-class citizens. That was going to be the big thing that I wanted to change. And so she did. She helped establish the women's electoral lobby. She was elected to parliament as a single mother and became the first woman in the ALP cabinet. She was the first minister for the status of women and she set her sights on dismantling gender equality, uh, inequality. I should say. She introduced the first women's budget impact statement in 1984, which persisted until 2014, when former Prime Minister and one-time Minister for Women, Tony Abbott, axed it. Her work to introduce the Sex Discrimination Act was a crucial reform that has continued to shape Australian society. In abuse that will be familiar to many of the women in this place, conservative sectors called Susan Ryan radical and targeted her as Australia's feminist dictator. And yet these are the things she was trying to change. Making it unlawful to sack a woman because she got married or pregnant. Making it unlawful to sack someone just because they were a woman. Making it unlawful to sexually harass your staff. Providing paid parental leave. Allowing women to get home loans. And increasing women's participation in university. Today it would be completely unacceptable for those basic inequalities to persist. And the change in that attitude is a testament to the work that Susan did. Anne Summers' tribute to Susan noted the brutal reality of politics, noting that Susan's remarkable policy wins were often more hard won than, it is, than is appreciated today and seldom achieved without what were often excruciating compromises. Again, this is something with which many in this place are familiar. Too often, women are expected to compromise. While much remains to be done to achieve gender equality, Susan's pioneering efforts built the platform to, for progress to continue to be made. Um, I and the Australian Greens pay tribute to her fortitude, resilience and determination and thank her for opening the door for a better Australia for women and girls. A woman's place is in the House and the Senate and the Cabinet. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, I too rise um, today, but particularly I rise representing the Minister for Women, uh, the Honourable Maurice Payne, um, who is unable to be here today. But uh, I would also like to have the remarks, my remarks, associated with others in this place, and also the remarks that were made by the Prime Minister um, in his condolence motion for the Honourable Susan Ryan AO. Um, in the past 45 years since Susan Ryan was elected, much has changed for the representation of women in this place. When Susan Ryan entered this House in 1975, she became just one of six women in the upper house. And uh, as has been said by those before me, her election slogan at that time was a woman's place is in the Senate. And uh, today that is absolutely true. Um, and she also, um, you know, it was a very much a year, an early pronouncement of the passionate advocate for women that Susan Ryan was to become. 
Whilst I, I didn't know Susan Ryan, I have no doubt that she would be very pleased with the representation uh, that we see in this place today, with more women than men now representing the Australian people in the Senate. Over in the House of Representatives, at the time Susan was elected, that there was no women. Uh, and not only that, there were no women leaders or ministers in any state parliament in Australia. Uh, and from what I hear, there was constant confusion about who Susan was. Um, most young women in Parliament House were secretaries and assistants, and people would often ask uh, Susan which senator that she worked for. I can't imagine the kind of response that they might have got to asking that question. But Susan focused on the job at hand, uh, ignoring the commentary and learning the ropes, and has become now known as one of the great trailblazers for this Senate for women. Um, she was also clearly one, someone who was determined never to become a single-issue po politician. Um, during those early years, she spoke on an incredible range of topics during her speeches, the questions in you know, Senate committee work, talked about the environment, she talked about Indigenous issues, telecommunications, tax reform, urban planning, amongst many other things. And with an extraordinary broad range of interests um, and clearly a focus on the community, she was rightfully proud and excited when she was sworn as a minister in 1983, the first woman in a federal Labor cabinet. Many of us have seen um, the group photos of Susan with, uh, with all her male colleagues at the time, and I think it is absolutely a true reflection of what this place was like back in those days. But she combined her 12 years um, here uh, as a role of senator, um, also um, as a senator for the ACT, but also as a mother. Um, and she managed to balance these two roles, as many people now do these days, without even a thought. So um, her trailblazing um, as a mother and a senator and delivering on behalf of the Australian people is certainly a great accomplishment that she should always be rec uh, recognised for. But also, as the Minister for Education and Youth Affairs, um, she achieved many, many significant achievements, uh, not the least of which was the significant increase in the Year uh, 12 retention rates. She was also uh, the minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women for almost half a decade, a position proudly held today by the Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Women, the Hon. Maurice Payne, whose uh, remarks today um, are being delivered uh, by me as well. Um, Susan was the architect of the Sex Discrimination Act, uh, which made sexual harassment illegal for the first time and outlawed discrimination on the basis of sex, marital status and pregnancy. Um, characteristically, after leaving this parliament, uh, Susan kept on looking for ways that she could make Australia better, a better place for everyone. She became our first ever age discrimination commissioner, and she also served as the disability uh, discrimination commissioner too. From 2000 to 2007, she was the president of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and the chancellor of the University of New South Wales for over a decade. These roles in post-politics -pol life allowed Susan to follow her passion of helping people, transcending limitations and overcoming constraints, and a focus on all people equally. Susan was a powerhouse, a lively and energetic part of Australia's national story and absolutely a true groundbreaker. Susan's sudden death was a shock to many. While I did not know Susan personally, I know that as a parliament the memory of Susan as a woman leader uh, will be honoured right from well into the future. I know uh, the Minister for Women would have been, liked to have been here today to make remarks and associate herself with the condolence motions being given today, because I know that Susan played a very, very important role uh, in Minister Payne's life, and she, as she did for so many other women in this parliament. Without a doubt, every one of us here today is a beneficiary of the legacy that she leaves us. So to her partner, to her children uh, and to her friends and her close ones, we offer our heartfelt condolences. To Susan, we give you our thanks. I'll go to Senator McKenzie and then I'll come to you, Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Mr President. As Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I rise today to acknowledge the passing of former Senator and Minister, the Hon. Susan Ryan, and associate the National Party, obviously, uh, with the comments of um, senators and, and leaders here today. Whilst uh, we can argue the toss on structural change or cultural change when it comes to 
women's changing and evolving role in society and in parliament as one of the key institutions of our liberal democracy. Um, I think all of us in this chamber uh, can be very proud of, uh, albeit our different approaches, uh, to increasing the number of women's involvement in parliamentary life and in public debate and, and how that will actually have flow-on benefits into the broader community. Uh, but for Senator Susan Ryan to be the first uh, means that uh, the burden is heavier and you need to get it just right so that there will be successive uh, women after you. And uh, I just I think it's amazing um, what she was able to achieve. Um, the slogan I think that Senator Wong mentioned, a woman's places in the uh, the Senate, at the House and the Senate, was um, a T-shirt I was given also on getting pre-selected. So I think it resonates um, with a lot of us that that get here um, that slogan. And I, you know. I think her, that being the first woman to hold a ministerial office uh, is something to note. Also that she championed education uh, to the point it is the National Party constituency that really benefited from uh, that increase in higher education places uh, and that increase in year 12 attainment. Um, previously, previous to uh, the Hawke government's reforms, really um, the percentage of Australian uh, young people that headed off to university was quite um, it was incredibly small and predominantly came from uh, elite families in capital cities uh, and so really opening that up uh, increased the enfranchisement and the inclusion of uh, people that don't go to grammar schools uh, which is also a good thing um, and I say that as a proud grammarian but uh, you know that that's, uh, that was a great reform. Um, her lasting legacy, though, is the landmark Sex Discrimination Act and the Affirmative Action Act. And I think uh, you know, Senator Waters has, has stood up and proudly proclaimed uh, how many uh, female senators uh, the Greens have, and, and I know uh, the Labor Party has some structural mechanisms to ensure that uh, they, they get um, a certain number of, of female senators and, and House representatives in this place. But for a party like the National Party uh, to actually proudly stand here and have 80 per cent of our senators to be female uh, without a structural readjustment but with actually a grassroots uh, full enfranchisement of our membership voting for every single one of the strong, articulate, intelligent women that our divisions have sent here, I think speaks more broadly um, to what we can all do on both sides of the chamber to increase the diversity of our parliament and that we come here with different value systems, obviously, and therefore represent the broader Australian public. Um, but we can, all do, we can all do better in our own uh, ways. So when she came to the Senate in 1975, there were just six women. And I think, Senator Rustin, you made great commentary about how um, this chamber really reflects uh, the work of Susan Ryan and all who have gone after her uh, on both sides of the ministry uh, to increase the inclusion of women. Um, also being a single mum and a minister is pretty tough. And uh, to be the first person that did that way before uh, you know, partners might have chosen to look after kids or that there was even childcare available, I think is quite an incredible um, feat and speaks to her determination and strength to represent her community and her government. Sympathies uh, to her uh, family and friends uh, and Vale Susan Ryan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Zazelja. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I, as a Senator for the ACT, uh, want to pay a special tribute to uh, the Honourable Susan Ryan uh, and send condolences to her family and to her loved ones. Um, it is interesting, as has been pointed out, uh, Susan Ryan, uh, like a couple of us in this chamber, uh, had a background first uh, in what was the precursor to the ACT Legislative Assembly, as, as Senator 
Gallagher and myself uh, did uh, before going on to represent the ACT uh, and having the great honour to represent the ACT as a senator uh, from 1975 as the first of one of the, as one of the two uh, first two uh, senators representing the Australian Capital Territory and it's great to follow in the footsteps of others um, and and we talk about the legacy uh, of Susan Ryan in terms of being a trailblazer for women and we've seen that obviously uh, in the ACT Legislative Assembly uh, we've seen a number of uh, female chief ministers we've seen them on both sides with Rosemary Follett. Uh, we saw it, of course, with Kate Carnell uh, on the Liberal side, with Senator, uh, now Senator Katie Gallagher, as, of course, as well, uh, and a number in senior positions. And I make the point, a similar point to what was made in terms of uh, female representation as we celebrate the fact that there are a majority in the Senate. In the ACT Legislative Assembly, we see the same. Uh, and in fact, uh, we see it on both sides. We see both uh, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party uh, having a, a majority of women in the ACT Legislative Assembly uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, we've gotten there through different parts. Uh, the ACT Liberals have chosen not to get there uh, through the use of quotas, uh, but we do believe uh, that we have outstanding representatives uh, one way or another, and, uh, and it's been a great privileged to see that uh, and see that evolution, and I think in Canberra we see it uh, most particularly. Uh, in, of course, in um, her opportunities that she had to serve uh, in the Hawke ministry, uh, first as the minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women, uh, and then of course as the Minister for Education. Some of those achievements in both of those portfolios have been touched on, but uh, one of the ones in education, uh, which I think uh, Susan Ryan was of course most proud of, was changes to the Year 12 retention rate, and so I'd commend uh, that work. Uh, she later uh, had, a, had a very distinguished career, of course, um, after politics, uh, after leaving uh, this place and going on to a number of very important positions, a number of which have been mentioned, including in universities and superannuation, uh, and as it, as the Age Discrimination Commissioner, and it was in that role. Um, so Susan Ryan was uh, one of my senators when I was growing up here in Canberra, uh, uh, along with the great uh, Margaret Reid, uh, former president of the Senate. Uh, we were well represented, uh, and so I didn't know her in that role. Uh, obviously, as a as a young uh, boy uh, growing up in the 1980s, uh, she was one of the senators representing me. But I did have the opportunity to meet her uh, in that later role as Age Discrimination Commissioner. And I did find her to be a, a thoroughly decent, a, a highly engaging, uh, highly intelligent, uh, very impressive human being. But uh, I also found that, you know, given her reputation, uh, I was quite struck uh, by the great humility uh, which she displayed in the way that she dealt uh, with those around her. Um, of course, a couple of those uh, great contributions that have been mentioned that are worth reiterating, uh, the Sex Discrimination Act and the sex making sexual harassment illegal uh, for the first time a, a great step forward and the Affirmative Action Equal Employment Opportunity for Women Act. Uh, now, Susan Ryan once reflected that politics is like diving into the surf and she said you don't linger at the edge, she said you jump in and fight your way through the breakers. Finally, you get to the still deep water beyond. You see if you can catch a wave and ride it to the shore. Few things in life are as exhilarating. When the wave is finished, it's not the end of the story. Uh, can I uh, pay tribute uh, to Susan Ryan's life, uh, to her public legacy, uh, and can I send my condolences to her loved ones, to her friends and family? Uh, may she rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Zizelja. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Ac Acting Deputy President. And my apologies. I you were on the list before, Senator Zazelja. <laughs> An advocate for equality, feminist, trailblazer, the first. These are all attributes mentioned in association with the late Susan Ryan AO. Former Senator Ryan was elected as the first Labor senator for the ACT in 1975. Her slogan at the time was, a woman's place is in the House, in the Senate and everywhere decisions are made. Her path to the Senate is reasonably well known. Susan trained as a teacher and worked in the profession until the birth of her first child. Along with her family, Susan moved to Canberra in 1965 and enrolled as a postgraduate at ANU. 
Despite living overseas and studying, she never lost her passion for education and was appointed as the National Executive Officer for the Australian Council of State School Organisations in 1973. Her involvement in the women's movement, particularly the formation of the women's electoral lobby, convinced her that her fight for equality had to take on a more pointed political approach. So she joined the Australian Labor Party and became, an active, became active on behalf of her local community. A short stint on the non-governing governing ACT House of Assembly preceded her election to this chamber in 1975. Some years after her time in the Senate, she said of her election, and I quote, After being elected in 1975, I joined four women who had already been in the Senate for a short period, Liberal Senators Guilfoyle and Martin and Labor Senators Coleman and Meltzer. Senators, Senators Walters from Tasmania was also elected in 1975, so there were six. Across Kings Hall in the House of Representatives, there were no women. There were no women leaders or ministers in any state parliament. Margaret Guilfoyle became the first and sole female cabinet minister in the Fraser government. Her election was greeted with much media interest, mainly emphasising her gender, her age, her hair colour, marital status she was divorced, physical size and motherhood. There was very little, if any, commentary on her political agenda or policy interests and experience. Susan joined the Shadow Ministry not long after she joined the Parliament. She was a passionate and highly articulate debater and used her time in the Senate to great effect. Her central objective of economic independence for all guided her many achievements as Labor's first female cabinet minister in the Hawke government. Susan's view was that economic independence meant the capacity to provide your own for your own needs and the needs for whom you are directly responsible. She began her wor work in two key areas, tackling discrimination against women and lifting the high school retention rate and increasing funding and places at universities and TAFEs. Just as we take the increased participation and leadership of women in politics and other spheres for granted now, we also assume nearly all high school students will complete year 12. In the years leading up to Susan Ryan being sworn in as Minister for Education in 1983, the high school retention rate in my home state of Tasmania was 27 per cent. Nearly three quarters of Tasmanian's high school students in the early 1980s did not complete Year 12. Susan took a proposal to the National Economic Summit in 1983 that this, that this appalling low rate needed to be lifted to at least two-thirds by 1990. This was overwhelmingly achieved in most states and territories. What flowed from this was an increased demand for places in universities and tapes, a cause she also advanced with passion. Of course, Susan Ryan is remembered for her pioneering sex discrimination bill and the Affirmative Action Bill. Her work highlighting the impact of government and policy decisions on women began much earlier than that. In 1981, from opposition, Susan made a detailed analysis of the effect of the budget on women and published it. From this, the women's budget statement was born. The first official publication of the statement was produced by the Office for the Status of Women in 1984. Her statement announcing this was met with uh, her statement announcing this was met with much derision from some of the then opposition. In fact, the first time the Liberal Party embarked on a similar process was when Dr John Hewson was leader of the opposition. After she left her successful political career, Susan Ryan went on to have an equally successful role in publishing, superannuation and industry. Her great friend, Wendy McCarthy, says of Susan and her work, every 10 years or so she would change careers and we would all follow her and support her. You couldn't help but get caught up with her enthusiasm for reform and change, her generosity and her great sense of fun. In addition to her paid roles, Susan Ryan threw, threw her enthusiasm and commitment into the Australian Republican movement. In more recent times, Australians got to know Susan as our first age discrimination commissioner. 
She brought all the attributes Wendy McCarthy identified and combined them with her deep knowledge and understanding of government and its processes to advocate for real change for older Australians. For a short time, she was also Disability Discrimination Commissioner. Although her role as Age Discrimination Commissioner ended in 2016, Susan's advocacy for older Australians didn't. She was a frequent panellist on television and would happily use whatever platform was offered to highlight her concerns about the treatment of older Australians. In 1990, Susan was appointed as an Officer of the Order of Australia. As with any political career, hers wasn't all smooth sailing, but it was one of incredible achievement. Her friends, colleagues and many associates remember Susan as a frightening, intelligent, politically savvy, funny, optimistic and committed. Susan Ryan really was the life of the Labor Party during her time in Parliament. Generations of Australians, particularly women, have and will follow where she led thanks to her commitment to equality and education reforms, and that is her legacy. From the, ti from the time of her community involvement until her untimely timely death, Susan was a true feminist. Some time ago, someone asked her about post-feminism. In typical Susan style, she replied, I struggle with postmodernism in architecture, literature and literary criticism, and I think that post-feminism is uncalled for. <laughs> Along with all the members of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party, I extend my condolences to Susan's partner, Rory, and her two children and her extended family and friends. Can I also place on record my thanks to them for sharing Susan with the Labor Party, the wider Labor movement and our nation? Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill, did you wish to also add some comments? Yes, I do. Thank, thank you very you. much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to rise today and speak on the sudden and tragic passing of former Senator Susan Ryan AO, a former Hawke Cabinet Minister indeed Labor's first female cabinet minister. She was a pioneer in every sense. She broke that glass ceiling in the territory, uh, in this party and in so many areas of civic life following her retirement politics. And she was a loving and proud mum and grandma as well. To her family, I want to say I'm so sorry for your great loss. And I thank you for your great generosity in sharing her with the nation, whose history she changed. I want to associate myself also with remarks of uh, those who've contributed to this condolence motion this afternoon. And I think uh, Senator Wong's framing of the life of Susan Ryan as a critical driver of significant historical change uh, is a very accurate summary of the powerful, powerful impact that Susan Ryan had on our nation. Born in Sydney in 1942, she grew up in the great Labor suburb of Maroubra, achieving a BA at Sydney Teachers College before working as a school teacher, a small business owner and second secretary at the Australian Embassy in Vienna. After moving to Canberra, she graduated with a Master of Arts degree from ANU and became a foundational member of the Belconnen branch of the ALP and the Women's Electoral Lobby, one of countless political actions she would take for the empowerment of Australian women. She was subsequently elected to the ACT House of Assembly in 1975 and before becoming one of the first two senators for the ACT, elected on that much uh, re repeated uh, mantra that's featured in the speeches this afternoon, the unabashedly feminist statement, a woman's place is in the House and the Senate and everywhere decisions are made. She made history as a 33-year-old single mother and eight years later would change history as a pivotal member of the Hawke government. In her role as a cabinet minister, she was able to make those changes for women that were so desperately needed at that time. When Hawke was elected in 1983, she was made Minister for Education and Youth Affairs and the first ever Minister for the Status of Women. She wasted no time and soon set about tearing down the barriers that Australian women had faced four generations. Her landmark work was, of course, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, which sought to eliminate, so far as is possible, discrimination against persons on the ground of sex, 
marital status, pregnancy or potential pregnancy in the areas of work, accommodation, education, the provision of goods, facilities and services, the disposal of land, the activities of clubs and the administration of Commonwealth laws and programs. This wide-ranging act ensured that the rights of women were protected by legislation. It was a giant step forward for women all across the country. This act, along with the Affirmative Action Equal Employment Opportunity for Women Act, embodied the greatest beliefs of the labour movement, that through fair and equitable employment in a fair and equitable society, humanity can flourish and people can build a life worth living. Her tenure as Education Minister was no less successful, with Paul Keating remarking that her great achievement was to lift year 10 retention rates in schools, which was an abysmal 3 in 10 when she took office in 1983, to, the end, to end at 9 in 10 in 1996. This also included the doubling of the number of female graduates from high school. This surely, surely helped pave the way for the economic successes that flowed in the decades after the Hawke and Keating era, as a whole generation of young Australian women transitioned through that schooling into the jobs of the future. She, even after she left parliament, she continued to break ground, as others have said, serving as the first age discrimination commissioner, as Dis disability discrimination commissioner, and as president of the Australian Institute of the Superannuation Trustees, while continuing to campaign for an Australian Republic and an Australian Bill of Rights. Her life was also marked by a long affiliation with her Irish heritage and its wonderful culture. Like myself, she was an Australian of Irish flavour, Catholic and Labor. She remarked that her lifelong desire for social justice was kindled due to the strong values-based teaching she received at a Brigidine school in Sydney. The Brigidines are a teaching order of nuns founded in Ireland in the 19th century who contributed significantly to Catholic education in Australia. Several decades later, uh, Susan was awarded the Lifetime Achievement of the Bridget Award by an, uh, the Irish Labor Friendship Women's Group uh, in 2016. Indeed, she was its inaugural awardee uh, of that award named after the very St Bridget, uh, whose values and philosophy inspired uh, the Bridget E. nuns who taught Susan. Susan's love of Ireland and the Irish people was profound and a hallmark of her entire life. I'm advised by my good friend uh, Dermot Ryan, who I know is a good friend also of Senator uh, Tony Sheldon, uh, is preparing an obituary for the Irish Times um, and Susan's family uh, tree connects her back to County Wexford. Uh, this is an important thing to Irish people. It's not just enough to be from Ireland, you have to be from a particular county. Even in later life, Susan joined the, the annual Irish Winter School in Sydney to learn the Irish language in order, she said, to be able to fit in when she visited the country. She championed the project to erect a monument to the Great Irish Famine in Sydney, which commemorated the thousand of Irish women who escaped the famine by emigrating to Australia, and, and she spoke at the fifth annual comm commemoration ceremony in 2004. Susan was also a member and a speaker at the Ashling Society, an Irish-Australian cultural group. She was a frequent supporter and patron of Apunsky's Theatre in Sydney, and in 2019 was named one of the top 100 Irish-Australians of all time by the Irish Echo, up there with Paul Keating, Ben Chifley and John Curtin. It's not surprising that the last conversation I had with Susan Ryan earlier this year was at an Irish event around St Patrick's Day. It was to mark the 20th year of the presence of the Irish Consulate in Sydney and uh, convened by the Consul General there, uh, Owen Feeney. It was to celebrate 20 historical Australian Irish uh, figures. As she always did, Susan took the time to talk to everyone in the room. She took me aside and as she had done on many occasions, she encouraged me, she supported me, she understood me as only a woman in the great Labor Party can. Susan's legacy will be felt by generations of Australians to come, and her example will shine to all Australian women. Her work will live on as the best example 
of Australians' belief in a fair go for all, no matter the circumstances of your birth. She was a credit to this chamber, to the great Australian Labor Party and to the nation. I echo the words of the Brigidine sisters who gave their thanks across the Brigidine uh, International Network last week for Susan's rich life, for her public service to Australia, and I, like them, offer my sincere sympathy to her family and friends. Vale, Susan Ryan, you are already missed. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, today I rise, along with many others, to make some personal remarks and pay tribute to the wonderful Susan Ryan. The strength of her legacy uh, is immeasurable and it is um, indelible in my own life as I reflect on, uh, as a young woman uh, completing her high school education in the 1980s, uh, with that lift in retention rates across the country uh, for girls and uh, indeed uh, young working class men in particular. Along with that came a much greater diversity of subjects that we could study and greatly improved quality of education uh, that indeed has had a long-term legacy. My mother had great respect for Susan Ryan. Um, my mother, Sandra, was also an early member of the women's electoral lobby. As a woman, she struggled with being unable to get a home loan in her own name uh, and being paid less than men uh, at a lower hourly rate uh, within the same profession. So, as a woman in the Labor Party, uh, as a, someone who joined in the early 1990s, uh, at the end of Susan's parliamentary career, it was one of those. Uh, she was indeed an inspiration for me uh, to join the Great Australian Labor Party. But my own knowledge of Susan indeed comes through my work in this place, in particular with her work at the Australian Human Rights Commission as uh, the Age Discrimination Commissioner. And her enormous capacity to understand intersecting human rights debates uh, uh, has been of great benefit to the nation, uh, right from her participation in these debates in the 1960s and 70s, right through to her work as Age Discrimination Commissioner. She made some remarks while she was the uh, Age Discrimination Commissioner to an event called the Homosexual Histories Conference back in 2014. And uh, she said in good humour there, she said, um, I'm in some, some senses an unlikely candidate as an advocate for homosexual law reform. As a young heterosexual woman coming of age in post-war Australia, educated in a strict and conservative Catholic environment, I didn't really know much about homosexuality until well into adulthood. In fact, we were not taught much about sexuality in general, our own or anyone else's. In that sense, I was very much a product of my generation. Um, she went on to say, uh, talk about how she became involved in debates in gay law reform here in the ACT in very early uh, votes in the 1970s to decriminalise homosexuality uh, and indeed also in abortion uh, law reform uh, debates here. So she was indeed um, active not just in sex discrimination but in disability discrimination, in sexuality uh, and uh, gender identity discrimination throughout her career. Uh, in, as, the, as the Age Discrimination Commissioner, she was also at the Human Rights Commission at a very important point in time for the LGBTI community when this parliament under the Labor government considered the reforms to the Sex Discrimination Act, to amend the Sex Discrimination Act uh, so that uh, not only did it cover sex discrimination, but it also dis uh, covered sexuality, gender identity uh, and uh, being intersex. At that time, I'm very grateful that Susan was the Age Discrimination Commissioner 
because she was really able to help see the way through the enabling of the exemptions to that Sex Discrimination Act uh, being lifted out of aged care so that you can no longer discriminate uh, against someone because of their sexual orientation, gender identity or intersex status uh, in aged care uh, services and facilities here in Australia anymore. This is a principle that needs to extend across all Commonwealth uh, and community services so that there aren't exemptions for uh, any primary service that should be someone's right to access. So I am profoundly uh, grateful for the inspiration of Susan Ryan's life. And as I have listened to people today talk about her colour and vibrancy as a person, I'm also reminded really of how dig, deep she had to dig in order to continue that work. And it's a great inspiration to me to know that in a tough week and on a tough day, uh, in politics and in this chamber, you can really see what a difference uh, one person can make to our national fabric. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, if there are a Senator Seward. You, um, Sorry, Acting Senator Sheldon. I shall give precedence to Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. And I, I will be brief because um, people have said so many wonderful things about Susan Ryan. And I firstly would like to offer my condolences to uh, Susan's uh, family, friends, and colleagues. I'd be so bold as to say every woman in Australia has benefited from the work that Susan Ryan did. And I. I think there's a number of young women today that don't, still don't really get or believe that women were forced to resign. Some women were forced to resign when they got married. Some women had to get their sons to go guarantors for loans. Women were just subject to, I think, nowadays, things that younger women Sort of, well, they appreciate um, the, uh, the strides that have been made. They, they don't get that people like Susan put so much effort into achieving those changes. And one of the things that I and I wanted to go to the work, which is where I um, did some work with uh, Susan Ryan, is when she was the Age Discrimination Commissioner. Um, I believe that she carried on her excellent work that she had done in this place and many other places as the Age Discrimination Commissioner. She was the inaugural uh, commissioner and really got it, really got how um, older people are being discriminated against still in many areas, including in aged care. And I was part of that discussion, having been the aged care spokesperson on those issues and worked with. Um, some very close friends in Western Australia on, on that particular issue as well. Um, so I, I'd like to particularly comment on that, but also generally in employment. And this is why what the work that Susan was doing is so important right, right now, and that is the discrimination that is still going on for older workers, but also particularly older women workers. They are the fastest growing cohort of those that are unemployed. They are ageing into uh, poverty into, on the, uh, as older women not being able to find work on very low income support payments. They're ageing into the um, poverty uh, as they um, wait to be able to move on to the age pension, using up all their, their savings. It's absolutely imperative that these issues are dealt with. And Susan knew that. She was working on that. She held forums, and I attended some of those, in terms of how do, we, how do we work with business and with employers to ensure that older workers are, are taken on, um, and raising those issues, and, and always, always there were the issue around older women. Um, and then, as has also been pointed out, um, she then became the um, disability um, Dis, uh, discrimination Commissioner as well, taking the same—and again, I had that portfolio at the time 
taking the same gusto into those issues, disability discrimination issues as well. Um, not only did we have a number of discussions, and, and Susan uh, was very active throughout the country, but also asking questions across the estimates table um, when she was commissioner, and she was, she was also always very glad and uh, in, in, and to talk about the issues across the estimates table. Um, she made an enormous contribution to this country, particularly to the women of this country. She'll be remembered for, um, for all the work uh, that she did. And it also reminded me um, in terms of some of the things from your childhood and your young adulthood that you take with you your whole life. And the work that she did, I, I have taken with me all, throughout my life. And um, it was an honour to be able to, at, just in a small degree, work with her on these really important issues. So, um, Vale, Susan Ryan, you won't be forgotten. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. All of us women of the Senate stand here on the shoulders of a magnificent woman, Susan Marie Ryan. When she was elected to one of the two newly created ACT Senate seats in 1975, as, as I think everyone in this place has said, she was campaigned on the slogan, A Women's Place is in the Senate. And it is. In fact, the only Labor senators from Tasmania are women. We're all women. How very pleased she must have been when the Senate finally achieved gender equality a little over a year ago. How much we owe her. Many adjectives have been used to describe Susan, whose Senate career from 75 to 86 was only part of a long and multifaceted working life dedicated to equality and human rights. She has been described as a luminary, a fierce champion, a trailblazer, a feminist hero and a labour giant. She was all these things and more. And she will be remembered as a fierce champion for women's rights and others discriminated, other discriminated Australians after her sudden death just 11 days ago. Those before me have outlined her groundbreaking positions and work as a minister in the Hawke government, so I won't go over that. But Labor leader Anthony Albanese has said that she changed Australia for the better, and I do agree with that. This is something that we must all aspire to. In her lifetime, she saw and influenced incredible changes. We must not forget a world where women were pillarised for seeking elected office, where women could be sacked simply for falling pregnant, where equal pay was a faraway dream, where the idea of a woman taking up a blue-collar trade or becoming a CEO was unheard of, in fact shunned. And rights for older Australians and those living with disability were barely imaginable. Many of these things today that we take for granted were issues which were championed by Susan and she stood up to years of vilification because of this work. Paul Keating said her great achievement was to set in motion lifting Year 12 retention rates from 3 in 10 in 83 to 9 in 10 by 96. This revolutionised education in Australia, most particularly for girls, he said, and he was correct. The best thing all 38 of us, all today's Sen uh, women senators, can do is to pledge that we will pursue her leg legacy. We will confront the obstacles and rise above them. We owe Susan Ryan a debt best paid by redoubling our commitment to equality for all Australians, a commitment to not seeing older workers thrown on the trash heap because of a recession, to not seeing Australians with disability ignored, denied opportunity and resources, to ensure that discrimination does not hobble the lives of Australian women and to ensure that regardless of your sexual orientation, gender, cultural background, eth ethnicity, age or ability, you get a fair go in this country we love. I want to personally thank Susan Ryan, not because I knew her well, but because without her example, her voice, her steady hand, her carefully considered and articulate arguments, I simply may not be here. And my daughter and hundreds of thousands of Tasmanian women, older Tasmanians and Tasmanians living with a disability may not have had the education and opportunities they've had today. In saying that, I note that the job is not done. 
with recession upon us and so many young Australians wondering where they will find a place in life, with so many older Australians worried about being left out of the workforce and others frightened that their retirement and old age may not be one where they will have the resources to allow them to live with dignity and receive the care that they need. And so many Australians living with disability still denied the opportunity to fully participate in society. And Austra uh, Indigenous Australians still denied the voice and opportunity that is rightfully theirs. With the cost of obtaining an education moving out of reach for many and the cost of childcaring leaving many women unable to carve out a career of their dreams. And is, there is still much, so much more to struggle for and to win. And we will do that with our path illuminated by the bright light held in Susan Ryan's steady, intelligent, guiding hands. My sincere condolences to her partner, Rory Sutton, her children and all who loved her. Thank you, Senator Burke. It's Senator Sheldon, who's been patiently waiting. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to honour the life of Susan Ryan, architect of the World Leading Discrimination Act, first female Labor cabinet minister and icon for social justice in Australia. The woman, who, the woman who, as education minister, more than doubled the high school retention rate, including for girls. One of, one of our best fighters talks volumes of her values and capacity when you look at the fact that she works so hard for the rights of humanity, women and men, the able and disabled, and most recently for older Australians and Australians living with disabilities as Age and Discrimination Commissioner and Disability, sorry, Age and Disability, Disability and Discrimination Commissioner. And of course, a, mo a major ally to the increase in the voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and young people. Of course, how sorry we are we can't get to hear her views this week on the Coalition's federal budget, a budget which has had its two biggest failings, the ignoring of the impact of this recession on women and older workers. Susan Ryan died suddenly last week. We should never forget that she has done for all Australians by making our society fairer, more inclusive, more willing to back in the aspirations of all women and men and their families. She's lived a life of firsts. Her Irish working class parents, Florence and Francis, worked as sales assistants and a public servant. She was the first in her family to go to university. She was the first in her school to win a scholarship to university. It is a stark reminder to all of us how unequal our society was when at the time she was then forced to pay back, pay back that scholarship because she got married. We should all remember that it was not long ago that all women had to resign from the public service when they got married and that they could be fired from any job when they became pregnant. She was also, of course, the first female member of the Labor cabinet when she joined the Hawke cabinet in 1983 as Education and Youth Affairs Minister. Even when she left the parliament, she kept fighting for the rights and power of working people. She was deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement from 2000 to 2003. And of course, there was her important work on strengthening superannuation. In her seven years as the president of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees until 2007, she fought for the right for all Australians to have access to a dignified retirement and for super funds to continue to play a role in democratising financial systems in Australia. Acting Deputy President, we have come a long way since the 1950s and 60s where Susan Ryan was educated as a Bridgetine Catholic in the Bridgetine Catholic College in Sydney's eastern suburbs, where a passion for social justice was encouraged and where she was a brilliant debater and a fearless advocate for her schoolmates but we must never forget how hard it was to get even basic employment protections for women and how stubborn inequalities persist in Australia still, like the gender pay gap and the harassment and discrimination experienced by women every day in our workplaces and institutions. I want to say something about dogged activism of Susan Ryan as well. She was a respected legislator and a pragmatic political operator 
but of pragmatism and wily role in Cabinet was first and foremost in the service of her ideals. She did not court power for its own sake. She focused on outcomes and she often clashed with her Cabinet colleagues on points of principle. She worked hard across the factions and across the aisle to give all working people real power to shape their own destinies. She was also loved for a sense of humour. In Susan's memoirs, Catching the, the Waves Life uh, in and out of politics, I'm, she said, I am by temperament quite gregarious, but the combination of my gender and my politics meant the position I occupied most often was that of a shag on a rock. Well, however, now, due to her de determination and drive, she is no longer isolated and she has exposed many people who adore her now and share her views and are determined to continue her accomplishments. I also want to share an anecdote from a good friend of mine that Susan was also a good mate of, uh, Dermot Ryan, uh, which my colleague mentioned before Dermot, um, a very active uh, person in the Irish Labor uh, groups within Australia and now um, uh, has just recently written a tribute uh, to uh, Susan. And he said this in uh, a tribute he recently wrote, what we really stood out for was shared memories of her warmth and her sense of fun and mischief. At social events she moved seamlessly from singing a hymn to singing the International. She was a committed Australian Republican and was also on, uh, an Irish Republican. Whenever we met she would cheekily address me as Comrade Ryan, my favourite Irish Unionist. Uh, knowing full well, of course, the Unionist was, has a very different meaning in Australia to Ireland. My own late mother, having shared her name, I would retort, hello there, my second favourite Susan Ryan. A fighter for a just society for women and men, Susan Ryan has earned a place in the hearts of the labour movement and all Australians. I offer my condolences and solidarity to her family and friends. Vale, Susan Ryan. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Lyons. Thank you. I do rise uh, to associate my comments in relation to the passing of Susan Ryan with all senators in here, although I would have to say, um, unlike Senator um, Sheldon and O'Neill, uh, I'm neither Catholic nor Irish, um, but nevertheless I have a place in the Labor Party. Susan Ryan was first and foremost a feminist. She was a trailblazer, an activist and a republican. She was a first in so many fields, but none, in my view, as important as being elected as the first female senator for the ACT and to go on to be the first woman in the Hawke cabinet. Indeed, when I joined the party in the early 80s, Susan Ryan was there and she was someone that I looked up to uh, in this place all the way from Western Australia and I looked at her in awe. But nevertheless, she showed us uh, as women in the Labor Party that there was a place for us because we could see what we could be. She uh, was truly amazing and the, the, um, the bills that she introduced, the sex discrimination bill in particular, have stood women in good stead, and that has enabled women to really advance in our society. But it is sad, as a number of people have reflected on, that we've still got a long way to go. And um, as a feminist in the Labor Party, Susan certainly made um, pathways for the rest of us. And she would be there. She would. Um, have applauded the fights that we had to get our affirmative action policies in place. And today she would have been honoured when our leader, Mr Albanese, dedicated our, Labor's, uh, our Labor budget statement to Susan Ryan. She was the first to have a particular statement for women. And today, uh, when we uh, launched our statement, it was in honour of Susan Ryan. I met Susan when I was um, the National Assistant Secretary of United Workers' Union in her role as the Age Discrimination um, Commissioner, 
when I uh, had responsibility for aged care in the union. And she was just as strident there as she was a member of the Hawke cabinet. And yes, she was warm, and that certainly came across, but she was fierce in her advocacy. Um, I would like to end my contributions by paying my most sincere condolences to Rory, her partner, her children, Justine and Ben. And to most of all, I say thank you to Susan Ryan for being that feminist, for paving the way for other Labor women. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. I also uh, rise to speak, I think, as the final speaker on this uh, condolence motion for the Honourable Susan, sorry, almost final speaker. Um, no, behind you. For the Honourable Susan Ryan AO, and associate myself with um, all of the uh, previous contributions that have been uh, so lovely um, and um, comforting, I think, in terms of uh, the sudden and tragic passing of Susan within the last fortnight. Susan was not the first woman in this place, but she was a woman of many firsts. She was the first senator for the ACT, the first Labor senator for the ACT, the first Labor woman appointed to a front bench position, and the first Labor woman appointed to a ministry, and of course the first Labor woman to enter cabinet. She achieved all of these firsts in what was as firmly a man's world, joining the federal parliament at a time when only, uh, there were only six women and all were in the Senate. I can only imagine what that was like for her. For me, as a woman in politics, Susan just didn't just pave the way. She actually built the pathway that so many women have now taken, not only to this place in Australia's national parliament, but to so many places, to community organisations, unions, businesses. She, she proved to us that there was a seat at the table for all of us. It's really hard to describe or measure just how much trailblazers or pioneers of the women's movement like Susan Ryan have changed our country for the better. Her achievements, of which there were so many, were vast. Her influence in the parliament for 12 years, of course, her life post-politics, where she kept doing what she'd always done, applying herself to every cause she championed with more than 100 per cent of her energy, bringing people with her, forming coalitions, and really importantly, being strategic about the pathway to victory and the pathway to lasting change. She campaigned for equality for women, for older Australians, for education for all. She was a staunch feminist in the Senate at a time when a lot of people, including some of her own caucus members, probably didn't know what that meant. She formed her political aspirations from second wave feminism, and she knew that women's inequality required a po political solution that would be best enacted by women themselves. Before her parliamentary career, she sought to impact poli political decision-making by helping to form the women's electoral lobby and later became an effective part of the 1972 electoral campaign. But in her own words, this lobbying was necessary but not sufficient. It left women on the outside of political power, waiting, persuading, threatening, but not acting directly to achieve change. How much more efficient, how much more effective if women were in there making the decisions themselves instead of knocking on the doors trying to attract support? Debate on the ill-fated Lamb Mackenzie Abortion Reform Bill in 1973 exemplified the problem. The debate was conducted in an all-male chamber while the women that this law was to affect were outside rallying, organising, shouting through loud hailers, preparing themselves for disappointment. Susan decided that next time she would be in there making the laws. In 1975, she was elected on the famed slogan, A Woman's Place is in the House and in the Senate. But that was just a subset of a much larger mission for Susan, which was that a woman's place was at the table where all the decisions were being made. She became Minister for Education and Youth Affairs when Bob Hawke was elected to office in 1983 and was tasked with the first portfolio on the status of women. At the time, and many speakers have, have reflected on this, women were unlikely to be approved for home loans, faced limited maternity leave provisions, if any, and were able to have their employment legally terminated on the account of marital status or falling pregnant. She sought to change this with her central objective for, for parliament being achieving economic independence for all, including women. 
Perhaps there is no greater example of the nation builder that she was in her pivotal role in two landmark acts, the Sex Discrimination Act and the Equal Employment Opportunity and the Affirmative Action Act. Later in life, she described her advocacy on the Sex Discrimination Act as probably the most useful thing she's done in her life. And uh, today, whilst not perfect by any means, we do generally live in a society that accepts that discrimination on the basis of gender is unlawful. But that wasn't the case during Susan's time in this place, and she, along with her Labor colleagues, some of whom she'd had to convince, set about to change that. Again, I can only imagine the pushback that came from some, uh, both to her personally and professionally, from waging a campaign like that that would have brought on. The nation was changing. Change is always difficult, and she was there helping that change come about. But it would be wrong to suggest or simply describe Susan as a trailblazing pioneer feminist. She was, of course, that, but she was so much more. She was an activist, an organiser, an educator, a senator, a, mender, a mentor, a proud Republican, and, of course, a partner, a mother, a grandmother, a dear friend to so many. She was a com community campaigner, a fighter for equality across the board, an ad advocate for older Australians, a friend of First Nations. She joined organisations, and if they didn't exist, she started them. She was the proud founder of the Belconnen sub-branch of the ACT Labor Party, as I said, a founding member of WELL. She created communities of like-minded people and set about delivering the change that was needed. She drafted laws, campaigned for them, importantly, brought people with her, and of course those laws passed. Her influence and her impact, in the impact of her work in this place is enduring. To me, as a single mum wanting to get involved in politics, she showed me not only that it could be done, but in actual fact that it must be done, that there was an expectation on us to get involved and that it was only by getting involved that change happened. She told me, along with Joan Kerner, that women like me can't vacate the field. We have to step up. They convinced me, a single mother, that it was actually an asset, not a disadvantage, to bring my background to politics and that I would be a better politician uh, because of it. You always knew when Susan was in the room because she had a presence. It was something that's hard to pin down, but it was welcoming, supportive, kind, strong, principled, determined, focused and present. She was always present, and she managed to reject all of that at the one time. So it's hard to believe we won't get to be in the same room with her anymore. But we are given strength and comfort in our knowledge that her reforms, her influence, her legacy, the things she changed, remains all around us, guiding us and reminding us, of course, of the unfinished work before us. To Susan's partner, her family, her children, her grandchildren and so many of her friends who have spoken over the past 11 days or so and who are so deeply uh, grieving at the moment and who remain devastated by her passing, I extend my sincere condolences. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. I would like to rise and add my voice to this condolence motion for the Honourable Susan Ryan AO, and I'd like to associate myself uh, with the many wonderful remarks in this debate. A trailblazer as a senator, as the first woman to hold a cabinet role in a federal Labor government, as Minister for Education and Youth Affairs, and as Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women in the Hawke government and later as Special Minister of State, Susan Ryan was indeed a trailblazer. I remember the mark that she made when I was a young girl and as a young journalist during the time that she successfully steered through the passage of the Sex Discrimination Act. Of course, much has changed in the Australian Senate since Susan Ryan was elected in 1975. My swearing in as a senator in October last year marked the first time that the number of female senators reached 50 per cent. When Susan Ryan was elected, there were only a handful of women senators. In the wake of the tumultuous dismissal of the Whitlam government, she was elected as one of the ACT's two senators 
and observing her from afar as I did, I always got the impression that she was much more of a warrior for women and education than for party politics, and I think this was to her great credit and also, of course, um, very much to her legacy. Uh, her election pitch, as we've heard so often in this debate, was a woman's place is in the House and the Senate and everywhere that decisions are made. But I want to particularly acknowledge Susan Ryan's work in the area of sex discrimination. Uh, in November 1981, Susan had introduced a private senator's bill to outlaw sexual discrimination. And the bill did not pass, but it did pave the way for the sex discrimination bill, which of course was passed uh, eventually uh, in 1983. And the Sex Discrimination Bill also embodied half of um, Susan Ryan's 1981 private bill in seeking to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex, marital status or pregnancy, uh, and also contained provisions outlawing sexual harassment in the workplace and in educational institutions, and provided for redress against individual acts of discrimination. It is, of course, quite difficult to imagine an era where sex discrimination was not actively prohibited uh, at a time, of course, when there was very substantial systemic discrimination levied against women uh, in all sectors of Australian society, whether it be a situation where women were refused a bank loan because they were women, uh, or whether they lost a job because they became pregnant, or whether they were refused entry or service in a hotel. Even joining the Nippers movement as a young surf lifesaver for girls was not an option. Surf lifesaving clubs did not even allow women to join as members until 1980, which is now something that young girls and women could not possibly comprehend. Susan Ryan was a successful champion of causes and her achievements were very considerable. Apart from combating sex discrimination, she oversaw increased funding for women's refuges and for childcare, as well as an increase in the retention rate to year 12 from 35 per cent to 53 per cent during the first four years of the Hawke government. After leaving Parliament, Susan Ryan took on a number of private sector roles before she served as pro-chancellor for the University of New South Wales. She went on to be deputy chair of the Australian Republican Movement, and then uh, in July 2011, she was appointed Australia's first age discrimination commissioner, and in 2014, disability discrimination commissioner. I wish to convey my sincere condolences to her family and friends, and I wish to acknowledge the wonderful contribution that Susan Ryan made to this place, and to the betterment, in particular, of our country, and particularly for Australian women. Vale, Suze, Susan Ryan. Thank you, Senator Henderson. There being no further speakers on the condolence motion, I ask honourable senators to stand and join in a moment of silence to signify assent. The motion is carried. I now move on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Appropriations, Staffing and Security Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Estimates for the Department of the Senate 2020-21, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. My apologies, Senator Smith. Was there Thank something? Thank you. And I, I seek leave to continue my remarks. And you seek leave to continue your remarks. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Smith again. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Deputy Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, Senator Hanson, I present the interim report of the committee and I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Lyons. Thank you. I present the Procedure Committee's second report of 2020 entitled COVID-19 in the Senate and I move that the Senate take note of the report. 
um, Madam Acting Pres Deputy President, on 3 September 2020, the Senate agreed to a resolution moved by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, affirming the right of the Senate to determine its meetings and meetings of its committees. The resolution reminded state and Commonwealth executive officers to have regard to the powers, privileges and immunities of the Senate and senators in devising and implementing public health measures. Wherever possible, where such measures affect the capacity of senators to undertake their parliamentary duties, they should be developed in consultation with representatives of the Senate. The resolution referred consequential matters to the Procedure Committee. The report I have tabled today records the committee's oversight of arrangements to ensure that the sittings and estimates hearings scheduled for the remainder of the year can proceed in a COVID-safe manner. As part of those arrangements, the committee endorsed the continued application of the rules for remote participation during the budget week sitting and noted that estimates hearings were also expected to make extensive use of video participation by both senators and witnesses. Final arrangements would be a matter for committees themselves. The report also identified several operational matters as critical to ensuring that the schedules estimates hearings proceed in a safe manner and is overseeing the development of appropriate protocols for senators, staff and witnesses implementing current health advice. The committee will continue to have a watching brief over these matters as long as it is necessary. The other issue, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, arises in this place from time to time when we have uh, ballots which are necessary. And, uh, we believe, um, and certainly I, as the chair of the Procedures Committee, believe that it is time that we uh, referred to the Procedures Committee the issue of pairs. Uh, when the Senate has to hold a ballot. Um, I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Lyons. If no one else wants to make comment on, uh, to, uh, to take note of a response to that report, I might apologise, Senator Ayres. I'm going to call Senator Polly because I understand she wanted to take note of the family law report that was just tabled. If it's OK with you, is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to the tabling of the interim report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Australian Family Law System in my capacity as a member of that committee. The interim report contains a comprehensive review of the evidence the committee has heard to date. The committee has received a significant amount of evidence covering many issues facing family law in Australia. A total of 1,692 submissions have been received, and the committee has heard from 64 organisations and professionals, 85 individuals in 11 public hearings. With, uh, we also held 13 in-camera hearings. The committee um, has continued uh, its work, although we haven't been able to travel for obvious reasons during this pandemic. On 31 August 2020, both Houses of Parliament agreed to extend the reporting date for this inquiry to the last sitting day in February 2021. The committee felt that it would be timely to table an interim report, providing the parliament and the community with an update on the committee's work. The interim report is comprehensive, running to 12 chapters and over 300 pages. This is reflective of the breadth of issues that have been raised within the community. Some of the key issues explored in the report included perceptions of bias within the system, the role of family consultants and expert witnesses, legal fees and the costs of the family law system, delays in the family court and issues in relation to family violence. The report also issues, uh, considers issues sorry, arising in parenting and property disputes. There is so much uh, in terms of the evidence that's been brought before the committee uh, that you can't help but be touched by the emotional, the uh, psychological impact that a dispute going through the family law unfortunately has on all those involved, particularly um, children. This is an area of law in which is not only complex but highly emotional and draining for individuals and families. When relationships break down and families separate, often the family law system works to ensure the most appropriate outcome for the parties is involved. 
But I'd say from the evidence that we've received, I don't believe that there's any family that ends up in the family court that isn't permanently scarred by the experience. It is extremely expensive, it's costly and it's time-consuming. The personal stories of pain and anguish were not lost on any members of the committee. And I'd just like to, at this point in time, to thank all of those that are on this select committee because it has been uh, an enduring uh, commitment to continue this inquiry through this COVID pandemic. I note that this committee should never have really existed, though. That's the reality. This committee was formed uh, as part of a political deal that was done. We know that there have been countless reports into the family law system in this country. And in the last two years alone, there's been a report sitting on the Attorney General's desk and the Prime Minister's desk with 93 recommendations on how to improve the family law system in this country, but nothing has happened. Like so many reports that have done by fantastic committees and the secretaries who put countless hours and weeks and months into these inquiries. And what happens with those recommendations? They just sit and gather dust. This is the time to actually act, to change and to invest and to properly resource the family law system in this country. While we can make recommendation after recommendation, if there is not the will of the parliament and there's not the will of the government, nothing will happen and it must happen. I want to be clear here and make my perspective um, very clear, and that is it is very hard when allegations are made in evidence that's given to committees when you only ever hear one side of that particular story. It is confronting to hear the tragedies, the heartache and the pain that is caused through relationships breakdown. But a lot of time the, the um, contributions that was given by witnesses was um, heart-wrenching. It actually touched people through to their soul, in my view. When I was first um, put onto this committee, we were all advised that there would be counselling available for committee members and for witnesses. And I, for one, thought, well, that won't really be necessary. But I understand now why people do need counselling. This is um, such an important area of law in this country that affects not just those individual families and extended families, but it affects our communities. But I'd also like to just put on the record uh, an issue from my home state of Tasmania, where I live in Launceston, where we have been lobbying, and I know uh, uh, Mark Dreyfus from the other place, uh, the Shadow Attorney General, and myself and others have been lobbying for many years to have improvements done to the Launceston Family Law Court. And finally, finally, in this budget, and I commend the government, uh, for finally, after too many years, I might add, but they're actually doing this. My concern still is that this funding is over four years. I would urge the government to do everything that it can to ensure that that new family law court in Launceston makes that transition as soon as possible, because the benefits, as I said, go way beyond those individual uh, families uh, that go through the court system, those uh, that sit on the bench, their lawyers and advocates, um, everyone will benefit if that um, court can be relocated um, as soon as possible. But the $5.4 million um, for the relocation um, over four years, I just don't want to see that happening, uh, that we're back here um, in a few years saying, where, when is that going to happen? So I urge those people on the other side to join with me and urge that that relocation happens sooner rather than later. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present the 2021 Budget Day Statement of the Committee and I move that the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to have my remarks uh, continue your incorporated remarks. in the Hansard. Ah. Thank you. Yes. And you seek leave to continue your remarks too. Yes. Senator O'Sullivan, now I'll take it Senator Polly did the same at the end to keep that document on the notice paper. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, I present the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs 
and Transport References Committee on water quality outcomes in the Great Barrier Reef, together with a Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Oh, Senator Green. Very um, uh, happy to speak on this um, oh, report, on this? if Thank I can. You. Yep. Thank you. Um, with the very short amount of time that I have left um, to comment on this report, um, I'd like to say that there are some very good recommendations that address both the Queensland government and the Australian government, and they go to making sure that there is a good relationship and understanding about reef science. Uh, in the agricultural community, um, addressing the concerns of the stakeholders that uh, gave, um, uh, gave evidence before this committee um, that addressed some of these issues that were raised. But what, I, what, what, what was very clear from the beginning of this inquiry was that this was a politicised inquiry that was brought through the Senate to try to tee up a campaign so the LNP could go out there, try to win votes in Queensland before the Queensland election. And that's why you've seen this report tabled today and people from the LNP waiting to speak about this report because they want to make this a political issue. Well, can I just say this? Science shouldn't be a political issue. We should accept what scientists say when they have years and years and years of experience. Years of experience in an area that is so important to jobs and the economy in Cairns and in far north Queensland and to the rest of the Queensland economy. We should accept what scientists say when they tell us that water quality impacts the Great Barrier Reef. Unfortunately, there were members of the committee who were not willing to accept that evidence. So I assume that there will be a dissenting report that goes through the science and tries to dispute it and tries to pretend that some of the senators in this place know better than scientists. But they do not. They do not know better than these scientists. What we have is a report and recommendations that explains to the Senate how we can better, better have people understand the science of the reef and how desperately important it is to save the Great Barrier Reef, because we know that it supports thousands of jobs. But this was a highly politicised inquiry. It was a highly politicised inquiry. It's a highly politicised um, uh, campaign, and it actually led to people saying that there had been a misuse a misuse of Senate procedures and the Senate inquiry. What a shameful and damning thing to have been said about what should be an inquiry that looks into the science that protects jobs in Queensland. What an awful thing for someone in the public to say about the Senate or any senator that someone would misuse Senate procedures to try to politicise what is an incredibly important body of science that has been built up over so many years. The very important question now for Queensland is whether you support a government that supports reef jobs or whether you support the LNP opposition that is planning on ripping up these Order, laws. Senator Green, you will be in continuation uh, when you. it comes back up. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020 and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendment requested by the Senate to the bill. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I move that this bill be now read a third time and that the question be now put. First question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. I ask senators to take a seat. The question is that the motion now be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, tell of the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 26. The motion is therefore negative. So we proceed to debate. Yeah. We either. Oh. So we either. If no one wishes to speak, we put the motion. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order. Let's not. Let, order. Let's not. Let's not um, have interjections across the chamber while the bells are going. Yes. Thank you, Senator Watt.
Stop the bells. The question is now that the bill be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education and social security and for related purposes. The Senate will now suspend until 8 p.m. Right, order. The Senate <clears throat> is no longer suspended. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to have the opposition's 2020 
uh, 21 budget reply speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Searle. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I thank the Senate. <coughs> Sen I'll call the clerk and then I'll go to <coughs> Senator McKenzie. Government business order of the day <coughs> number 24, 2020-21, budget statement and documents. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise tonight to make a contribution in Budget Week uh, as National Party Senate Leader, noting that today the Deputy Prime Minister handed down uh, a regional statement about how our budget as a government uh, affects and supports rural and regional Australians, the seven million of us that live, work and love uh, our regions right across our country. And what we handed down today and what he spoke about today was how this budget shows our government standing with regional Australia through its most difficult time. As we had started into 2020, come out of drought, bushfires and then hit by COVID-19. And our government makes a commitment through the measures outlined in this budget to stand with them as together we face COVID recession. It's a plan that outlines our opportunities going forward and is reminiscent, I think, of the courage and leadership shown by the menzies McEwen government uh, post-World War II. And I just want to reflect for a moment on the words of Sir John McEwen, uh, country party leader during that period. Australia is one of the few countries in the world that is not only self-sufficient in food and important raw materials, but has an export surplus in these things. We have a sophisticated workforce and a sophisticated field of management that enables us in a highly competitive world to continue to grow as a manufacturing country. It would be a great mistake if our manufacturing potential were to be neglected or underestimated. So considering our self-sufficiency in food and materials, our capacity for industrial growth and our tremendous land area capable of absorbing additional population from around the world, I look forward with a high level of confidence to the future of Australia. These words were said by Black Jack McEwen decade, half a century ago, and it was his vision for our country following a war, leaving Britain behind, taking in immigrants from around Europe, fleeing war-torn Europe. How do we build a nation that is independent, sovereign and prosperous? And it is by securing our national security and our economic security. And he chose to do that uh, through pursuing a policy of full employment. And if you look at our budget measures handed down this week, they too, the McCormick uh, Morrison government actually pursuing uh, budget measures that seek to get more Australians back into employment because we know that is how to drive an economy to ensure our economic security and our uh, prosperity going forward. Blackjack's vision of high confidence for a strong and prosperous future for Australia is something that we in the Nationals absolutely share and we fundamentally believe the regions are going to be key to achieving that. As Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack outlined today, this week's budget delivers economic security because it delivers jobs, and more than half of those who lost their jobs are already back to work thanks to our measures. The government estimates the economy will recover over 950,000 jobs over the next four years because of the measures, a whole suite of measures across a raft of portfolio areas, uh, are delivered on Tuesday night. Madam Pre Deputy President, 2020 has been a year like no other, and now is the time for vision, a sound plan based on sound principles that puts our national sovereignty at its centre. The Nationals in government are investing in regional people and regional businesses. We know that $32 billion in cash flow will boost to around 800,000 small businesses. More than 99 per cent of businesses with a turnover of up to $5 billion can write off the full value of any eligible asset they purchase for their business. And this is great for them, but it's also great for the suppliers in their local communities that provide those products. And this has been a singularly popular measure 
uh, that I've heard about over the last two days as farmers and small businesses call in uh, to our offices to say thank you. It's been tough. This is a real and tangible practical measure uh, that's going to help us pay our bills, which means other businesses keep employing people, but also will allow us to keep uh, our employees uh, on the payroll. The Nationals in government are delivering a record $110 billion in transport infrastructure program and a $3.5 billion rolling water infrastructure fund to support local jobs and businesses. Now, you know, if you don't come from where we come from, you might not get the uh, relationship between access to water and jobs and productivity and uh, local growth. It is absolutely fundamental uh, to us. With the uh, resilience capacity of our local community and population, uh, with the skills and know-how grounded in deep lived uh, experience of our farming communities, all you need to do is add water out in the regions and uh, we'll be $100 billion in our ag industry in no time. Just add some workers, Senator uh, McCarthy, uh, for, to get those mangoes off, and Senator McMahon, uh, and we're working on that as well. I think probably for me, as someone that uh, is quite excited about the legacy of uh, Blackjack and the contribution he made and our party made through that period to our national economy and security, uh, is getting quite excited about our renewed focus on advanced manufacturing. Uh, $1.5 billion handed down in this budget over four years for our modern manufacturing strategy. No. Settle down, everyone. This is not uh, 21st century protectionism. It's actually backing our natural capabilities. It's backing our natural capabilities. Uh, food, fibre, minerals, forestry. What a wonderful sustainable industry that is. And it's around six particular key areas: resources, critical minerals, food and beverages, medical products. And we've seen some great examples out in regional communities in my home state of Victoria in Shepparton, uh, actually turning their hand to uh, that PPE task quite quickly. Uh, clean energy defence in space. We're not uh, wanting this across the board. We're actually wanting to make sure um, that we are competitive in the areas where we already have a unique competitive advantage. And what I love about it is over half of these areas of strategic importance, the primary product is based in the regions. And so the smart thing is also to have that value-adding piece out in the regions too. We need to make Australia make again. We need production lines humming. We did it post-World War II. This is a budget that seeks to help us recover in, an, in a similar way, with a similar sense of optimism and building confidence right throughout our community. Uh, and I'm confident that we can do it. We must focus on our sovereign manufacturing capability. What the pandemic has actually exposed is the fragility of so many supply chains across uh, the globe. And I'm really excited about ensuring that uh, we make things here at home again that we might have outsourced, things that are fundamental to ensuring we can feed ourselves, or we can keep ourselves safe, uh, and we can actually plan uh, with renewed focus on the future. I'm very proud to be part of a party of government that is a specialist in one thing and one thing only, that is working for rural and regional Australia, making sure that those seven million Australians uh, have a proud and very loud voice here in the Senate and in the House and within government to ensure that our road to recovery from COVID-19 uh, backs the regions backs their natural advantages, and uh, I know together we can get through this. Thank the Senate. Yeah. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to make the Greens budget reply speech. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. This budget has been delivered in truly exceptional circumstances. We're in the middle of a global pandemic that has hit us hard. But the pandemic has also exposed many pre-existing fault lines in our economy and in our society. Insecure work, poverty, privatisation, social isolation and underfunded public services. These times and this budget may well be defined by a global pandemic, but even before any of us had heard of COVID-19, 
we had massive challenges facing us, and those challenges remain today. The Earth's climate is breaking down around us. We are living through a mass extinction event. Nature is being destroyed at record pace. The ecological systems that our economy and our society rely on are in crisis. And in economic terms, we are also in exceptional circumstances. Interest rates are at the lowest rate in the history of the Federation. Globally, interest rates are at the lowest level in recorded human history. Borrowing money has never been cheaper. Australian households are now carrying more debt than they ever have. And Australia's level of household debt is second in the world only to Switzerland. Yet despite people borrowing more money than ever, cheaper than ever, home ownership rates are going through the floor. And in Australia, home ownership rates are now back to where they were in the 1950s. And this is not because people don't want to earn money. Workforce participation is at the highest rate it's ever been. More people than ever are putting their hands up for a job. But wages growth is at the lowest rate that it's been since the Australian Bureau of Statistics started keeping records on it in the 1950s. So we've got wage growth at record lows, but we've got the proportion of national income going to company profits at record highs. The end result of all this is that wealth inequality is entrenched, it's significant and it's rising. Record low interest rates, record high household debt, falling home ownership, record workforce participation, record low wages growth, record high company profits, rising wealth inequality. This is what we faced before we entered a global pandemic, and this is what 40-odd years of naked neoliberalism has delivered. More and more people are getting less and less despite making a greater and greater effort. Meanwhile, the big corporations and the super wealthy who own and run them sit back and pocket ever bigger profits and amass ever greater wealth. Neoliberalism rewards wealth more than it rewards effort. It is a system where the rent seekers rule. It's a system that, instead of repaying the biggest workforce in our country's history with the standard of public infrastructure and public services that a prosperous nation such as ours should share and enjoy, has privatised and deregulated. It's a system that's created gouging monopolies that pay exorbitant dividends to the wealthy few and at the same time force millions of Australians to take on paralysing levels of private debt just to keep their heads above the water. This is a system where, if you're not amongst the chosen few, you must, to paraphrase Lewis Carroll, run as fast as you can just to stay in place and to go anywhere, run twice as fast as that. This is a system where the game is rigged. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 is the trigger for the recession that we're in. But this recession and the pathway to recovery will be made monstrously more difficult for the vast majority of Australians because of the four decades long neoliberal assault on the spirit of our country. Privatised public utilities, outsourced public services, a mad obsession with budget surpluses, a deregulated industrial relations system, a deregulated financial sector, trade deals that diminish the sovereignty of our country, manufacturing forced offshore, a property market rigged in favour 
of the speculators and massive tax breaks for miners and polluters who are pillaging our commonwealth and cooking the planet. All of these have been deliberate, deliberate policy choices of successive Australian governments, starting with the Labor Party under Hawke and Keating and supercharged under the Liberals. They have chipped away at the social fabric of our country. They have rewarded the individual at the expense of the collective. They have rewarded capital at the expense of labour. They have wound the back the clock on much of the progress that was made in the middle of the last century towards a more equal society and a more shared prosperity. Thanks to neoliberalism, we entered the pandemic with an underfunded health care system, with an underfunded and privatised childcare system, with an underfunded, privatised and barely regulated aged care system, with an underfunded education and training system, with 40 per cent of our workforce in insecure work, with entrenched high rates of unemployment and underemployment, with a social safety net set below what people need to survive, and with the most overpriced housing in the world. The pretense of more competition and more choice delivering some kind of market nirvana for people was always a con. Neoliberalism has done to this country what it was always going to do concentrate wealth and widen the divide between the haves and the have-nots. And all of this has been facilitated by the two major parties that sit in this place today and by an all-powerful financial industry, which is a rapacious parasite on our country that has hollowed out the real economy and left behind nothing but a fragile shell. This is why the cheapest money in history is no longer enough. We are truly through the looking glass. So in the face of all this, we've got this year's budget. So how does it stack up? Is it a turning point? Is it a not since wartime budget? Is it a whatever it takes budget? A budget that builds a nation? A budget that gives hope to people? Is it a budget that offers us that hope that we so desperately need, that we can live good lives and respect nature and climate? No. Of course it's not. Not from this Prime Minister. Not from this Treasurer. Not from this government. This budget is a neoliberal train wreck that will impoverish poor people, steal hopes and dreams from young people, that will entrench wealth inequality will entrench unemployment and underemployment and line the pockets of the big corporates and the super-rich. Don't believe the government's budget hype. This budget does nothing to change the structure of the Australian economy or the underlying social and human and natural problems this structure has created. It perpetuates the same old, failed, trickle-down, crony capitalist, fake economics rubbish that is simply about big corporations and the super-rich gorging themselves on the hard work of others and rigging the rules to suit themselves. The only difference this time is that it's neoliberalism on tick. But don't be fooled by a newfound tolerance for government debt, because this budget seeks to protect and project the same old neoliberal ideas. The government could have used this budget and increased the debt to invest in a shared future, providing the infrastructure, the income support, the jobs and the public services needed to create a cleaner, fairer and more equitable future. It could have used the, the debt to create jobs in renewable energy reforesting and rewilding, helping reduce emissions, restore ecosystems and draw down carbon from our atmosphere. But instead, it chose to use the debt to further rig the system so that the big corporates and the super-rich 
can keep making off like bandits, while millions of Australians will endure the kind of hardship and poverty that nobody, and I mean nobody, in a nation as rich as ours should ever have to suffer. Hardship and poverty that will scar for a lifetime. Hardship and poverty that is a stain on our country's history. This is a bloody great budget for coal companies and gas companies. It's a magnificent budget for the banks. It's a bonanza for the arms manufacturers. This is a budget for the government's mates. It's a budget by the government's mates. It's a, government, it's a budget for the government's mates. And boy, does this budget deliver for the government's mates and for the government's political donors. But if you're a young person, if you're renting, if you're a woman, if you're a First Nations person, if you're unemployed, if you're underemployed, if you're struggling to pay the bills, if you're worried about the climate crisis, if you're worried about the biodiversity crisis, this is not a budget that offers you the hope that you so desperately need. This budget continues to ignore women. There is no new money to make childcare accessible. There is no new money to build affordable public housing, and there is no new money to fund the frontline domestic violence services despite 37 women having been killed by violence already this year and rates of domestic violence having increased since the start of the pandemic. And its main selling point, tax cuts, will deliver twice as much money to men as they will to women. People working in arts and entertainment were some of the first to be hit by the social distancing requirements. The sector has suffered tremendously through the lockdown and will be one of the last to recover. And it's a sector that gives so much spirit to life in this country. Yet the Treasurer could not even find it within himself to utter the word art in his budget speech earlier this week. Arts and entertainment workers were largely excluded from JobKeeper and many are now faced with trying to survive on $40 a day on JobSeeker. Clearly, the $112 billion a year arts and entertainment sector does not matter to the Morrison government. And universities have been literally decimated by this crisis. A full 10 per cent plus of their workforce is gone. And what's the government's response? Slash support, deliberately and on multiple occasions exclude them from JobKeeper and massively hike the price of getting a degree. There's no new money in this budget for environment conservation and effectively nothing to help protect our threatened natural species and natural ecosystems in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction event in our planet's history. There's no serious action to close the gap, a shameful betrayal of promises made just four months ago. Meanwhile, the surveillance state will continue to grow, our rights and liberties will be further eroded and more power concentrated into the dangerous hands of the Department of Home Affairs. This budget also turns Australia's back on the world's displaced people. It cuts Australia's humanitarian intake our refugee intake by 20,000 places over the next four years. What is happening to this country? This budget gouges almost a billion dollars of support for refugees and people seeking asylum and give it, gives it straight to the big corporates and the super wealthy in tax breaks and $99 billion every year in corporate welfare. And with more than a dash of good old-fashioned xenophobia and racism, this budget uh, shamefully introduces an English language dictation test for partner visas. I'm hearing echoes of the White Australia policy. There is no funding in this budget for the desperately needed federal anti-corruption watchdog, and the Liberals, of course, have taken revenge 
on the National Audit Office for exposing sports rorts by slashing its funding. The centrepiece of this budget is the bringing forward of the Stage 2 tax cuts, supported by the Australian Labor Party. That will see millionaires get two and a half thousand bucks a year extra in their pockets, the working poor get 250 bucks a year in their pockets, and the unemployed can line up for their regular kick in the teeth because they will get nothing. Because a tax cut is worth nothing to you if you haven't got a job. Don't be fooled by the spin. The additional offset for low and middle income earners is a one off. It'll be gone in a year's time. There's a temporary boost for the millions and a permanent boost for the millionaires. And stage three, which will arrive in four years' time, unless it's brought forward in the meantime, is even worse. By that point, the top 10 per cent will be getting 50 per cent of the additional benefit. Stage three was voted for by both major parties in this place when it was legislated. And under both stage two and stage three of these tax cuts, tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefit high income earners, men get twice the benefit that women get. These tax cuts will further entrench gender inequality and further disrespect the massive contribution that women have made and continue to make to our country. Borrowing money to give the wealthiest Australians a tax cut is obviously patently unfair. But it's also really bad economics. There is nothing Keynesian about using the public purse to enrich the already very wealthy. There is nothing, nothing smart about tax cuts that leave behind young people, unemployed people and women. These tax cuts will not create jobs. These tax cuts will not trickle down. These tax cuts will not work. And how do we know they won't work? Well, we tried them last year and they didn't work. So last year, when increased tax offsets landed in people's bank accounts, household incomes rose by the highest rate in a decade. But in the same quarter, Household consumption grew by what was then the lowest rate in a decade. Even before we were in recession, people were saving. They weren't spending because the economy was already stretched to breaking points, as was so many household budgets. And now that we're in the middle of the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression, people will obviously do the same again and more. And you know what? Fair enough too. In the face of insecure work, low wage growth, high levels of household debt, high unemployment, massive underemployment, it's the natural thing to do. The point is tax cuts won't do what the major parties say they are going to do. The money will not make its way out into the economy. They simply will not work. And we know that trickle-down economics is one of the world's great political cons. The people at the bottom are dying of thirst, waiting for a few drops to reach them. If low- and middle-income earners weren't spending before COVID hit, and weren't spending before we got into a recession, then high income earners certainly won't be spending in the middle of a recession. What will happen is that high income earners will accumulate yet more wealth by buying more shares or paying off the mortgage on their investment property. It's also worth remembering that this is the third consecutive budget where this government has put forward some version of these tax cuts going further and faster every time. The first two times around it was the magical impending surplus, which didn't last long, mind you, that supposedly enabled the tax cuts. Third time around, not a surplus in sight, and yet here are the tax cuts again. And what this shows 
is that these tax cuts are ideological, pure and simple. Surplus or no surplus, pandemic or no pandemic, deficit or no deficit, debt or no debt, this government is always going to let the wealthy accumulate more wealth. And here's a news flash for you. Tax cuts are of absolutely no benefit if you don't have a job. Instead of giving tax cuts for millionaires, we should be helping the millions of Australians who are unemployed and underemployed. Job seeker must be permanently increased so people, all people, can live a dignified life. Money given to people that need it is not only the right thing to do, it is money that will get spent in our economy. If this government cared about its people and cared about the state of the economy, this budget would make sure that those who this government seems contempt, uh, content to confine to joblessness have a chance to live with some dignity. But this government isn't content just with helping out the millionaires and the super rich. This budget also extends $99 billion a year in corporate welfare. It doesn't matter to the government that companies in Australia are already extracting record profits. It doesn't matter that the share market has already recovered most of its losses. It doesn't matter that one in three of the biggest corporations in this country pay absolutely zero tax at all. It doesn't matter because apparently the big corporations need yet more corporate welfare, yet more help from the public purse. Liberal mates, liberal donors. And what of the climate emergency? This government would rather the country burn than upset the most favoured of Liberal donors, the fossil fuel industry. The gas-led, so-called gas-led recovery is nothing other than an abomination. It's been designed by hand-picked gas company executives who want to turn our country into a petro-state. The International Energy Agency has spelt out there is no room for any new carbon-emitting energy source if the Paris targets are to be met. But this government could not care less. We're not headed, colleagues, for a gas-led recovery. We are just being gaslit. That's what's going on in this budget. Now, budgets are about choices, and these choices that are made in budgets reflect a government's priorities. Well, the Australian Greens re reject this government's choices and its priorities. We reject neoliberalism in whatever form it comes. The Australian Greens want to build an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We want to build an economy that respects nature, that respects our ecosystems and respects our climate and doesn't see our climate and our natural places merely as resources to be dug up and burned and profited from or as dumping grounds for toxic chemicals, carbon and pollutants. If we can remake our society to protect us from a virus, we can remake it to look after everyone, to look after climate and to look after nature. Mm -hmm. The Greens plan responds to the magnitude of the challenges we face and the three intersecting crises, the pandemic, rising wealth inequality and the climate and biodiversity emergency. This is a choice that our parliament can make. Our plan is built around a government-backed jobs and income guarantee. That would ensure that everyone has an income that they need to live with dignity and it will also get us back to full employment as quickly as possible. No one should get left behind and the Greens plan ensures that no one will be. That is a choice that this parliament can make. Our plan is built around massive government investment in health, in education, in public and active transport, in the whole range of public services that people need and want 
and delivered at a high quality. It's built around massive investment in manufacturing and renewable energy, far beyond that which is included in the government's budget. These will be the building blocks of a fairer and cleaner economy. We can't afford not to do this. And this is a choice that our parliament can make. Our plan is built around our Create Australia strategy, a jobs-rich plan for the creative industries in our country, underpinned by a commitment to get artists into our schools and libraries, a decent kickstart to get more Australian content onto our screens and live performances back to our stages. And this is a choice that our parliament can make. And for young people who, as with all recessions, are copping the brunt of it, our plan is built around a next-gen guarantee, free education, a living income and a guaranteed decent job if you want it. Our nation's future depends on trusting in and believing in the next generation. And this is a choice that our parliament can make. With the money that this budget commits to tax cuts, we can have a green recovery that creates hundreds of thousands of good, decent and well-paid jobs, ensures everyone has an income they can live on and creates a clean, strong and stable economy. We can set everyone up to live a good and dignified life while we respect nature and our planet's climate. A plan to do this is not just possible, it's necessary. And this is a choice that our parliament can make. I'll sign off with a quote from David Attenborough, made only hours ago. He said this, Nature will flourish when those that have a great deal perhaps have a little less. Thanks, David. The Greens couldn't agree more. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to respond to the government's budget handed down earlier this week. It's a post-COVID budget. It's a budget that takes us from a predicted $11 billion surplus for this year to one of $213.7 billion of deficit. Gross debt was expected to be 27 per cent of GDP in 2019-20. Gross debt is now expected to be 48, uh, sorry, 44 per cent of GDP uh, at uh, 30 June 2021 and increased to 51.6 per cent of GDP at uh, 30 June 2024. Just describing the environment. Now, the government's announced a wide range of revenue uh, measures, uh, reducing uh, tax receipts whilst at the, at, the same, uh, at the same time spending up big. Now, spending big might be appropriate as we recover from COVID as long as it's spent effectively. Spending money is easy. Spending money wisely is a much harder thing to do. Now, I'm not going to present an alternate plan. That's not the role of an independent. My job is to give honest commentary as to what I've seen uh, uh, presented by the government. I've decided I'm not going to talk about what's in the budget, however. I'll have plenty of opportunities to do that as implementing legislation comes uh, before this chamber. Uh, tomorrow, for example, I'll speak on tax-related matters in the bill that is currently before the, uh, the Senate and the subject of government business. Rather, I want to talk about what's missing in the budget. I want to talk about this because COVID brought us the opportunity to sit back and examine how things could be different on the other side of the curve. But that opportunity has been squandered by government, a government without, without vision or brave thought. They've just delivered same old, same old approaches. Tax cuts, instant write-offs, tax concessions, spending on this, spending on that. 
even having engaged the NCCC, uh, a body of purported visionaries, we still don't have anything uh, visionary that, that's come out of that uh, particular forum, a forum that has cost the taxpayers a lot of money. So just looking at the revenue, let's go to revenue. Now revenue will fall by $55 billion in this financial year and $283 billion over the four years to 2023. And that's revenue based on a number of widely optimistic assumptions. It makes the assumption, the budget makes the assumption that there's not going to be any second or third COVID waves. It basically relies on a vaccination being fully in place by late 2021. We've seen uh, the government talking about uh, vaccinations and, and their optimism, talking about dates and then having to slip them and then slipping them again and then slipping them again. Uh, at the COVID committee, I asked about the logistics of rolling out a vaccination across Australia, you know, who, who would be first, uh, who are the priorities, how, uh, things, how the vaccination would be dispatched across Australia. Uh, the government certainly doesn't have that uh, uh, well planned at this point in time. The reality is vaccinations take time. We can be very optimistic, and I have no problem with being optimistic, but I prefer the approach by the philosopher Seneca, who said, yeah, you know, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. I looked at the, the, uh, the, so one, of the, one of the assumptions in the budget, in the, in the budget uh, interesting. In fact, I went back to 2019-20 uh, and saw that the uh, Treasury's estimates for the price of iron ore were $55 per tonne FOB. I then looked at what this budget said, and amazingly, it said they predicted the iron ore price would be $55 per tonne FOB by the end of the June uh, quarter 2022. I don't know if this is a cut-and-paste error. Now I acknowledge that $55 a tonne uh, is in fact a conservative number, but it leaves me questioning the modelling assumptions uh, in relation to the, uh, the economic outlook and modelling assumptions that simply are not spelt out in detail in the budget. Again on assumptions, the number of jobs. There's no detail as to how the government came to the figures that have been used in the budget. We have to accept those on blind faith. Still talking about revenue, I would have thought this uh, crisis would have been the opportunity to uh, engage in significant revenue reform, but it's completely absent. Simplifying the tax system with a few broad-ranging taxes would have been good. So personal income tax, corporate tax, private consumption or GST, and economic rents from natural resources and land. That's the Ken Henry model. That's the sort of thing we could have been doing to simplify things. Of course, we would still retain taxes for special purposes, things like tobacco taxes to encourage people not to smoke, uh, also perhaps uh, t around traffic congestion. We will uh, instead retain a complex tax system with other state taxes, job-killing taxes, such as payroll tax, not addressed. In terms of tax cuts, now that is in the budget, but what is missing is any analysis as to whether or not it's affordable. Now, I say that having been through a comprehensive process the last time we looked at it, and as a crossbencher, having the special privileges of access to Treasury and examining exactly what, uh, what was going on inside budget paper number one. And uh, the, the argument at that time presented to me was that uh, we are on the verge of a surplus. Now is the right time for tax cuts. Turns out now we're at a $213 deficit and it's the right time for tax cuts. 
So I'll just put, uh, put on the record that I have reservations about these tax cuts. This entire chamber will vote tomorrow on tax cuts blind as to any analysis as to whether or not it's affordable. Um, Senator McKim talked about tax minimisation. Has that been addressed? There's nothing to address. The, the 220 companies that had revenues over five tax transparency years of $850 billion and paying no tax. $850 billion of revenue paying no tax. Companies like ExxonMobil. They last paid corporate tax in 2013. Over the five years 2013-14 to 2017-18, $42 billion in revenue, no corporate tax paid. And they told the Senate Economics Committee in 2018 that the company wouldn't pay corporate tax until 2021. They spent uh, $10 million uh, fighting um, the tax office in relation to tax. Now the interesting thing is, uh, on the verge of them uh, suggesting they'll pay tax, what are they doing? They're leaving the country. They're selling out of the Bass Strait, leaving the country. They've come in here. They've taken uh, all of our oil and gas, paid very little in PRRT, and they're leaving the country. What mugs we are! By contrast that with, with uh, what Equinor does in Norway, they, uh, in 2018-19 they paid uh, taxes of $22 billion. They also paid a revenue to the state, because the state owned, of about $3 billion. There's a huge amount of money, and that's just one example of how to do it right. And we do not do it right here in Australia when it comes to rent resources tax. Lend-lease. Five years of tax uh, transparency data show that they've had uh, $43 billion in revenue and paid not a brass razoo in tax. And we're rewarding them. This year we've given them over a billion dollars of defence contracts to build facilities at Osborne, HMAS Watson and HMAS Stirling. They're not alone. Origin Energy, $59 billion, only $108 million tax paid. Ford, $14 billion, no tax paid. Virgin, $23 billion, no tax paid, but they certainly asked for a, asked for a handout during the COVID crisis. How do you think most Australians feel uh, you know, when they're listening to budgets, sure, they're going to you know, they're going to get a tax cut. But mum and dads, nurses, tradies, bus drivers, all of those <coughs> sorts of people, paying their fair share of tax, and you've got companies earning tens of billions of dollars paying no tax at all. It's not right, and you're not doing anything about it. There's nothing in the budget that <coughs> seeks to address that. No digital tax. So we've got Facebook and Google, one might argue essential utilities, creaming money out of this country, taking it, offshoring the money, paying very little tax. And what's the government doing about it? Nothing. Nothing in this budget. And then I'll turn to grandfathered large proprietary companies. That old chestnut. I know you don't like me talking about it. 1,119 companies, privileged companies, that don't have to lodge financial reports with ASIC. Now, ASIC has uh, testified to the Senate that that encourages aggressive tax minimisation. And of course, when we ask the coalition why is it that you haven't dealt with this, there is no policy reason. Uh, as to why the, this loophole where these companies don't have to file their, um, their financial returns to ASIC, there's no policy reason as to why that's acceptable, what, what, you know, why that's useful. 
Nothing done about that. And going back to PRRT, it's just not working. We are giving away our finite resources, giving them away. No fix. No fix in the, in the budget for that. And even when those companies do pay tax, when they do pay PRRT, they can get it back when they, uh, when they shut down their assets here in Australia. They can draw back off the PRRT they've paid to help them shut down their, their facilities. So they come in here, they, they, they set up, they write off all of their capital investment, they don't pay a brass razu for the resources, and then they charge us on the way out. Seriously? That's liberal economic management? Nothing in the budget to fix it. Now, how do I know about that little PRRT arrangement when you leave the, uh, when they, when you leave the country? Well, it's because we've got an example of this playing out right now in the Timor Sea. The Northern Endeavour, an FPSO, like a floating uh, uh, processing and storage and offtake vessel, sold by Woodside to a company called Noga. And the Commonwealth basically drove that company into liquidation. And I say this because it's on the record. Before they went into liquidation, I warned Nopsema. I warned the minister that this was going to happen. They've been driven into liquidation, and that means now there's an asset out there, Northern Endeavour, that is now the responsibility of the taxpayer. We paid $28 million in 2019-20 to operate this vessel in lighthouse mode. The, new, the budget now tells us another $47 million for this financial year. We've got this uncontrolled cost. No explanation as to how we're going to deal with this vessel that was owned by Woodside. In fact, the bizarre thing is now we're actually paying consulting fees to Woodside to try and sort the mess out. And at the same time, we've got Exxon departing Australia. They've got JP Morgan trying to sell their ageing assets in the Bass Strait. They'll sell them and we'll end up in the same situation where the taxpayer ends up operating those stranded assets in light lighthouse mode. I'll now come to spending, education and training. Well, I do welcome the vet spending and the apprenticeships. But of course we all know about the higher education funding and how damaging that is going to be for Australia, for our students, for our future. And no money for TAFE. Then I look at our procurement policies. What we should be doing post-COVID is directing government agencies to 4.7 of the Commonwealth procurement rules. I know that particular clause because I helped negotiate it into the Commonwealth procurement rules back when the ABCC negotiations were going on. That clause requires officials to look at the economic benefit that flows from a tender, from a contract. How many jobs does it create? How much capital investment here in Australia? What's the supply chain effect here in Australia? It's been in the Commonwealth procurement rules, hasn't been used. We simply, you know, one of the first contracts we saw going uh, out uh, you know, in, uh, in the COVID crisis, when we, you know, we've suddenly hit the realisation that uh, we don't have much resilience, went to Amazon, AWS, instead of to Australian companies. Don't if, I don't know if you understand how angry that makes Australian taxpayers. You know, we, we should be learning post-COVID about reliance. What we've seen is supply ch uh, chain shortages as a result of COVID. Now, the interesting thing is it's passive disruption to our supply chains, passive di disruption. Not like people are trying to stop uh, goods getting to Australia. It's just not getting here. Imagine 
if we're in a conflict situation, and there's a possibility that might occur, when there's active disruption, active disruption. And do we see that being addressed? Not through this budget. We're exposing ourselves. We haven't learnt. And then we look at things like defence spending. Now, I know better than most people in this place that we need a strong defence force. I understand how it works. I understand its role, its deterrence role. I understand, uh, you know, as much as we would never like to see them used, the importance of having well-trained, well-equipped forces. But I look at some of the projects that uh, have been commissioned by this government. The submarines, and I'm a former submariner. I like submarines. I think they're extremely useful um, military um, capabilities they off that, that they offer. And, uh, but we've got a submarine project that has gone from $50 billion in 2015 to $89 billion. We've got our Hunter-class frigate that's gone from $30 billion to $45 billion. So whilst we're dealing with a huge deficit, a crisis that we're trying to manage, we've got basically no one doing anything about a $54 billion blowout. Now, most people don't understand what $54 billion is. So to make it clearer, that's $54,000 million. That's the blowout. And has the government looked to address that? No. No, that's OK. We'll, we'll go and get a billion dollars back off, uh, off our universities and our students just got no idea on how to fix that problem. They remain silent. It's, it's incompetence. And of course, we've got a total lack of AIC commitment, commitment to use Australian industry in those programs. We've seen the percentages for the future submarine, shocking percentages, well below 50 per cent despite the 90 per cent promise by the, by the, the Liberal government. We, we chose a submarine designer, restricted ourselves to one supplier, and that supplier is now exercising its commercial advantage, charging us all uh, as much as it likes along the way. And this is not my words; this is the Auditor General criticising that particular decision. No competition in there, and the French are going to European companies that they're used to working with, and they're purchasing. Uh, through their normal supply channels. We've got a bizarre situation where we've got batteries in a battery company in South Australia been working on Collins batteries for as long as they've been in service, since the mid-90s. Uh, mid and what are we doing? We're making them compete against a Greek company for the batteries for the future submarine. Really? I can't believe it. Manufacturing. In the budget, we've got $1.5 billion dollars um, allocated to manufacturing. Now that is just totally inadequate. Totally inadequate. We know that manufacturing creates jobs. We know that manufacturing generates IP. We know that it builds resilience into our supply chains. We know that it helps with export. We know it helps with our balance of payments. Yet we we, we give them uh, the manufacturing sector 1.5 billion dollars. That's it. At least we've seen a reversal of the terrible, terrible uh, concept associated with the R&D tax bill that the government was going to pursue. Let me give you a tip. After COVID, we need R&D, but we also needed it before that. And I, just, you know, I welcome the change, but it just sh shows ineptitude. Now, we have seen, and I'm very pleased the government uh, uh, worked uh, and uh, assisted in relation to this, but they've allocated $15 million to build transmission towers in Wyala for our uh, interconnector. The South, firstly, the South Australian New South Wales interconnector, moving on to other transmission towers. That's a really good thing. We've re that, that $15 million will create 180 jobs, will repatriate 
um, work back to Australia using Australian steel. It's a fan that's a fantastic program. It costs $15 million. And I wonder whether we test some of the other measures against that sort of result. I do thank the government for that. But there's nothing in there dealing with value add. We have to, in this country, stop just exporting rocks, stop taking our iron ore and sending it overseas, taking our lithium and sending it overseas. We don't consider the value in, uh, in conducting these operations or these, these sorts of activities here in Australia. The, uh, in 2025, we're expecting the uh, lithium export market around the world to be, you know, in the somewhere around about the $25 billion mark. Batteries will be in the trillion dollars, and we should be investing in that sort of uh, capability here, that sort of value add here. But the problem is, the Liberal Party looks at things. They, what they do is they say to Australian companies, "You need to have uh, these." Th th this is, and I'm, I'm, this is not a criticism, but. Uh, we need to have minimum wages, we need to have occupational health and safety, we need to have environmental standards, we need to have Australian standards in, in our products. And they're, they're, you know, they're good things. I don't, I, I don't uh, suggest that we shouldn't do that. But what the government does is says, having imposed all those costs on the Australian business, we then look overseas and they, they're cheaper for some reason. And so we buy the cheaper product from the countries that don't have minimum wages and from the countries that don't have economic, sorry, uh, environmental standards, that have substandard products. We have to start changing the way we think. Electric vehicles, I'm glad to see there's some charging stations, but we are not doing enough in that space. I congratulate the government for um, uh, the $5 million allocated to a uh, factory in South or to a company that will build electric vehicles out of South Australia. That's a great thing. Again, $5 million seed funding and we get a, uh, an industry that will grow from that, up to 2,400 indirect jobs. Infrastructure. Now, we've gone from $100 billion, an extra $10 billion of infrastructure in, in, the, uh, in the budget, and most people would think that's a good thing. However, what people need to understand is that these contracts will go to tier one construction companies and in Australia there are no longer Australian owned tier one companies. They're all foreign owned. And what's going to happen is the government will award contracts to, to the tier ones, not the tier twos, and those, those companies will squeeze the Australian supply chain. They'll go back to most of them come from Spain, they'll go back to Spain and they will take um, products from Spain because they know those products and include them in, uh, in the infrastructure. And they'll profit, they'll squeeze so much the Australian companies, they'll profit from that and then they'll send that profit offshore. We need to rethink this. We need to make sure that tier two companies, the Australian companies, are priming these infrastructure projects. Things must change in that space. The space agency, failure to launch. Look, there is some additional funding in the budget for the space agency. We have a space industry that is charging ahead. I was up in, um, in Sejuna watching the launch. Unfortunately, couldn't go to 100 kilometres because the space agency is unable to issue launch permits. They can't keep up with industry. And what's happening is industry are, are bringing the work to Australia internationally and they are, uh, these international companies are leaving because we can't get a launch permit. Unbelievable. We need to think about a national endeavour, uh, perhaps a, a, co a constellation of satellites that could uh, monitor uh, 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 fire, bushfires. We need to think about national endeavours. Uh, you know, that's what we want to have in the budget. Social housing is missing from the budget. I know that the government uh, likes to talk about um, affordable housing through a uh, private, uh, private investor model, but that hasn't worked. We need to think about uh, social housing to tackle homelessness and to revitalise the construction industry. Energy. Let's start looking at 
things in an engineering like we set the goals clean, reliable, affordable, and let the market do its work. Everyone's talking about gas, trying to bring gas prices down. Well, here's the hint. Get the gas from the cheap, inexpensive sources. We, we have so much gas here in Australia, there is not a shortage. But what's happening is the companies are taking it and sending it overseas. All the gas from the Cooper Basin, the, the inexpensive gas, is being exported and we're being left to pay the high wellhead prices. Policy failure, not addressed in the budget. Then we come to, to women. Massively overrepresented uh, in COVID job loss figures, but this has not been addressed. There's no long, lo no long term reform to childcare. Where's the funding for domestic violence and legal services? We've had Minister Rustin, her, her, her uh, response in, in relation to this is women can take advantage of driving on the new infrastructures and roads. To suggest the budget doesn't focus on women, I think is wrong. Seriously, that's the policy? As a woman, you get to drive a car. I, I can see the next idea coming from the Prime Minister is going to be reinstating those old rules where, where a man has to walk in front of the woman uh, that's driving with a flag that's going to create jobs. That's the next idea. I can just see it. Aged care is missing as well. 23,000 new home care package, package, packages fall woefully short of the 100,000 that are needed. And just as I wrap up, my favourite topic, dear to my heart, over, oversight and accountability, cutting the Auditor General's budget as, as, as retribution for the good work that they've done disclosing uh, maladministration. No, no, no money. A shrinking budget for the ABC. Can't recognise the fire coverage they had. Um, don't don't recognise the, the value of the, the journalism. ICAC missing. There is no vision in this budget. It's a bit like the Governor General's speech, which was not the Governor General's speech, it was the Prime Minister's speech. There's no vision in there. No growing the pie, no making the pie tastier. We have lost huge opportunities in this budget. Thank you. Honourable uh, Senator Lambie. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'll take the honourable bit, though. That's cool, because apparently I'm not. Apparently, according to my first line, I'm not auditioning to be the Prime Minister or the Opposition Leader. I see they've taken all my dream, my hopes and dreams, my office has from me today. I think that education thing's got right to them. Anyway, I'm never going to deliver a budget. Okay. The value of independence in the parliament isn't to play dress up. We don't get elected to be you guys. We get elected to be everything but. But no matter how hard you try to keep this place to yourselves, we're here. And we're here with a mission because we get a seat at the table to talk about things you wouldn't otherwise talk about. We can force issues into debate. And I reckon if we're going to do that, let's do it with the issues that aren't getting discussed. So there's plenty about the budget that I have no issue with at all. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to say a few things about what I'd like to see more of. Because of these times of crisis are a chance to reset. We have an opportunity here to be using the emergency response to get the country on a path that's better than the one it was on before. We don't want to just go back to where we were. We want to aim higher. We should be sorting out the problems that we've been letting drift for way too long and thinking about how we want things to work when we get back to normal. We should be looking for ideas for the country that we never could have considered a possibility before and deciding to do things that we've been putting off for too long. The enormous spending measures in this budget are a chance to use the huge amounts of money that we're borrowing on behalf of the country to build a future that looks very different from our past. It is a chance to take a step back and look at what's been working for the country and what's not been going so well. And there is plenty of that. It's time to wipe the slate clean and say, let's build something new that will last beyond this crisis. Because you don't get a free pass to spend $100 billion very often. You don't get a get out of jail free card on a trillion dollars of debt very often. It takes a global pandemic for people to see that and go, yeah, that sounds fair enough. It takes the national shutdown for the rest of us in this place 
to see the government going for that and let it slide. That kind of money is enough to completely reshape our country and the way our economy works. When you've got that sort of opportunity ahead of you, there's a lot that you can do with it. The choices you make reflect what your true priorities are. They show who you put first and who you will put last. They show what you think Australia should look like in 10 years from now. I'd have made different choices about how to spend that money than what the government did. First of all, I wonder whether they're actually putting enough into the economy to get us out of this mess in the first place. There are going to be more people out of work because of this crisis for years, and the people who are lucky enough to have a job won't see their wages go up for a very long time. And the assumptions that underpin the Treasurer's pictures of where we're going to be in a year from now seem pretty rosy to me. For one thing, he's assumed that we'll have a population-wide vaccine by the end of the year. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> I don't know what vaccine he's been taking, but I can tell you now. Vaccines take decades to be developed, tested and manufactured, and then they have to be distributed out so everyone is covered. Honestly, if the Treasurer thinks he's safe banking on all that happening in 12 months, he's living in la-la land. He seriously is. And he reckons that once we get a vaccine, people will go back to spending money building houses and coming to Australia like normal? Whoosh. It's a pretty big gamble to take. If it turns out he's wrong, he might wish we'd put some more economic support in to stand us in better stead through the next year, through the next year, at the very least. So while I understand that Australians out there are worried about the debt, I think there's more the Treasurer should have put into this budget to keep the economy rolling. The first thing I would have put in there is more for social housing. And I don't think the only person that has not agreed with that is the government. It's absolutely bizarre that the rest of us can see that. The government has been looking the other way from people who don't have a safe place to sleep for far too long. With the Treasurer going on a $74 billion spending spree, I would have thought he could find some coins down the couch to do something about that. Building a few thousand new homes would take a dent out of the huge wait list for people to get into affordable housing, which has been growing across the states and territories for more than a decade, and the government wouldn't just be looking after the people who need a roof over their heads. It's helped people get, it helps people get back into work. It gives them stability. Ask just about any economist in the country about what the Treasurer should spend money on to get the economy moving, and they'll tell you that social housing is a sure bet. It's a sure bet. And when the government goes in and directly builds houses, they're employing tradies, keeping the construction industry going and getting that money straight into local businesses. It's much better than building a new road or a train line because you can, because you can roll it out really fast and you know the finished product would be put to good use. I know the Treasurer would say that social housing is a problem for the states, not his party. But friggin', honestly, that's a cop-out. It is a real cop-out. It's a coalition's favourite thing to say when they're faced with a problem that they can't be bothered to fix, but makes sense to fix. It absolutely makes sense to fix. I'd say to them it's about time they showed some leadership and got this done. They're perfectly capable of it. The federal government has run this show before, and we all know you can do it again. And it takes, all it takes is will and the courage to make it happen. The same goes for our TAFEs and our manufacturing sector. I mean, I'm glad that the Prime Minister has finally woken up to the fact that we need to start making things in Australia again. That's a start. But don't talk the talk on this one with me, Prime Minister. I want to see you walk the walk. And I can tell you, if ripping off our students is anything for the future, then I don't hold out much hope for our TAFEs. So my question is, where's the commitment? Where's the follow-through? You talk big on supporting trades, but there's nothing in this budget to fix up our crumbling TAFEs. We've got kids trying to get their Cert 3s in rooms with broken windows, no heating. They're working on machines from the Cold War that are older than what we are in here. At my local TAFE, toxic paint fumes rise up through the holes in the floorboards where kids are doing nursing courses. 
Kids all around Tassie are being trained in rooms full of asbestos because we can't afford to fix them up. Where's your commitment, Prime Minister? Where's your commitment? You can't manufacture without skills. And you need to get those skills from TAFE. I wanted this manufacturing plan from the PM to lay out how we're going to fix this stuff. I'd hoped it meant we'd get some real reform for vocational education in this country. Surely it's obvious we aren't going to kickstart our manufacturing industry if the people who want to do a trade can't get the training they need to get to a work site in the first place. Instead, we got seven million a year for the organisations that paid Scott Cam a six-figure salary to put up a few flashy videos about trades on social media. Honestly. And our tastes are allowed to apply for some, some funding to offer free short courses for school leavers and job seekers. That's it? That's as good as it gets? Our tastes need more leadership. And they need a hell of a lot more than what you're offering, which is nothing. We're going nowhere. They need the Prime Minister to stand up and figure out how to get our vocational education sector back up to the job training of our kids for the jobs that we'll need to rebuild our economy. That's what I'd spend some money on. That's where my priorities would be, and I'd do some that's where my priorities be. I figure you're not doing that because you actually don't have a plan for the future, because if you can't stay it at the basics here and tell our kids that want trades what trades are going to be available, then I'll tell you what, you have no bloody idea. I don't actually believe you have an idea or plan for manufacturing or building in this country. I don't think you are actually capable of it, and I'll call you out for it now. And do something about JobSeeker. We're in October. The extra money for people on JobSeeker ends in December, two and a half months from now. And that People on the dole are looking at going back to eating noodles, missing bills and not being able to turn on the aircon through the middle of summer. And we haven't even got to the May budget yet when they're going to need their heating, because I imagine by then they'll be living, off, living with blankets from Vinnie's. But instead of, giving pe instead of giving people on JobSeek any idea about how much money they'll have to live on next year, we're pouring cash into the pockets of people who have managed to keep their jobs and do quite well through the crisis. That's the answer to it. I'm not saying those tax cuts won't help. Maybe they will. I see the value in letting people keep more of the money that they earn, and I guess some of it will get spent to help the local economy move again. But the people who get the most benefit are the people who are lucky enough to still have a job. They've made it through the previous six months with their career intact and their paycheck full. They don't need it as much as the childcare workers and the home carers who got the boot from their job when the community went into lockdown back in March. Anyone can see that it would have made a lot more sense to spread that money out the other way. We all know people on the lower end would spend it more. The money would go, be going straight into their local communities and their local economies, not their bank accounts. I would have put more on veterans' hubs for our ex-servicemen and women who need a place to go when times are getting tough. There are already centres in Townsville and Brisbane. The people who rely on them say they're magic. They work by bringing together veteran service organisations and advocates under one roof. They are a one-stop shop. They save lives. That's what they do. Once again, here's the veterans minister. Yeah, we want hubs. We want hubs. Been promising, 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 like a horse race, isn't it? It just comes to a halt. It's all over Red Rover. We never get to the finish line. Never get to the finish line, do we, Minister Chester? Shocker. They, these hubs are not hard, and there is no excuse for not having every single one of them in a state by now. You've had more than enough time. And there's no more excuses, apart from you're incapable of getting the job done. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time you went elsewhere. Go to another department. Bring someone else in that can actually get the job done. Because you are certainly not getting a job done for veterans. They, can, they create a community space for at-risk veterans to put their hand up and ask for help. Spending 20, if you think spending $26 million a year for the next four years uh, is, is certainly not going to be enough for our veterans to get the help that they need. And $64 million won't touch the sides in the Department of Veterans Affairs. The problems there are so big 
It's not money. It's not money, mate. It's management. It's structural reform that we need. And if you can't see that, Minister Chester, once again, you're in the wrong department, mate. Get out. Throwing money at the problem like, like we do every year isn't going to be enough to stop veterans from be being let down by the department that fundamentally does not put their interests at first. It's more interested in cover its ass. And that's exactly what it does. It's an institution that has lost its way, but it is not there for veterans. Now, the ALP might have a crack at the government for debt, for debt and deficit. They've got to attack someone for something, so that's fair enough. But if it takes a trillion dollars to save 25 million people from losing their jobs, homes, savings and safety nets, spend it. If it costs more, spend more. Spend more. It will save us in the long run. You can't give me any moral justification for refusing to spend taxpayers' money on protecting taxpayers from losing all their money. Don't get me wrong. You can spend in good ways and you can spend in bad ways. I'm not saying spend for the sake of it. I'm just saying that it's pretty cynical to try and attack the government over debt and deficit to try and undermine their reputation for economic responsibility, particularly if, some, if sometimes economic responsibility means spending huge amounts of money to keep the economy from falling off a cliff. It's irresponsible to let the economy collapse just so you can run a surplus. Nobody's receiving the letter of termination from their boss and thinking to themselves, at least the government's in a surplus. But if we're going to be spending huge amounts of money, if that's what it takes to keep us afloat, we've got to match unprecedented spending with unprecedented transparency. Transparency. But just like pollen and bees, cash brings lobbyists. If money is being spent, you can bet anything that there will be donors, mates and lobbyists stepping over each other to get a slice of the pie. The more money we're spending, the more we need to give people confidence that we're spending it right. The good news is that's easily sorted. Don't cut money from the ANAO. The Australian National Audit Office needs that money. As a matter of fact, you should be putting more staff in there. You should be smashing them in there. So there's some sort of oversight in this parliament. They're the guys who are out there every week slapping government ministers across the chops and misusing taxpayers' money. They spotted the sports rorts. So this is their punishment. You take cash off them and say, hey, we're going to get less of you guys. They call out the government for spending $30 million on a plot of land worth 10 times less than that. Who does that? Goodness me. And you call yourselves great economists over there. Who got ripped off? No, not you people, the taxpayer. They're pretty much the only independent check that we have on the way the government spends the money and runs projects. They asked the government for an extra $6 million this year to keep them up, to keep, so they can keep their heads above water. Instead, instead, guess what the government did? Cut $14 million. Bucks. Oversight up here is gone. It's finished. It's over. It's very scary. But that's the truth of the matter. Don't end it there, though. Fix donation laws, real time disclosures. If you've got nothing to hide, if you've got nothing to hide, then let's do it. But I know, I know, don't mention that to the coalition. Jesus Christ, they nearly go white and faint. Cry, no, no, nothing about donation laws here. Nothing to see. Count up how much people donate over a fixed period and make them disclose their donations if they go over a low threshold. It's not that hard. Change the lobbying rules so everyone who comes into this building looking for something has to, has to play by the same set of rules. Punish them if they break them. You need punishment. If you don't punish people, the problems will continue. If you don't set an example, if you don't set an example when people play up and you don't discipline them, the problems will become worse. This one might be a little niche, but if the, the non-government centres in this place want to inquire into something the government is doing, the government shouldn't get to vote against that. They should go through without debate. It wouldn't cost you anything. Simple to do. What's wrong with you? I know we've been talking big numbers since the virus first hit us in March, and the amount of money that we're shoveling out the door in this budget is hard to comprehend. 
To put it in perspective, last year the government told us that they couldn't afford to pay $5 billion to raise New Start by 100 bucks a week. They told us that it would be irresponsible for them to start paying people enough to live on because it would risk their back in the black surplus. Oh, how's that going now? The stimulus measures in this budget are worthy 20 times are worth 20 times that. It's enough money to completely change the way this country works. And since we'll be paying it back for decades, it's a shame we aren't spending it once again on the right things. And once again, those that are less fortunate. So I think um, I think the next I think between now and May, the May budget. We're, just, we're going to see exactly what the coalition's made of. I'll, I'll be honest, I actually don't hold out much hope because what I've seen since I've been here is a lot of, um, a lot of rhetoric, a lot of talk the talk and very little walk the walk. And I'll tell you something, you cannot continue to spend money. You cannot just throw money out there and then turn around. When you do something, you have to follow it through. You have to make sure that money is actually doing its job. That's what you have to do. That's what good managers do. That's how it works. That's leadership. And if we don't see that in this country, then all that money you're throwing out there is going to be wasted. And that is taxpayers. It belongs to them. But you have to start following through for the sake of this country. Every dollar counts. Every dollar. Because what I don't want to see is I don't want to see my grandchildren having to pay for this. But I can guarantee they will, and their kids are probably going to be paying for it too. And it shouldn't be that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lambie, can I ask that you seek leave to continue the remarks so that we can keep this matter on the notice paper? Okay. Uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the documents available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I seek leave to move to authorise committees to meet during the sitting of the Senate tomorrow. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that committees be authorised to meet in accordance with the list circulated in the chamber. I put the question. Those of the questions say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Davey. Uh, I advise senators that a clerical error was made in the selection of bills committee report tabled today. The National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Technical Amendments Bill 2020 should have been referred to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee and not the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee. I understand senators are in agreement in relation to the error. The corrected report will be available online. Honourable Senators, pursuant to the order agreed earlier today, the sitting of the Senate is suspended until 9am tomorrow.